Section 12 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Randall Meredith. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 12, Book 28, Chapters 34 through 45. Chapter 34, Twelve Remedies Derived from Cheese. We have already spoken of the different kinds of cheese when treating of the mammalae and other parts of animals. Sextius attributes the same properties to mare's milk cheese that he does to cheese made of cow's milk. To the former he gives the names of hippace. Cheese is best for the stomach when not salted, or, in other words, when new cheese is used. Old salted cheese has a binding effect upon the bowels, and reduces the flesh, but it is more wholesome to the stomach than new salted cheese. Indeed, we may pronounce of aliments in general that salt meats reduce the system, while fresh food has a tendency to make flesh. Fresh cheese, applied with honey, effaces the marks of bruises. It acts also emolliently upon the bowels, and, taken in the form of tablets, boiled in astringent wine, and then toasted with honey on a platter, it modifies and alleviates gripping pains in the bowels. The cheese known as saprum is beaten up in wine with salt and dried sorb apples and taken in drink for the cure of celiac affections. Goat's milk cheese, pounded and applied to the part affected, is a cure for carbuncle of the generative organs. Sour cheese also, with oxymel, is productive of a similar effect. In the bath it is used as a friction, alternately with oil, for the removal of spots. Chapter 35 25 Remedies Derived from Butter From milk too, butter is produced. Held as the most delicate of food among barbarous nations, and one which distinguishes the wealthy from the multitude at large, it is mostly made from cow's milk, and hence its name. But the richest butter is that made from ewe's milk. There is a butter made also from goat's milk, but previously to making it, the milk should first be warmed in winter. In summer, it is extracted from the milk by merely shaking it to and fro in a tall vessel. With a small orifice at the mouth to admit the air, but otherwise closely stopped, a little water being added to make it curdle the sooner. The milk that curdles the most floats upon the surface. This they remove, and, adding salt to it, give it the name of oxygala. They then take the remaining part and boil it down in pots, and that portion of it which floats on the surface is butter, a substance of an oily nature. The more rank it is in smell, the more highly it is esteemed. When old, it forms an ingredient in numerous compositions. It is of an astringent, emollient, repletive, and purgative nature. Chapter 36. Oxygala. One Remedy. Oxygala too is prepared another way, sour milk being added to the fresh milk which is wanted to curdle. This preparation is extremely wholesome to the stomach. Of its properties we shall have occasion to speak in another place. Chapter 37. The Various Uses of Fat and Observations Upon It, 52 in Number. Among the remedies common to living creatures, fat is the substance held in the next highest esteem, that of swine in particular, which was employed by the ancients for certain religious purposes even. At all events, it is still the usage for the newly wedded bride, when entering her husband's house, to touch the doorposts with it. There are two methods of keeping hogs lard, either salted or fresh. Indeed, the older it is, the better. The Greek writers have now given it the name of axungia, or axle grease, in their works. Nor, in fact, is it any secret why swine's fat should be possessed of such marked properties, seeing that the animal feeds to such a great extent upon the roots of plants, 
owing to, to which its dung is applied to such a vast number of purposes. It will be as well, therefore, to premise, that I shall here speak only of the hog that feeds in the open field, and no other, of which kind it is the female that is much the most useful, if she has never farrowed, more particularly. But it is the fat of the wild boar that is held in by far the highest esteem of all. The distinguishing properties, then, of swine's grease are emollient, calorific, resolvent, and detergent. Some physicians recommend it as an ointment for the gout, mixed with goose grease, bull suet, and wool grease. In cases, however, where the pain is persistent, it should be used in combination with wax, myrtle, resin, and pitch. Hog's lard is used fresh for the cure of burns and of blains too, caused by snow, with ashes of burnt barley and nut galls in equal proportions. It is employed for the cure of chillblains. It is good also for exoriations of the limbs and for dispelling weariness and lassitude arising from long journeys. For the cure of chronic cough, new lard is boiled down in the proportion of three ounces to three sciathi of wine, some honey being added to the mixture. Old lard, too, if it has been kept without salt, made up into pills and taken internally, is a cure for phthisis, but it is a general rule not to use it salted in any cases except where detergents are required, or where there are no symptoms of ulceration. For the cure of phthisis, some persons boil down three ounces of hog's lard and honeyed wine in three siathi of ordinary wine and after swathing the sides, chest, and shoulders of the patient with compresses steeped in the preparation, administer to him every four days some tar with an egg. Indeed, so potent is this composition that if it is only attached to the knees even, the flavor of it will ascend to the mouth, and the patient will appear to spit it out, as it were. The grease of a sow that has never farrowed is the most useful of all cosmetics for the skin of females. But in all cases, hog's lard is good for the cure of itch scab mixed with pitch and beef suet in the proportion of one-third, the whole being made lukewarm for the purpose. Fresh hog's lard, applied as a pessary, imparts nutriment to the infant in the womb and prevents abortion. Mixed with white lead or litharge, it restores scars to their natural color, and in combination with sulfur, it rectifies malformed nails. It prevents the hair also from falling off, and, applied with a quarter of a nut gall, it heals ulcers upon the head in females. When well smoked, it strengthens the eyelashes. Lard is recommended also for phthisis, boiled down with old wine, in the proportion of one ounce to a semi sextarius till only three ounces are left. Some persons add a little honey to the composition. Mixed with lime, it is used as a liniment for inflamed tumors, boils, and indurations of the mammalae. It is curative also of ruptures, convulsions, cramps, and sprains. Used with white hellebore, it is good for corns, chaps, and callosities and with pounded earthenware which has held salted provisions for imposthumes of the parotid glands and scrofulous sores. Employed as a friction in the bath, it removes itching sensations and pimples. But for the treatment of gout, there is another method of preparing it. By mixing it with old oil and adding pounded sarcophagus stone and sankfoil bruised in wine, or else with lime or ashes. A peculiar kind of plaster is also made of it for the cure of inflammatory ulcers, 75 denarii of hog's lard being mixed with 100 of litharge. It is reckoned a very good plan also to anoint ulcers with boar's grease and, if they are of a serpiginous nature, to add resin to the liniment. The ancients used to employ hog's lard in particular for greasing the axles of their vehicles, that the wheels might revolve the more easily, and to this, in fact, it owes its name of axongia. 
when hog's lard has been used for this purpose, incorporated as it is with the rust of the iron upon the wheels, it is remarkably useful as an application for diseases of the rectum and of the generative organs. The ancient physicians, too, set a high value upon the medicinal properties of hog's lard in an unmixed state. Separating it from the kidneys and carefully removing the veins, they used to wash and rub it well with rainwater, after which they boiled it several times in a new earthen vessel, and then put it by for keeping. It is generally agreed that it is more emollient, calorific, and resolvent when salted, and that it is still more useful when it has been rinsed in wine. Masurius informs us that the ancients set the highest value of all upon the fat of the wolf, and it was for this reason that the newly wedded bride used to anoint the doorposts of her husband's house with it, in order that no noxious spells might find admittance. Chapter 38 Suet Corresponding with the grease of the swine is the suet that is found in the ruminating animals, a substance employed in other ways, but no less efficacious in its properties. The proper mode of preparing it, in all cases, is to take out the veins and to rinse it in sea or salt water, after which it is beaten up in a mortar, with a sprinkling of sea water in it. This done, it is boiled in several waters until, in fact, it has lost all smell and is then bleached by continual exposure to the sun, that of the most esteemed quality being the fat which grows about the kidneys. In case stale suet is required for any medicinal purpose, it is recommended to melt it first and then to wash it in cold water several times, after which it must again be melted with a sprinkling of the most aromatic wine that can be procured, it being then boiled again and again until the rank smell has totally disappeared. Many persons recommend that the fat of bulls, lions, panthers, and camels in particular should be thus prepared. As to the various uses to which these substances are applied, we shall mention them on the appropriate occasions. Chapter 39. Marrow. Common to to all these animals, is marrow, a substance which in all cases is possessed of certain emollient, expletive, desiccative, and calorific properties. The most highly esteemed of all is the deer's marrow, the next best being that of the calf, and then that of the goat, both male and female. These substances are prepared before autumn by washing them in a fresh state and drying them in the shade after which they are passed through a sieve and then strained through linen and put by in earthen pots for keeping in a cool spot. Chapter 40. Gall But among the substances which are furnished in common by the various animals, it is the gall, we may say, that is the most efficacious of all. The properties of this substance are of a calorific, pungent, resolvent, extractive, and dispersive nature. The gall of the smaller animals is looked upon as the most penetrating, for which reason it is that it is generally considered the most efficacious for the composition of eye salves. Bull's gall is possessed of a remarkable degree of potency, having the effect of imparting a golden tint to the surface of copper even, and to vessels made of other metals. Gall in every case is prepared in the following manner. It is taken fresh, and the orifice of the vesicle in which it is contained being tied fast with a strong linen thread, it is left to steep for half an hour in boiling water, after which it is dried in the shade and then put away for keeping in honey. That of the horse is condemned, being reckoned among the poisons only. Hence it is that the flamen of the sacrifices is not allowed to touch a horse, notwithstanding that it is the custom to immolate one of these animals at the public sacrifices at Rome. Chapter 41. Blood The blood also of the horse is possessed of certain corrosive properties, and so too is mare's blood, except indeed where the animal has not been covered, it having the effect of cauterizing the margins of ulcers and so enlarging them. Bull's blood, too, taken fresh, is reckoned among the poisons except, indeed, at Ajira, at which place the priestess of the earth, 
when about to foretell coming events, takes a draft of bull's blood before she descends into the cavern. So powerful, in fact, is the agency of that sympathy, so generally spoken of, that it may occasionally originate, we find, in feelings of religious awe, or in the peculiar nature of the locality. Drusus, the tribune of the people, drank goat's blood, it is said, it being his object by his pallid looks to suggest that his enemy, Q. Sepio, had given him poison, and so expose him to public hatred. So remarkably powerful is the blood of the he-goat that there is nothing better in existence for sharpening iron implements, the rust produced by this blood giving them a better edge even than a file. Considering, however, that the blood of all animals cannot be reckoned as a remedy in common, will it not be advisable, in preference, to speak of the effects that are produced by that of each kind? Chapter 42 Peculiar Remedies Derived from Various Animals and classified according to the maladies. Remedies against the poison of serpents, derived from the stag, the fawn, the ophion, the she-goat, the kid, and the ass. We will therefore classify the various remedies, according to the maladies for which they are respectively used, and first of all, those to which man has recourse for injuries inflicted by serpents. That deer are destructive to these reptiles, no one is ignorant, and also of the fact that they drag them from their holes when they find them, and so devour them. And it is not only while alive and breathing that deer are thus fatal to serpents, but even when dead and separated limb from limb. The fumes of their horns, while burning, will drive away serpents, as already stated. But the bones, it is said, of the upper part of a stag's throat, if burnt upon a fire, will bring those reptiles together. Persons may sleep upon a deer's skin in perfect safety, and without any apprehension of attacks by serpents. Its rennet, too, taken with vinegar, is an effectual antidote to the stings of those reptiles. Indeed, if it has been only touched by a person, he will be for that day effectually protected from them. The testes, dried, or the genitals of the male animal, are considered to be very wholesome, taken in wine, and so are the umbles, generally known as the centipelio. Persons having about them a deer's tooth, or who have taken the precaution of rubbing the body with a deer or fawn's marrow, will be sure to repel the attacks of all serpents. But the most effectual remedy of all is thought to be the rennet of a fawn that has been cut from the uterus of the dam, as already mentioned in another place. Deer's blood, burnt upon a fire of lentisk wood with dracontium, cunilago, and alkanet, will attract serpents, they say, while, on the other hand, if the blood is removed and perethrum substituted for it, they will take to flight. I find an animal mentioned by Greek writers, smaller than the stag but resembling it in the hair, and to which they give the name of Ophion. Sardinia, they say, is the only country that produces it. I am of opinion, however, that it is now extinct, and for that reason I shall not enlarge upon its medicinal properties. As a preservative against the attacks of serpents, the brains and blood of the wild boar are held in high esteem, the liver also, dried and taken in wine with rue, and the fat used with honey and resin. Similar properties are attributed to the liver of the domesticated boar and the outer filaments, and those only of the gall, these last being taken in doses of four denarii. The brains also, taken in wine, are equally effectual. The fumes of the burning horns or hair of a she-goat will repel serpents, they say. The ashes, too, of the horns, used either internally or externally, are thought to be an antidote to their poison. A similar effect is attributed to goat's milk, taken with Taminian grapes to the urine of those animals taken with the squill vinegar, to goat's milk cheese applied with oregonum, and to goat suet used with wax. In addition to all this, as will be seen hereafter, there are a thousand other remedial properties attributed to this animal, a fact which surprises me all the more, seeing that the goat, it is said, is never free from fever. The wild animals of the same species, which are very numerous, as already stated, 
have a still greater efficacy attributed to them. But the he-goat has certain properties peculiar to itself, and Democritus attributes properties still more powerful to the animal when it has been the only one yeaned. It is recommended also to apply she-goat's dung, boiled in vinegar, to injuries inflicted by serpents, as also the ashes of fresh dung mixed with wine. As a general rule, persons who find that they are recovering but slowly from injuries inflicted by a serpent will find their health more speedily re-established by frequenting the stalls where goats are kept. Those, however, whose object is a more assured remedy, attach immediately to the wound the paunch of a she-goat killed for the purpose, dung and all. Others, again, use the flesh of a kid just killed and fumigate it with the singed hair, the smell of which has the effect of repelling serpents. For stings of serpents, as also for injuries inflicted by the scorpion and shrew mouse, some employ the skin of a goat newly killed, as also the flesh and dung of a horse that has been out at pasture, or a hare's rennet in vinegar. They say, too, that if a person has the body well rubbed with a hare's rennet, he will never receive injury from venomous animals. When a person has been stung by a scorpion, she-goat's dung, boiled with vinegar, is considered a most efficient remedy. In cases, too, where a buprestis has been swallowed, bacon and the broth in which it has been boiled are highly efficacious. Nay, what is even more than this, if a person applies his mouth to an ass's ear and says that he has been stung by a scorpion, the whole of the poison, they say, will immediately pass away from him and be transferred to the animal. All venomous creatures, it is said, are put to flight by a fumigation made by burning an ass's lights. It is considered an excellent plan, too, to fumigate persons, when stung by a scorpion, with the smoke of burnt calves' dung. Chapter 43 Remedies for the Bite of the Mad Dog Remedies Derived from the Calf the he-goat, and various other animals. When a person has been bitten by a mad dog, it is the practice to make an incision round the wound to the quick, and to make the patient take either veal broth or hog's lard, mixed with lime, internally. Some persons recommend a he-goat's liver, and maintain that if it is applied to the wound, the patient will never be attacked with hydrophobia. She-goat's dung, too, is highly spoken of, applied with wine, as also the dung of the badger, cuckoo, and swallow, boiled and taken in drink. For bites inflicted by other animals, dried goat's milk cheese is applied with oregonum and taken with the drink, and for injuries caused by the human teeth, boiled beef is applied. Veal, however, is still more efficacious for the purpose, provided it is not removed before the end of four days. Chapter 44 Remedies to be adopted against enchantments. The dried muzzle of a wolf, they say, is an effectual preservative against the malpractices of magic, and it is for this reason that it is so common to be seen fastened to the doors of farmhouses. A similar degree of efficacy, it is thought, belongs to the skin of the neck when taken whole from the animal. Indeed, so powerful is the influence of this animal in addition to what we have already stated, that if a horse only treads in its track, it will be struck with torpor in consequence. Chapter 45. Remedies for Poisons In case where persons have swallowed quicksilver, bacon is the proper remedy to be employed. Poisons are neutralized by taking ass's milk. Henbane, more particularly, mistletoe, hemlock, the flesh of the sea hare, Apocarpathon, Farrakhan, and Dorysnium, the same too where coagulated milk has been productive of bad effects for the bee stings, or first curdled milk, should be reckoned as nothing short of a poison. We shall have to mention many other uses to which ass's milk is applied, but it should be remembered that in all cases it must be used fresh, or, if not, as new as possible, and warmed for there is nothing that more speedily loses its virtue. The bones, too, of the ass are pounded and boiled, as an antidote to the poison of the sea hare. The wild ass is possessed of similar properties in every respect, but in a much higher degree. 
Of the wild horse, the Greek writers have made no mention, it not being a native of their country. We have every reason to believe, however, that it has the same properties as the animal in a tame state, but much more fully developed. Mare's milk effectually neutralizes the venom of the sea hare and all narcotic poisons. Nor had the Greeks any knowledge from experience of the urus and the bison. Although in India the forests are filled with herds of wild oxen, it is only reasonable, however, to conclude that all their medicinal properties must be much more highly developed than in the animal as found among us. It is asserted also that cow's milk is a general counterpoison, in the cases above mentioned, more particularly as also where the poison of ephemeron has settled internally, or cantharides have been administered, it acting upon the poison by vomit. Broth, too, made from goat's flesh, neutralizes the effects of cantharides in a similar manner, it is said. To counteract the corrosive poisons which destroy by ulceration, veal or beef suet is resorted to, and in cases where a leech has been swallowed, butter is the usual remedy, with vinegar heated with a red-hot iron. Indeed, butter employed by itself is a good remedy for poisons, for where oil is not to be procured, it is an excellent substitute for it. Used with honey, butter heals injuries inflicted by millipedes. The broth of boiled tripe, it is thought, is an effectual repellent of the above-mentioned poisons, aconite and hemlock more particularly. Veal suet also has a similar repute. Fresh goat's milk cheese is given to persons who have taken mistletoe, and goat's milk itself is a remedy for cantharides. Taken with Taminian grapes, goat's milk is an antidote to the effects of ephemeron. Goat's blood boiled down with the marrow is used as a remedy for the narcotic poisons, and kid's blood for the other poisons. Kid's rennet is administered where persons have taken mistletoe, the juice of the white chameleon, or bull's blood, for which last, hare's rennet in vinegar is also used by way of antidote. For injuries inflicted by the pastinica and the stings or bites of all kinds of marine animals, hare's rennet, kid's rennet, or lamb's rennet is taken in doses of one drachma in wine. Hare's rennet, too, generally forms an ingredient in the antidotes for poisons. Off that is seen fluttering about the flame of a lamp is generally reckoned in the number of the noxious substances. Its bad effects are neutralized by the agency of goat's liver. Goat's gall, too, is looked upon as an antidote to venomous preparations from the field weasel. But we will now return to the other remedies, classified according to the various diseases. End of section 12. Recording by Randall Meredith. Section 13 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 13. Book 28, Chapters 46 to 61. Chapter 46, Remedies for Diseases of the Head and for Alopecia. Bear's grease mixed with laudanum and the plant adiantum prevents the hair from falling off. It is a cure also for alopecia and effects in the eyebrows mixed with the fungus from the wick of a lamp and the soot that is found in the nozzle. Used with wine, it is good for the cure of Parisio, a malady which is also treated with the ashes of deer's horns in wine. This last substance also prevents the growth of vermin in the hair. For Parisio, some persons employ goat's gall in combination with simoleon chalk and vinegar, leaving the preparation to dry for a time on the head. Sow's gall, too, mixed with bull's urine, is employed for a similar purpose, and when old, it is an effectual cure, with the addition of sulphur, 
for furfuracious eruptions. The ashes, it is thought, of an ass's genitals will make the hair grow more thickly and prevent it from turning grey. The proper method of applying it being to shave the head and to pound the ashes in a leaden mortar with oil. Similar effects are attributed to the genitals of an ass's foal, reduced to ashes and mixed with urine, some nard being added to render the mixture less offensive. In case of alopecia, the part affected is rubbed with bull's gall, warmed with Egyptian alum. Running ulcers of the head are successfully treated with bull's urine or stale human urine in combination with cyclaminos and sulphur, but the most effectual remedy is calf's gall, a substance which heated with vinegar has also the effect of exterminating lice. Veal suet pounded with salt and applied to ulcers of the head is a very useful remedy. The fat, too, of the fox is highly spoken of, but the greatest value is set upon cat's dung, applied in a similar manner with mustard. Powdered goat's horns or the horns reduced to ashes, those of the he-goat in particular, with the addition of nitre, tamarisk seed, butter and oil, are remarkably effectual for preventing the hair from coming off, the head being first shaved for the purpose. So too the ashes of burnt goat's flesh, applied to the eyebrows with oil, impart to them a black tint. By using goat's milk, they say, lice may be exterminated, and the dung of those animals, with honey, is thought to be a cure for alopecia. The ashes, too, of the hoofs, mixed with pitch, prevent the hair from coming off. The ashes of a burnt hair, mixed with oil of myrtle, alleviate headache. The patient drinking some water that has been left in the trough after an ox or ass has been drinking there. The male organs of a fox, worn as an amulet, are productive, if we choose to believe it of a similar effect. The same too with the ashes of a burnt deer's horn, applied with vinegar, rose oil, or oil of iris. Chapter 47. Remedies for Affections of the Eyes. For defluxions of the eyes, beef suet boiled with oil is applied to the parts affected, and for eruptions of those organs, ashes of burnt deer's horns are similarly employed, the tips of the horns being considered the most effectual for the purpose. For the cure of cataract, it is reckoned a good plan to apply a wolf's excrements. The same substance, too, reduced to ashes, is used for the dispersion of films in combination with attic honey. Bear's gall, too, is similarly employed, and for the cure of epinictus, wild boar's lard mixed with oil of roses is thought to be very useful. An ass's hoof reduced to ashes and applied with ass's milk is used for the removal of marks in the eyes and indurations of the crystalline humours. Beef marrow from the right foreleg, beaten up with soot, is employed for affections of the eyebrows and for diseases of the eyelids and corners of the eyes. For the same purpose also, a sort of calibul farum is prepared from soot, the best of all being that made from a wick of papyrus mixed with oil of sesame. The soot being removed with a feather and caught in a new vessel prepared for the purpose. This mixture too is very efficacious for preventing superfluous eyelashes from growing again when once pulled out. Bull's gall is made up into eye salves with white of egg, these salves being steeped in water and applied to the eyes for four days successively. Veal suet with goose grease and the extracted juice of osimum is remarkably good for diseases of the eyelids. Veal marrow, with the addition of an equal proportion of wax and oil, or oil of roses, an egg being added to the mixture, is used as a liniment for indurations of the eyelids. Soft goat's milk cheese is used as an application with warm water to allay defluxions of the eyes, but when they are attended with swelling, Honey is used instead of the water. In both cases, however, the eyes should be fermented with warm whey. In cases of dry ophthalmia, 
it is found a very useful plan to take the mussels lying within a loin of pork and after reducing them to ashes to pound and apply them to the part affected. She goats, they say, are never affected with ophthalmia from the circumstance that they browse upon certain kinds of herbs. The same too with the gazelle. Hence it is that we find it recommended at the time of a new moon to swallow the dung of these animals coated with wax, as they are able to see too by night. It is a general belief that the blood of a he goat is a cure for those persons affected with dimness of sight, to whom the Greeks have given the name of nyctalopes. A similar virtue is attributed to the liver of a she goat, boiled in a stringent wine. Some are in the habit of rubbing the eyes with the thick gravy, which exudes from a she goat's liver, roasted or with the gall of that animal. They recommend the flesh also as a diet, and say that the patient should expose his eyes to the fumes of it while boiling. It is a general opinion, too, that the animal should be of a reddish colour. Another prescription is to fumigate the eyes with the steam arising from the liver boiled in an earthen jar, or, according to some authorities, roasted. Goat's gall is applied for numerous purposes, with honey or film, repeat, with honey for films upon the eyes, with one third part of white hellebore for cataract, with wine for spots upon the eyes, indurations of the cornea, films, webs and argema, with extracted juice of cabbage, for diseases of the eyelids, the hairs being first pulled out and the preparation left to dry on the parts affected, and with woman's milk for rupture of the coats of the eye. For all these purposes, the gall is considered the most efficacious when dried. Nor is the dung of this animal held in disesteem, being applied with honey for defluxions of the eyes. The marrow, too, of a goat, or a hare's lights, we find used for pains in the eyes, and the gall of a goat, with raisin wine or honey, for the dispersion of films upon those organs. It is recommended also for ophthalmia, to anoint the eyes with wolf's fat or swine's marrow. We find it asserted, too, that persons who carry a wolf's tongue, inserted in a bracelet, will always be exempt from ophthalmia. Chapter 48 Remedies for Diseases and Affections of the Ears Pains and diseases of the ears are cured by using the urine of a wild boar, kept in a glass vessel, or the gall of a wild boar, swine or ox, mixed with castor oil and oil of roses in equal proportions. But the best remedy of all is bull's gall, warmed with leek juice or with honey, if there is any suppuration. Bull's gall, too, warmed by itself in a pomegranate rind, is an excellent remedy for offensive exhalations from the ears. In combination with woman's milk, it is efficacious as a cure for rupture of those organs. Some persons are of opinion that it is a good plan to wash the ears with this preparation in cases where the hearing is affected, while others again, after washing the ears with warm water, Insert a mixture composed of the old slough of a serpent and vinegar wrapped up in a docile of wool. In cases, however, where the deafness is very considerable, gall warmed in a pomegranate rind with myrrh and rue is injected into the ears. Sometimes also fat bacon is used for this purpose, or fresh asses dung, mixed with oil of roses. In all cases, however, the ingredients should be warmed. The foam from a horse's mouth is better still, or the ashes of fresh horse dung mixed with oil of roses. Fresh butter too is good. Beef suet mixed with goose grease, the urine of a bull or she-goat, or fuller's lant, heated to such a degree that the steam escapes by the neck of the vessel. For this purpose also, one third part of vinegar is mixed with a small portion of the urine of a calf, which has not begun to graze. They apply also to the ears calf's dung, mixed with the gall of that animal, and sloughs of serpents, care being taken to warm the ears before the application, 
and all the remedies being wrapped in wool. Veal suet too is used with goose grease and extract of osimum, or else veal marrow mixed with bruised cumin and injected into the ears. For pains in the ears, the liquid ejected by a bore in copulation is used, due care being taken to receive it before it falls to the ground. For fractures of the ears, a glutinous composition is made from the genitals of a calf, which is dissolved in water when used. And for other diseases of these organs, fox's fat is employed. Goat's gall mixed with rose oil warmed, or else extracted juice of leek. In all cases where there is any rupture, these preparations are used in combination with woman's milk. Where a patient is suffering from hardness of hearing, ox gall is employed with the urine of a he or she goat. The same too where there is any suppuration. Whatever the purpose for which they are wanted, it is the general opinion that these substances are more efficacious when they have been smoked in a goat's horn for 20 days. Hare's rennet, too, is highly spoken of. Taken in a minion wine, in the proportion of one third of a denarius of rennet to one half of a denarius of sycopanum. Bear's grease mixed with equal proportions of wax and bull suet is a cure for eposthumes of the parotid glands. Some persons add hypothesis to the composition, or else content themselves with employing butter only. After first fermenting the parts affected with a decoction of fenugreek, the good effects of which are augmented by strychnos. The testes, too, of the fox are very useful for this purpose, as also bull's blood, dried and reduced to powder. She-goat's urine made warm is used as an injection for the ears and a liniment is made of the dung of those animals in combination with axle grease. Chapter 49. Remedies for Toothache The ashes of deer's horns strengthen loose teeth and allay toothache, used either as a friction or as a gargle. Some persons, however, are of opinion that the horn, unburnt and reduced to powder, is still more efficacious for all these purposes. Dentifrices are made both from the powder and the ashes. Another excellent remedy is a wolf's head reduced to ashes. It is a well-known fact, too, that there are bones generally found in the excrements of that animal. These bones attached to the body as an amulet are productive of advantageous effects. For the cure of toothache, hare's rennet is injected into the ear. The head also of that animal, reduced to ashes, is used in the form of a dentifrice, and with the addition of nard is a corrective of bad breath. Some persons, however, think it is a better plan to mix the ashes of a mouse's head with the dentifrice. In the side of the hair, there is a bone found similar to a needle in appearance. For the cure of toothache, it is recommended to scarify the gums with this bone. The paste and bone of an ox, ignited and applied to loose teeth which ache, has the effect of strengthening them in the sockets. The same bone reduced to ashes and mixed with myrrh is also used as a dentifrice. The ashes of burnt pig's feet are productive of a similar effect, as also the calcined bones of the cotyloid cavities in which the hip bones move. It is a well-known fact that introduced into the throat of beasts of burden, these bones are a cure for worms and that, in a calcined state, they are good for strengthening the teeth. When the teeth have been loosened by a blow, they are strengthened by using ass's milk, or else ashes of the burnt teeth of that animal, or a horse's lichen, reduced to powder and injected into the ear with oil. By lichen I do not mean the hippomanes, a noxious substance which I purposely forbear to enlarge upon but an excrescence which forms upon the knees of horses and just above the hooves. In the heart of this animal there is also found a bone which bears a close resemblance to the eye teeth of a dog. If the gums are scarified with this bone or with a tooth taken from the jawbone of a dead horse, corresponding in place with the tooth affected, the pain will be removed, they say. 
Anaxilaeus assures us that if the liquid which exudes from a mare when covered is ignited on the wick of a lamp, it will give out a most marvellous representation of horses' heads, and the same with reference to the she-ass. As to the hippomanes, it is possessed of properties so virulent and so truly magical that if it is only thrown into fused metal, which is being cast into the resemblance of an Olympian mare, it will excite in all stallions that approach it a perfect frenzy for copulation. Another remedy for diseases of the teeth is joiner's glue, boiled in water and applied, care being taken to remove it very speedily and instantly to rinse the teeth with wine in which sweet pomegranate rind has been boiled. It is considered also a very efficacious remedy to wash the teeth with goat's milk or bull's gall. The paste and bones of a she-goat, just killed, reduced to ashes, and indeed, to avoid the necessity for repetition of any other four-footed beast reared in the farmyard, are considered to make an excellent dentifrice. Chapter 50 Remedies for Diseases of the Face It is generally believed that ass's milk effaces wrinkles in the face, renders the skin more delicate, and preserves its whiteness. And it is a well-known fact that some women are in the habit of washing their face with it 700 times daily, strictly observing that number. Poppea, the wife of the Emperor Nero, was the first to practice this. Indeed, she had sitting baths, prepared solely with ass's milk, for which purpose whole troops of she-asses used to attend her on her journeys. Purulent eruptions on the face are removed by an application of butter, but white lead mixed with the butter is an improvement. Pure butter alone is used for serpiginous eruptions of the face, a layer of barley meal being powdered over it. The call of a cow that has just calved is applied, while still moist, to ulcers of the face. The following recipe may seem frivolous, but still, to please the women, it must not be omitted. The paste and bone of a white steer, they say, boiled forty days and forty nights, till it is quite dissolved, and then applied to the face in a linen cloth, will remove wrinkles and preserve the whiteness of the skin. An application of bull's dung, they say, will impart a rosy tint to the cheeks, and not crocodilia even is better for the purpose. The face, however, must be washed with cold water, both before and after the application. Sunburns and all other discolorations of the skin are removed by the aid of calves' dung, kneaded up by hand with oil and gum. Ulcerations and chaps of the mouth by an application of veal or beef suet, mixed with goose grease and juice of osimum. There is another composition also made of veal suet with stag's marrow and leaves of white thorn, the whole beaten up together. Marrow too mixed with resin, even if it be cow marrow only, is equally good, and the broth of cow beef is productive of similar effects. A most excellent remedy for the lichens on the face is a glutinous substance prepared from the genitals of a male calf. Melted with vinegar and live sulphur, and stirred together with a branch of a fig tree. This composition is applied twice a day, and should be used quite fresh. This glue, similarly prepared from a decoction of honey and vinegar, is a cure for leprous spots, which are also removed by applying a he-goat's liver warm. Elephantiasis, too, is removed by an application of goat's gall, and leprous spots and furfuraceous eruptions by employing bull's gall with the addition of nitrate or else ass's urine about the rising of the dog star. Spots on the face are removed by either bull's gall or ass's gall, diluted in water by itself, care being taken to avoid the sun or wind after the skin has peeled off. A similar effect is produced also by using bull's gall or calf's gall in combination with seed of unilla and the ashes of a deer's horn, burnt at the rising of canicula. Ass's fat in particular restores the natural colour 
to scars and spots on the skin caused by lichen or leprosy. A he goat's gall mixed with cheese, live sulphur and sponge reduced to the ashes effectively removes freckles, the composition being brought to the consistency of honey before being applied. Some persons, however, prefer using dried gall and mix with it warm bran in the proportion of one obolus to four oboli of honey, the spots being rubbed briskly first. Egoat suet, too, is highly efficacious, used in combination with gith, sulphur and iris, this mixture being also employed with goose grease, stag's marrow, resin and lime for the cure of cracked lips. I find it stated by certain authors that persons who have freckles on the skin are looked upon as disqualified from taking any part in the sacrifices prescribed by the magic art. Chapter 51 Remedies for diseases of the tonsillary glands and for scrofula. Cow's milk or goat's milk is good for ulcerations of the tonsillary glands and of the trachea. It is used in the form of a gargle, warm from the udder or heated. Goat's milk being the best, boiled with mallows and a little salt. A broth made from tripe is an excellent gargle for ulcerations of the tongue and trachea and for diseases of the tonsillary glands. The kidneys of a fox are considered a sovereign remedy, dried and beaten up with honey and applied externally. For quinsy, bull's gall or goat's gall is used mixed with honey. A badger's liver taken in water is good for offensive breath, and butter has a healing effect upon ulcerations of the mouth. When a pointed or other substance is stuck in the throat, by rubbing it externally with cat's dung, the substance, they say, will either come up again or pass downwards into the stomach. Scrofulous sores are dispersed by applying the gall of a wild boar or of an ox, warmed for the purpose. But it is only when the sores are ulcerated that hare's rennet is used, applied in a linen cloth with wine. The ashes of the burnt hoof of an ass or horse applied with oil or water, is good for dispersing scrofulous sores. Warmed urine also, the ashes of an ox's hoof taken in water, goat's dung boiled in vinegar, or the testes of a fox. Soap too is very useful for this purpose, an invention of the Gauls for giving a reddish tint to the hair. This substance is prepared from tallow and ashes. The best ashes for the purpose being those of the beech and yolk elm. There are two kinds of it, the hard soap and the liquid, both of them much used by the people of Germany, the men in particular more than the women. Chapter 52 Remedies for Pains in the Neck For pains in the neck, the part should be well rubbed with butter or bear's grease, and for a stiff neck with beef suet, a substance which, in combination with oil, is very useful for the cure of scrofula. For the painful cramp attended with inflexibility, to which people give the name of a pistatone, the urine of a she-goat injected into the ears is found very useful, as also a liniment made of the dung of that animal mixed with bulbs. In cases where the nails have been crushed, it is an excellent plan to attach them to the gall of any kind of animal. Wicklows upon the fingers should be treated with dried bull's gall, dissolved in warm water. Some persons are in the habit of adding sulphur and alum of each an equal weight. Chapter 53. Remedies for cough and for spitting of blood. A wolf's liver administered in mulled wine is a cure for cough. A bear's gall also mixed with honey. The ashes of tips of cow horn or else the saliva of a horse taken in the drink for three consecutive days, in which last case the horse will be sure to die, they say. A deer's lights are useful for the same purpose, dried with the gullet of the animal in the smoke, and then beaten up with honey and taken daily as an electuary. The spitter deer, be it remarked, is the kind that is the most efficacious for the purpose. Spitting of blood is cured by taking ashes of burnt deer's horns 
or else a hare's rennet in drink, in doses of one third of a denarius, with Samian earth and myrtle wine. The dung of this last animal, reduced to ashes and taken in the evening with wine, is good for coughs that are recurrent at night. The smoke, too, of a hare's fur inhaled has the effect of bringing off from the lungs such humours as are difficult to be discharged by expectoration. Purulent ulcerations of the chest and lungs and bad breath, proceeding from a morbid state of the lungs, are successfully treated with butter boiled with an equal quantity of attic honey, till it assumes a reddish hue, a spoonful of the mixture being taken by the patient every morning. Some persons, however, instead of honey, prefer using larch resin for the purpose. In cases where there are discharges of blood, cow's blood, they say, is good, taken in small quantities with vinegar. But as to bull's blood, it would be a rash thing to believe in any such recommendation. For inveterate spitting of blood, all glue is taken in doses of three oboli in warm water. Chapter 54 Remedies for Affections of the Stomach Ulcerations of the stomach are effectually treated with ass's milk or cow's milk. For gnawing pains in that region, beef is stewed with vinegar and wine. Fluxes are healed by taking the ashes of burnt deer's horn and discharges of blood by drinking the blood of a kid, just killed, made hot in doses of three cyathi, with equal proportions of vinegar and tart wine, or else by taking kid's rennet with twice the quantity of vinegar. Chapter 55 Remedies for Liver Complaints and for Asthma Liver complaints are cured by taking a wolf's liver dried in honeyed wine or by using the dried liver of an ass with twice the quantity of rock parsley and three nuts, the whole beaten up with honey and taken with the food. The blood too of a he-goat is prepared and taken with the food. For persons suffering from asthma, the most efficient remedy of all is the blood of wild horses taken in drink. For persons suffering from asthma, the most efficient remedy of all is the blood of wild horses, taken in drink, and next to that ass's milk boiled with bulbs, the whey being the part used, with the addition of nasturtium, steeped in water and tempered with honey. In the proportion of one cyathus of nasturtium to three semisextari of whey, the liver or lights of a fox taken in red wine or bear's gall in water, facilitate the respiration. Chapter 56. Remedies for pains in the loins. For pains in the loins and all other affections which require emollients, frictions with bear's grease should be used, or else ashes of stale boar's dung or swine's dung should be mixed with wine and given to the patients. The magicians too have added to this branch of medicine their own fanciful devices. In the first place of all, madness in he-goats, they say, may be effectually calmed by stroking the beard, and if the beard is cut off, the goat will never stray to another flock. To the above composition they add goat's dung, and recommend it to be held in the hollow of the hand, as hot as possible. A greased linen cloth being placed beneath, and care being taken to hold it in the right hand if the pain is on the left side, and in the left hand if the pain is on the right. They recommend also that the dung employed for this purpose should be taken up on the point of a needle made of copper. The mode of treatment is for the patient to hold the mixture in his hand till the heat is felt to have penetrated to the loins, after which the hand is rubbed with a pounded leek, and the loins with the same dung annealed with honey. They prescribe also for the same malady, the testes of a hare, to be eaten by the patient. In cases of sciatica, they are for applying cow dung warmed upon hot ashes in leaves. And for pains in the kidneys, they recommend a hare's kidneys to be swallowed raw, or perhaps boiled, but without letting them be touched by the teeth. If a person carries about him the pastern bone of a hare, he will never be troubled with pains in the bowels, they say. Chapter 57. 
Remedies for Affections of the Spleen Affections of the spleen are alleviated by taking the gall of a wild boar or hog in drink. Ashes of burnt deer's horns in vinegar, or what is best of all, the dried spleen of an ass, the good effects being sure to be felt in the course of three days. The first dung voided by an ass's foal, a substance known as polea, by the people of Syria, is administered in oxymel for these complaints. A dried horse tongue, too, is taken in wine, a sovereign remedy which Cecilius Bion tells us he first heard of when living among the barbarous nations. The milk of a cow or ox is used in a similar manner, but when it is quite fresh, the practice is to roast or boil it and take it with the food. For pains in the liver, a topical application is made by bruising 20 heads of garlic in one sextarius of vinegar and applying them in a piece of ox bladder. For the same malady, the magicians recommend a calf's milt, bought at the price set upon it and without any haggling, that being an important point, and one that should be religiously observed. This done, the milt must be cut in two lengthwise and attached to the patient's shirt on either side after which the patient must put it on and let the pieces fall at his feet, and must then pick them up and dry them in the shade. While this last is doing, the diseased liver of the patient will gradually contract, they say, and he will eventually be cured. The lights, too, of a fox are very useful for this purpose, dried on hot ashes and taken in water. The same, too, with a kid's milt, applied to the part affected. Chapter 58. Remedies for Bowel Complaints To arrest looseness of the bowels, deer's blood is used. The ashes also of deer's horns, the liver of a wild boar, taken fresh and without salt in wine. A swine's liver roasted, or that of a he-goat, boiled in five semi-sextari of wine. A hare's rennet boiled in quantities the size of a chickpea in wine or, if there are symptoms of fever, in water. To this last, some persons add nut galls, while others again content themselves with hare's blood boiled by itself in milk. Ashes, too, of burnt horse dung are taken in water for this purpose, or else ashes of the part of an old bull's horn, which lies nearest the root, sprinkled in water. The blood, too, of a he-goat boiled upon charcoal, or a decoction made from a goat's hide boiled with the hair on. For relaxing the bowels, a horse's rennet is used, or else the blood marrow or liver of a she-goat. A similar effect is produced by applying a wolf's gall to the navel, with elaterium by taking mare's milk, goat's milk with salt and honey, or a she-goat's gall with juice of cyclaminos, and a little alum, in which last case some prefer adding nitre and water to the mixture. Bull's gall, too, is used for a similar purpose, beaten up with wormwood and applied in the form of a suppository, or butter is taken in considerable doses. Celiac affections and dysentery are cured by taking cow's liver, ashes of deer horns, a pinch in three fingers swallowed in water, hair's rennet kneaded up in bread, or, if there is any discharge of blood, taken with polenta, or else boar's dung, swine's dung, or hare's dung, reduced to ashes and mixed with mulled wine. Among the remedies also for the celiac flux and dysentery, veal broth is reckoned, a remedy very commonly used. If the patient takes ass's milk for these complaints, it will be all the better if honey is added and no less efficacious for either complaint are the ashes of ass's dung taken in wine, or else polea, the substance above mentioned. In such cases, even when attended with a discharge of blood, we find a horse's rennet recommended by some persons known as hippus, ashes of burnt horse dung, horse's teeth pounded and boiled cow's milk. In cases of dysentery, It is recommended to add a little honey, and for the cure of griping pains, ashes of deer's horns, bull's gall mixed with cumin, or the flesh of a gourd, 
should be applied to the navel. For both complaints, new cheese made of cow's milk is used as an injection. Butter also in the proportion of four semi-sextari to two ounces of turpentine, or else employed with a decoction of mallows or with oil of roses. Veal suet or beef suet is also given, and the marrow of those animals is boiled with meal, a little wax and some oil, so as to form a sort of pottage. This marrow too is kneaded up with bread for a similar purpose, or else goat's milk is used boiled down to one half. In cases too where there are gripings in the bowels, wine of the first running is administered. For the last name pains, some persons are of opinion that it is a sufficient remedy to take a single dose of hare's rennet in mulled wine, though others again, who are more distrustful, are in the habit of applying a liniment to the abdomen made of goat's blood, barley meal and resin. For all the defluxions of the bowels, it is recommended to apply soft cheese and for celiac affections and dysentery, old cheese. Powdered, one syathus of cheese being taken in three syathi of ordinary wine. Goat's blood is boiled down with the marrow of those animals for the cure of dysentery, and the celiac flux is effectually treated with the roasted liver of a she-goat, or what is still better, the liver of a he-goat, boiled in astringent wine, and administered in the drink, or else applied to the navel with oil of myrtle. Some persons boil down the liver in three sextari of water, to half a sextarius, and then add rue to it. The milt of a he or she goat is sometimes roasted for this purpose, or the suet of a he goat is incorporated in bread baked upon the ashes. The fat too of a she goat taken from the kidneys more particularly is used. This last, however, must be taken by itself and swallowed immediately, being generally recommended to be taken in water moderately cool. Some persons too boil goat suet in water with a mixture of polenta, cumin, anise and vinegar. And for the cure of celiac affections, they rub the abdomen with a decoction of goat's dung and honey. For both the celiac flux and the dysentery, kid's rennet is employed, taken in myrtle wine, in pieces the size of a bean, or else kid's blood, prepared in the form of a dish, known by the name of sanguiculus. For dysentery, an injection is employed, made of bull glue dissolved in warm water. Flatulency is dispelled by a decoction of calf's dung in wine. For intestinal affections, deer's rennet is highly recommended, boiled with beef and lentils and taken with the food. Hare's fur also reduced to ashes and boiled with honey, or boiled goat's milk, taken with a small quantity of mallows and some salt. If rennet is added, the remedy will be all the more effectual. Goat suet taken in any kind of broth is possessed of similar virtues, care being taken to swallow cold water immediately after. The ashes of a kid's thighs are said to be marvellously efficacious for intestinal hernia, as also hare's dung boiled with honey and taken daily in pieces the size of a bean. Indeed, these remedies are said to have proved effectual in cases where a cure has been quite despaired of. The broth, too, made from a goat's head, boiled with the hair on, is highly recommended. Chapter 59. Remedies for tenesmus, tapeworm and affections of the colon. The disease called tenesmus, or in other words a frequent and ineffectual desire to go to stool, is removed by drinking ass's milk or cow's milk. The various kinds of tapeworm are expelled by taking the ashes of deer's horns in drink. The bones which we have spoken of as being found in the excrements of the wolf, worn attached to the arm, are curative of diseases of the colon, provided they have not been allowed to touch the ground. Pelea, too, a substance already mentioned, is remarkably useful for this purpose. Boiled in grape juice, the same too with swine's dung, powdered and mixed with cumin in a decoction of rue. The antler of a young stag, reduced to ashes and taken in wine, 
mixed with African snails, crushed with the shells on, is considered a very useful remedy. Chapter 60. Remedies for affections of the bladder and for urinary calculi. Diseases of the bladder and the torments attendant upon calculi are treated with the urine of a wild boar or the bladder of that animal taken as food, both of them being still more efficacious if they have been thoroughly soaked first. The bladder when eaten should be boiled first, and if the patient is a female, it should be a sow's bladder. There are found in the liver of the wild boar certain small stones, or what in hardness resemble small stones, of a white hue, and resembling those found in the liver of the common swine. If these stones are pounded and taken in wine, they will expel calculi, it is said. So oppressed is the wild boar by the burden of his urine, that if he has not first voided it, he is unable to take to flight, and suffers himself to be taken as though he were enchained to the spot. This urine, they say, has a consuming effect upon urinary calculi. The kidneys of a hare, dried and taken in wine, act as an expellent upon calculi. We have already mentioned that in the gammon of the hog there are certain joint bones. A decoction made from them is remarkably useful for urinary affections. The kidneys of an ass dried and pounded and administered in undiluted wine are a cure for diseases of the bladder. The excrescences that grow on horses' legs, taken for 40 days in ordinary wine or honeyed wine, expel urinary calculi. The ashes too of a horse's hoof, taken in wine or water, are considered highly useful for this purpose. And the same with the dung of a she-goat. If a wild goat, all the better, taken in honeyed wine. Goat's hair too is used, reduced to ashes. For carbuncles upon the generative organs, the brains and blood of a wild boar or swine are highly recommended. And for serpiginous affections of those parts, the liver of those animals is used, burnt upon juniper wood more particularly, and mixed with papyrus and arsenic. The ashes also of their dung, ox gall kneaded to the consistency of honey, with Egyptian alum and myrrh, beetroot boiled in wine being laid upon it, or else beef. Running ulcers of those parts are treated with veal suet and marrow, boiled in wine or with the gall of a she-goat, mixed with honey and the extracted juice of the bramble. In cases where these ulcers are serpiginous, it is recommended to use goat's dung with honey or vinegar, or else butter by itself. Swellings of the testes are reduced by using veal suet with nitre, or the dung of an animal boiled in vinegar. The bladder of a wild boar, eaten roasted, acts as a check upon incontinence of urine. A similar effect being produced by the ashes of the feet of a wild boar or swine sprinkled in the drink. The ashes of a sow's bladder taken in drink, the bladder or lights of a kid, a hare's brains taken in wine, the testes of a male hare grilled, the rennet of that animal taken with goose grease and polenta, or the kidneys of an ass beaten up and taken in undiluted wine. The magicians tell us that after taking the ashes of a boar's genitals in sweet wine, the patient must make water in a dog kennel and repeat the following formula. This I do, that I may not wet my bed as a dog does. On the other hand, a swine's bladder attached to the groin facilitates the discharge of the urine, provided it has not already touched the ground. Chapter 61. Remedies for diseases of the generative organs and of the fundament. For diseases of the fundament, a sovereign remedy is bear's gall, mixed with the grease, to which some persons are in the habit of adding litharge and frankincense. Butter too is very good, employed with goose grease and oil of roses. The proportions in which they are mixed will be regulated by the circumstances of the case, care being taken to see that they are of a consistency which admits of their being easily applied. Bull's gall upon lint is a remarkably useful remedy 
and has the effect of making chaps of the fundament cicatrize with great rapidity. Swellings of those parts are treated with veal suet, that from the loins in particular, mixed with rue. For other affections, goat's blood is used with polenta. Goat's gall, too, is employed by itself for the cure of condylomata, and sometimes wolf's gall mixed with wine. Bear's blood is curative of inflamed tumours and apostemes upon these parts in general, as also bull's blood dried and powdered. The best remedy, however, is considered to be the stone which the wild ass voids with its urine. It is said at the moment he is killed. This stone, which is in a somewhat liquefied state at first, becomes solid when it reaches the ground. Attached to the thigh, it disperses all collections of humours and all kinds of suppurations. It is but rarely found, however, and it is not every wild ass that produces it, but as a remedy it is held in high esteem. Ass's urine, too, used in combination with gi, is highly recommended. The ashes of a horse's hoof, applied with oil and water, a horse's blood, that of a stone horse in particular, the blood also of an ox or cow, or the gall of those animals. Their flesh too, applied warm, is productive of similar results. The hoofs reduced to ashes and taken in water or honey. The urine of a she-goat, the flesh of a he-goat, boiled in water. The dung of these animals boiled with honey. Or else a boar's gall, or swine's urine, applied in wool. Riding on horseback, we well know, galls and chafes the inside of the thighs. The best remedy for accidents of this nature is to rub the parts with the foam which collects at a horse's mouth. Where there are swellings in the groin arising from ulcers, a cure is effected by inserting in the sores three horse hairs tied with as many knots. End of section 13. Section 14 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 14. Book 28. Chapter 62 to 81. Chapter 62. Remedies for gout and for diseases of the feet. For the cure of gout, bear's grease is employed, mixed in equal proportions with bull suet and wax. Some persons add to the composition hypothesis and nut galls. Others again prefer he goat suet mixed with the dung of a she goat and saffron, or else with mustard, or sprigs of ivy pounded and used with perdicium, or with flowers of wild cucumber. Cow dung is also used with lees of vinegar. Some persons speak highly in praise of the dung of a calf which has not begun to graze, or else a bull's blood without any other addition. A fox also boiled alive till only the bones are left. A wolf boiled alive in oil to the consistency of a serrate. He goat suet with an equal proportion of helxin and one-third part of mustard, or ashes of goat's dung mixed with axle grease. They say, too, that for sciatica it is an excellent plan to apply this dunk boiling hot beneath the great toes, and that for diseases of the joints it is highly efficacious to attach bear's gall or hare's feet to the part affected. Gout, they say, may be allayed by the patient always carrying about with him a hare's foot cut off from the animal alive. Bear's grease is a cure for chilblains, 
and all kinds of chops upon the feet. With the addition of alum, it is still more efficacious. The same results are produced by using goat suet, a horse's teeth powdered, the gall of a wild boar or hog, or else the lights of those animals applied with their grease, and this, too, where the soles are blistered, or the feet have been crushed by a substance striking against them. In cases where the feet have been frozen, ashes of burnt hare's fur are used, and for contusions of the feet, the lights of that animal are applied, sliced or reduced to ashes. Blisters occasioned by the sun are most effectually treated by using asses fat or else beef suet with oil of roses. Corns, chaps, and callosities of the feet are cured by the application of wild boar's dung or swine's dung used fresh and removed at the end of a couple of days. The postern bones of these animals are also used reduced to ashes, or else the lights of a wild boar, swine, or deer. When the feet have been galled by the shoes, they are rubbed with the urine of an ass applied with the mud formed by it upon the ground. Corns are treated with beef suet and powdered frankincense. Chilblains with burnt leather, that of an old shoe in particular, and injuries produced by tight shoes with ashes of goatskin tempered with oil. The pains attendant upon varicose veins are mitigated by using ashes of burnt calf's dung, boiled with lily roots and a little honey, a composition which is equally good for all kinds of inflammations and sores that tend to suppurate. It is very useful also for gout and diseases of the joints when it is the dung of a bull calf that is used more particularly. For exoriations of the joints, the gall of a wild boar or swine is applied in a warm linen cloth, the dung also of a calf that has not begun to graze, or else goat dung, boiled in vinegar with honey. Veal suet rectifies malformed nails, as also goat suet mixed with sandarac. Warts are removed by applying ashes of burnt calf's dung in vinegar, or else the mud formed upon the ground by the urine of an ass. Chapter 63. Remedies for Epilepsy In cases of epilepsy, it is a good plan to eat a bear's testes or those of a wild boar with mare's milk or water or else to drink a wild boar's urine with honey and vinegar, that being the best which has been left to dry in the bladder. The testes also of swine are prescribed, dried and beaten up in sow's milk, the patient abstaining from wine some days before and after taking the mixture. The lights of a hare too are recommended, salted and taken with one-third of frankincense for thirty consecutive days in white wine, hares ran it also, and asses' brains smoked with burning leaves and administered in hydromel in doses of half an ounce per day, and asses' hoofs are reduced to ashes and taken for a month together in doses of two spoonfuls. The test is also of an ass salted and mixed with a drink, asses milk or water in particular. The second dines also of a she-ass are recommended, more particularly when it is a male that has been foaled, placed beneath the nostrils of the patient, when the fits are likely to come on, this substance will effectually repel them. There are some persons who recommend the patient to eat the heart of a black he-ass in the open air with bread, upon the first or second day of the moon. Others again prescribe the flesh of that animal and others the blood diluted with vinegar and taken for forty days together. Some mix horse tail for this purpose with smithy water fresh from the forge, employing the same mixture for the cure of delirium. Epilepsy is also treated with mare's milk or the excrescences from a horse's legs taken in honey and vinegar. 
the magicians highly recommend goat's flesh grilled upon a funeral pile, as also the suet of that animal boiled with an equal quantity of bull's gall and kept in the gall bladder, care being taken not to let it touch the ground and the patient swallowing it in water standing aloft. The smell arising from a goat's horns or deer's antlers burned efficiently detects the presence of epilepsy. In cases where persons are suddenly paralyzed, the urine of an ass's foal applied to the body with nard is very useful, it is said. Chapter 64 Remedies for Jaundice For the cure of jaundice, the ashes of a stag's antlers are employed or the blood of an ass's foal taken in wine. The first dung, too, that has been voided by the foal after its birth, taken in wine, in pieces the size of a bean, will effect a cure by the end of three days. The dung of a newborn colt is possessed of a similar efficacy. Chapter 65. Remedies for Broken Bones for broken bones, a sovereign remedy is the ashes of the jawbone of a wild boar or swine. Boiled bacon, too, tied round the broken bone, united with marvellous rapidity. For fractures of the ribs, goat's dung applied in old wine is extolled as the grand remedy being possessed in a high degree of apparent extractive and healing properties. Chapter 66 Remedies for Fevers Deer's flesh, as already stated, is a febrifuge. Periodical and recurrent fevers are cured, if we are to believe what the magicians tell us, by wearing the right eye of a wolf, salted and attached as an amulet. There is one kind of fever generally known as amphemerine. It is to be cured, they say, by the patient taking three drops of blood from an ass's ear and swallowing them in two semi sextori of water. For quartan fever, the magicians recommend cat stung to be attached to the body with the toe of a horned owl and that the fever may not be recurrent, not to be removed until the seventh paroxysm is passed. Who, pray, could have ever made such a discovery as this? And what, too, can be the meaning of this combination? Why, of all things in the world, was the toe of a horned owl made choice of? Other adepts in this art, who are more moderate in their suggestions, recommend for quart and fever the salted liver of a cat that has been killed while the moon was on the wane, to be taken in wine just before the paroxysms come on. The magicians recommend, too, that the toes of the patient should be rubbed with the ashes of burnt cow dung diluted with a boy's urine and that a hare's heart should be attached to the hands. They prescribe also hare's rennet to be taken in drink just before the paroxysms come on. New goat's milk cheese is also given with honey, the whey being carefully extracted first. Chapter 67. Remedies for Melancholy, Lethargy, and Phthisis For patients affected with melancholy, calf's dunk boiled in wine is a very useful remedy. Persons are aroused from lethargy by applying to the nostrils the callosities from an ass's legs, steeped in vinegar, or the fumes of burnt goat's horns or hair, or by the application of a wild boar's liver, a remedy which is also used for confirmed drowsiness. The cure of phthisis is effected by taking a wolf's liver boiled in thin wine the bacon of a sow that has been fed upon herbs, or the flesh of a she-ass, eaten with the broth. This last mode in particular being the one that is employed by the people of Achaia. They say, too, that the smoke of dried cow dung, that of the animal when grazing, I mean, is remarkably good for phthisis, inhaled through a reed and we find it stated that the tips of cow's horns are burned and administered with honey in doses of two spoonfuls in the form of pills. Goat suet, many persons say, taken in a pottage of alica, 
or melted fresh with honeyed wine, in the proportion of one ounce of suet to one syathus of wine, is good for cough and thistles. Care being taken to stir the mixture with a sprig of rue. One author of credit assures us that before now, a patient whose recovery has been despaired of has been restored to health by taking one syathus of wild goat suet and an equal quantity of milk. Some writers, too, have stated that ashes of burnt swine's dung are very useful mixed with raisin wine as also the lights of a deer, a spitter deer in particular, smoke-dried and beaten up in wine. Chapter 68. Remedies for Dropsy For dropsy, a wild boar's urine is good, taken in small doses in the patient's drink. It is of much greater efficacy, however, when it has been left to dry in the bladder of the animal. The ashes, too, of burnt cow dung, and of bull's dung in particular, animals that are reared in herds, I mean, are highly esteemed. This dung, the name given to which is bolbiton, is reduced to ashes and taken in doses of three spoonfuls to one semi-sextarius of honeyed wine, that of the female animal being used where the patient is a woman, and that of the other sex in the case of males a distinction about which the magicians have made a sort of grand mystery. The dung of a bull calf is also applied topically for these disease, and ashes of burnt calf's dung are taken with seed of saphilinos in equal proportions in wine. Goat's blood also is used with a marrow, but it is generally thought that the blood of the he-goat is the most efficacious when the animal has fed upon lentisk more particularly. Chapter 69. Remedies for erysipelas and for purulent eruptions. For erysipelas, a liniment of bear's grease is used, that from the kidneys in particular, Fresh calf's dung also, or cow dung, dried goat's milk cheese with leeks, or else the fine scrapings of a deer's skin, brought off with pumice stone and bitten up in vinegar. When there is redness of the skin attended with itching, the foam from a horse's mouth is used, or the hoof reduced to ashes. For the cure of purulent eruptions, ashes of burnt asses' dung are applied with butter, and for the removal of swarthy pimples, dried goat's milk cheese, steeped in honey and vinegar, is applied in the bath, no oil being used. Pustules are treated with ashes of swine's dung, applied with water, or else ashes of deer's antlers. Chapter 70 Remedies for Sprains, Indurations, and Boils For the cure of sprains, the following applications are used. Wild boar's dung or swine's dung, calf's dung, wild boar's foam, used fresh with vinegar, goat's dung applied with honey, and raw beef used as a plaster. For swellings, swine's dung is used, warmed in an earthen pot, and beaten up with oil. The best emollient for all kinds of indurations upon the body is wolf's fat, applied topically. In the case of sores which are wanted to break, the most effectual plan is to apply cow dung warmed in hot ashes, or else goat's dung boiled in vinegar or wine. For the cure of boils, beef suet is applied with salt, but if they are attended with pain, it is melted with oil and no salt is used. Goat suet is employed in a similar manner. Chapter 71. Remedies for Burns. The method of testing bull glue. Seven remedies derived from it. For the treatment of burns, bear's grease is used with lily roots dried wild boar's dung also, or swine's dung, the ashes of burnt bristles, extracted from plasterer's brushes, beaten up with grease, the pastern bone of an ox, reduced to ashes and mixed with wax, and bull's marrow or deer's marrow, or the dung of a hare, 
The dung, too, of a she-goat, they say, will effect a cure without leaving any scars. The best glue is that prepared from the ears and genitals of the bull, and there is no better cure in existence for burns. There is nothing, however, that is more extensively adulterated, which is done by boiling up all kinds of old skins, and shoes even, for the purpose. The Rhodian glue is the purest of all, and it is this that painters and physicians mostly use. The whiter it is, the more highly glue is esteemed. That, on the other hand, which is black and brittle like wood, is looked upon as good for nothing. Chapter 72. Remedies for Affections of the Sinews and for Contusions for pains in the sinews, goat's dung boiled in vinegar with honey is considered one of the most useful remedies, and this even where the sinew is threatened with putrefaction. Strains and contusions are healed with wild boar's dung that has been gathered in spring and dried. A similar method is employed where persons have been dragged by a chariot or lacerated by the wheels or have received contusions in any other way. The application being quite as effectual should the dung happen to be fresh. Some think it a better plan, however, to boil it in vinegar, and if only powdered and taken in vinegar, they vouch for its good effects where persons are ruptured, wounded internally, or suffering from the effects of a fall. Others again, who are of a more scrupulous tendency, take the ashes of it in water, and the Emperor Nero, it is said, was in the habit of refreshing himself with his drink when he attempted to gain the public applause at the three-horse chariot races. Swine's dung, it is generally thought, is the next best to that of the goat. Chapter 73. Remedies for Hemorrhage Hemorrhage is arrested by applying deer's rennet with vinegar, hare's rennet, hare's fur reduced to ashes, or ashes of burned ass's dung. The dung, however, of male animals is the most efficacious for this purpose, being mixed with vinegar and applied with wool in all cases of hemorrhage. In the same way, too, the ashes of a horse's head or thigh or of burnt calf's dung are used with vinegar. The ashes also of a goat's horns or dung with vinegar. But it is the thick blood that issues from the liver of a he-goat, when cut asunder, that is looked upon as the most efficacious, or else the ashes of the burnt liver of a goat of either sex, taken in wine or applied to the nostrils with vinegar. The ashes, too, of a leather wine bottle, but only when made of he-goat skin, are used very efficiently with an equal quantity of resin for the purpose of stunching blood and knitting together the lips of the wound. A kid's rennet in vinegar, or the thighs of that animal, reduced to ashes, are said to be productive of a similar result. Chapter 74 Remedies for ulcers and carcinomatous sores. Ulcers upon the legs and thighs are cured by an application of bear's grease mixed with red earth, and those of a serpiginous nature by using wild boar's gall with resin and white lead. The jawbone of a wild boar or swine reduced to ashes, swine's dung in a dry state or goat's dung made lukewarm in vinegar. For other kinds of ulcers, butter is used as a detergent and as tending to make new flesh, ashes of deer's antlers or deer's marrow, or else bull's gall mixed with oil of cypress or oil of iris. Wounds inflicted with edged weapons are rubbed with fresh swine's dung or with dried swine's dung powdered. When ulcers are phagedonic, or fistulous, bull's gall is injected with leek juice or woman's milk, or else bull's blood dried and powdered with a plant cotyledon. Carcinomatous sores are treated with hare's rennet sprinkled upon them with an equal proportion of capers in wine, gangrenes with bear's grease applied with a feather, 
and ulcers of a serpiginous nature with the ashes of an ass's hoofs powdered upon them. The blood of the horse corrodes the flesh by virtue of certain septic powers which it possesses. Dried horse dung, too, reduced to ashes, has a similar effect. Those kinds of ulcers, which are commonly known as phagedenic, are treated with the ashes of a cow's hide mixed with honey. Calf's flesh, as also cow dung mixed with honey, prevents recent wounds from swelling. The ashes of a leg of veal, applied with woman's milk, are a cure for sordid ulcers and the malignant sore known as cacoithes. Bull glue, melted, is applied to recent wounds, inflicted with edged weapons, the application being removed before the end of three days. Dried goat's milk cheese, applied with vinegar and honey, acts as a detergent upon ulcers, and goat suet, used in combination with wax, arrests the spread of serpiginous sores. If employed with pitch and sulfur, it will effect a thorough cure. The ashes of a kid's leg, applied with woman's milk, have a similar effect upon malignant ulcers. For the cure, too, of carbuncles, a sow's brains are roasted and applied. Chapter 75. Remedies for the Itch The itch in man is cured very effectually by using the marrow of an ass or the urine of that animal applied with the mud it has formed upon the ground. Butter, too, is very good, as also in the case of beasts of burden, if applied with warmed resin. Bull glue is also used, melted in vinegar, and incorporated with lime, or goat's gall mixed with calcined alum. The eruption, called boa, is treated with cow dung, a fact to which it is indebted for its name. The itch in dogs is cured by an application of fresh cow's blood, which, when quite dry, is renewed a second time and is rubbed off the next day with strong lye ashes. Chapter 76. Methods of extracting foreign substances which adhere to the body and of restoring scars to their natural color. Thorns and similar foreign substances are extracted from the body by using cat's dung or that of she-goats with wine. The rennet also of any kind of animal, that of the hare more particularly, with powdered frankincense and oil, or an equal quantity of mistletoe, or else with bee glue. As suet restores scars of a swarthy hue to their natural color and they are equally effaced by using calf's gall made warm. Medical men add myrrh, honey, and saffron, and keep the mixture in a copper box. Some, too, incorporate with it flour of copper. Chapter 77. Remedies for Female Diseases Menstruation is promoted by using bull's gall in unwashed wool as a pessary. Olympias of Thebes adds hyssop and nitre. Ashes, too, of deer's horns are taken in drink for the same purpose, and for derangements of the uterus they are applied topically, as also bull's gall used as a pessary with opium, in the proportion of two oboli. It is a good plan, too, to use fumigations for the uterus made with deer's hair burned. Hence, they say, when they find themselves pregnant, are in the habit of swallowing a small stone. This stone, when found in their excrements or in the uterus, for it is to be found there as well, attached to the body as an amulet, is a preventive of abortion. There are also certain small stones found in the heart and uterus of these animals, which are very useful for women during pregnancy and in travail. As to the kind of pumice stone which is similarly found in the uterus of the cow, we have already mentioned it when treating of the formation of that animal. A wolf's fat, applied externally, acts emolliently upon the uterus, and the liver of a wolf is very soothing for pains in that organ. 
It is found advantageous for women, when near delivery, to eat wolf's flesh, or, if they are in travail, to have a person near them who has eaten it. So much so, indeed, that it will act as a counter-charm even to any noxious spells which may have been laid upon them. In case, however, a person who has eaten wolf's flesh should happen to enter the room at the moment of parturition, dangerous effects will be sure to follow. The hair, too, is remarkably useful for the complaints of females. The lights of that animal, dried and taken in drink, are beneficial to the uterus. The liver, taken in water with Samian earth, acts as an amenagogue, and the rennet brings away the afterbirth, due care being taken by the patient not to bathe the day before. Applied in wool as a pessary with saffron and leek juice, this last acts as an expellent upon the dead fetus. It is a general opinion that the uterus of a hare taken with a food promotes the conception of male offspring and that a similar effect is produced by using the testes and rennet of that animal. It is thought too that a leveret taken from a uterus of its dam is a restorative of fruitfulness to women who are otherwise past childbearing. But it is the blood of a hare's fetus that the magicians recommend males to drink, while for young girls they prescribe nine pellets of hare's dung to ensure a durable firmness to the breasts. For a similar purpose also, they apply hairs rennet with honey, and to prevent hairs from growing again when once removed, they use a liniment of hairs blood. For inflations of the uterus, it is found a good plan to apply wild boar's dung or swine's dung topically with oil, but a still more effectual remedy is to dry the dung and sprinkle it powdered in the patient's string, even though she should be in a state of pregnancy or suffering the pains of childbirth. By administering sow's milk with honeyed wine, parturition is facilitated, and, if taken by itself, it will promote the secretion of the milk when deficient in nursing women. By rubbing the breasts of females with sow's blood, they are prevented from becoming too large. If pains are felt in the breasts, they will be alleviated by drinking ass's milk, and the same milk, taken with honey, has considerable efficacy as an amenagogue. Stale fat, too, from the same animal, heals ulcerations of the uterus, applied as a pessary in wool, it acts emolliently upon indurations of that organ, and, applied fresh by itself, or in water when stale, it has all the virtues of a depilatory. An ass's milk, dried and applied in water to the breasts, promotes the secretion of the milk, and used in the form of a fumigation, it acts as a corrective upon the uterus. A fumigation made with a burned ass's hoof, placed beneath a woman, accelerates parturition, so much so indeed, as to expel the dead fetus even. Hence it is that it should only be employed in cases of miscarriage, it having a fatal effect upon the living fetus. Asis dung applied fresh has a wonderful effect, they say, in arresting discharges of blood in females. The same too with the ashes of this dung, which, used as a pessary, are very good for the uterus. If the skin is rubbed with a foam from a horse's mouth for forty days together, before the first hair has made its appearance, it will effectually prevent the growth thereof. A decoction, too, made from deer's antlers, is productive of a similar effect, being all the better if they are used quite fresh. Mare's milk, used as an injection, is highly beneficial to the uterus. Where the fetus is felt to be dead in the uterus, the lichens or excrescences from a horse's legs, taken in fresh water, will act as an expellent. An effect produced also by a fumigation made with the hoofs or dry dung of that animal. Procedence of the uterus is arrested by using butter in the form of an injection. 
and indurations of that organ are removed by similarly employing ox gall with oil of roses, turpentine being applied externally in wool. They say too that a fumigation made from ox dung acts as a corrective upon procedence of the uterus and facilitates parturition, and that conception is promoted by the use of cow's milk. It is a well-known fact that sterility is often entailed by suffering in childbirth, an evil which may be averted, Olympias of Thebes assures us, by rubbing the parts before sexual intercourse with bull's gall, serpent's fat, verdigris, and honey. In cases, too, where menstruation is too abundant, the external parts should be sprinkled with a solution of calf's gall the moment before the sexual congress, a method which acts emolliently also upon indurations of the abdomen. Applied to the navel as a liniment, it arrests excessive discharges and is generally beneficial to the uterus. The proportions generally adopted are one denarius of gall, one third of a denarius of opium, and as much oil of almonds as may appear to be requisite, the whole being applied in ship's wool. The gall, too, of a bull calf is beaten up with half the quantity of honey and kept in readiness for the treatment of uterine diseases. If a woman about the time of conception eats roasted veal with the plant Aristolochia, she will bring forth a male child, we are assured. Calf's marrow boiled in wine and water with a suet and applied as a pessary is good for ulcerations of the uterus. The same, too, with fox's fat and cat's dung, the last being applied with resin and oil of roses. It is considered a remarkably good plan to subject the uterus to fumigations made with burnt goat's horns. The blood of the wild goat, mixed with sea palm, acts as a depilatory. The gall of the other kinds of goat, used as an injection, acts emolliently upon callosities of the uterus and ensures conception immediately after menstruation. It possesses also the virtues of a depilatory, the application being left for three days upon the flesh after the hair has been removed. The midwives assures us that she goes urine taken in drink and the dung applied topically will arrest uterine discharges, however much in excess. The membrane in which the kid is enclosed in the uterus, dried and taken in wine, acts as an expellent upon the afterbirth. For affections of the uterus, it is thought a desirable plan to fumigate it with burnt kid's hair, and for discharges of blood, kid's rennet is administered in drink, or seed of henbane is applied. According to Osthenes, if a woman's loins are rubbed with blood taken from the ticks upon a black wild bull, she will be inspired with an aversion to sexual intercourse. She will forget, too, her former love by taking a he-goat's urine in drink, some nard being mixed with it to disguise the loathsome taste. Chapter 78. Remedies for the Diseases of Infants For infants, there is nothing more useful than butter, either by itself or in combination with honey. For dentition, more particularly, for soreness of the gums, and for ulcerations of the mouth. A wolf's tooth attached to the body prevents infants from being startled and acts as a preservative against the maladies attendant upon dentition, an effect equally produced by making use of a wolf's skin. The larger teeth, also of a wolf, attached to a horse's neck, will render him proof against all weariness, it is said. A hare's rennet applied to the breasts of the nurse effectually prevents diarrhea in the infant suckled by hare. An ass's liver, mixed with a little panax and dropped into the mouth of an infant, will preserve it from epilepsy and other diseases to which infants are liable. This, however, must be done for forty days, they say. An ass's skin, too, thrown over infants, renders them insensible to fear. 
The first teeth shed by a horse, attached as an amulet to infants, facilitate dentition and are better still when not allowed to touch the ground. For pains in the spleen, an ox's milt is administered in honey and applied topically, and for running ulcers it is used as an application with honey. A calf's milt boiled in wine is beaten up and applied to incipient ulcers of the mouth. The magicians take the brains of a she-goat and, after passing them through a gold ring, drop them into the mouth of the infant before it takes the breast as a preservative against epilepsy and other infantile diseases. Goat's dung attached to infants in a piece of cloth prevents them from being restless, female infants in particular. By rubbing the gums of infants with goat's milk or hare's brains, dentition is greatly facilitated. Chapter 79. Provocatives of Sleep Cato was of opinion that hare's flesh, taken as a diet, is provocative of sleep. It is a vulgar notion, too, that this diet confers beauty for nine days on those who use it. A silly play upon words, no doubt, but a notion which has gained far too extensively not to have had some real foundation. According to the magicians, the gall of a she-goat, but only of one that has been sacrificed, applied to the eyes or placed beneath the pillow, has a narcotic effect. Too profuse perspiration is checked by rubbing the body with ashes of burnt goat's horns mixed with oil of myrtle. Chapter 80. Stimulants for the Sexual Passions Among the aphrodisiacs we find mentioned a wild boar's gall applied externally, swine's marrow taken inwardly, ass's fat mixed with the grease of a gander and applied as a liniment, the virulent substance described by Virgil as distilling from mares when covered, and the dried testes of a horse, pulverized and mixed with a drink. The right testicle also of an ass is taken in a proportionate quantity of wine, or worn attached to the arm in a bracelet, or else the froth discharged by that animal after covering, collected in a piece of red cloth and enclosed in silver, as Osthenes informs us. Salpe recommends the genitals of this animal to be plunged seven times in boiling oil and the corresponding parts to be well rubbed therein. Bielcon says that these genitals should be reduced to ashes and taken in drink, or else the urine that has been voided by a bull immediately after covering. He recommends also that the groin should be well rubbed with earth moistened with his urine. Mouse dung, on the other hand, applied in the form of a liniment, acts as an antiphrodisiac. The lights of a wild boar or swine, roasted, are an effectual preservative against drunkenness. They must, however, be eaten fasting and upon the same day. The lights of a kid, too, are productive of the same effect. Chapter 81. Remarkable Facts Relative to Animals in addition to those already mentioned, there are various other marvellous facts related with reference to these animals. When a horseshoe becomes detached from the hoof, as often is the case, if a person takes it up and puts it by, it will act as a remedy for hiccup the moment he calls to mind the spot where he has placed it. A wolf's liver, they say, is similar to a horse's hoof in appearance, and a horse, they tell us, if it follows in the track of a wolf, will burst asunder beneath its rider. The pastern bones of swine have a certain tendency to promote discord, it is said. In cases of fire, if some of the dung can be brought away from the stalls, both sheep and oxen may be got out all the more easily, and will make no attempt to return. The flesh of a he-goat will lose its rank smell if the animal has eaten barley bread or drunk an infusion of laser the day on which it was killed. Meat that has been salted while the moon was on the wane will never be attacked by worms. In fact, so great has been the care taken to omit no possible researches that a deaf hare, we find, will grow fat sooner than one that can hear.
As to the remedies for the diseases of animals, if a beast of burden voids blood, an injection must be used of swine's tongue mixed with wine. For the maladies of oxen, a mixture of suet is used with quicksilver and wild garlic boiled, the whole beaten up and administered in wine. The fat, too, of a fox is employed. The liquor of boiled horse flesh administered in their drink is recommended for the cure of diseased swine and indeed the maladies of all four-footed beasts may be effectually treated by boiling a she-goat whole in her skin along with a bramble frog poultry they say will never be touched by a fox if they have eaten the dried liver of that animal or if the cock when treading the hen has had a piece of fox's skin about his neck the same property too is attributed to a weasel's gall the oxen in the isle of cyprus cure themselves of gripings in the abdomen it is said by swallowing human excrements the feet too of oxen will never be worn to the quick if their hoofs are well rubbed with tar before they begin work wolves will never approach a field if after one has been caught and its legs broken and throat cut the blood is dropped little by little along the boundaries of the field and the body buried on the spot from which it was first dragged the share too with which the first furrow in the field has been traced in the current year should be taken from the plough and placed upon the hearth of the larries where the family is in the habit of meeting and left there till it is consumed so long as this is in doing no wolf will attack any animal in the field we will now turn to an examination of those animals which being neither tame nor wild are of a nature peculiar to themselves summary remedies narratives and observations one thousand six hundred and eighty two roman authors quoted m varro l piso Fabianus, Valerius Antius, Varius Flaccus, Cato the Censor, Servius Sulpicius, Licinius Masser, Celsus, Masurius, Sextius Niger, who wrote in Greek, Bithus of Dyrrachium, Opilius the Physician, Granius the Physician. Foreign authors quoted, Democritus, Apollonius, who wrote the Miruses, Miletus, Artemon, Sextilius, Antaeus, Homer, Theophrastus, Lysimachus, Attalus, Xenocrates, Orpheus, who wrote the Idiophia, Archelaus, who wrote a similar work, Demetrius, Sotira, Lys, Elephantes, Salpe, Olympias of Thebes, Diotimus of Thebes, Iolus, Andreas, Marcion of Smyrna, Aeschines the Physician, Hippocrates, Aristotle, Metrodorus of Skepsos, Iketidas the Physician, Apelles the Physician, Hesiod, Dalion, Cassilius, Bion, who wrote on powers, Anaxileus, King Juba. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 15, Book 29, Chapters 1 through 10. Remedies Derived from Living Creatures Chapter 1. The Origin of the Medical Art The nature and multiplicity of the various remedies already described, or which still remain to be enlarged upon, compel me to enter upon some further details with reference to the art of medicine itself. Aware as I am 
that no one has hitherto treated of this subject in the Latin tongue, and that if all new enterprises are difficult or of doubtful success, it must be one in particular which is so barren of all charms to recommend it, and accompanied with such difficulties of illustration. It will not improbably suggest itself, however, to those who are familiar with this subject, to make inquiry how it is that in the practice of medicine the use of simples has been abandoned, so convenient as they are, and so ready prepared to our hand, and they will be inclined to feel equal surprise and indignation when they are informed that no known art, lucrative as this is beyond all the rest, has been more fluctuating or subjected to more frequent variations. Commencing by ranking its inventors in the number of the gods and consecrating for them a place in heaven, the art of medicine, at the present day even, teaches us in numerous instances to have recourse to the oracles for aid. In more recent times again, the same art has augmented its celebrity, at the cost perhaps of being charged with criminality, by devising the fable that, that Escalapius was struck by lightning for presuming to raise Tendarius to life. And this example notwithstanding, it has not hesitated to relate how that others, through its agency, have since been restored to life. Already enjoying celebrity in the days of the Trojan War, its traditions from that period have acquired an additional degree of certainty, although in those times, we may remark, the healing art confined itself solely to the treatment of wounds. Chapter 2. Particulars Relative to Hippocrates. Date of the Origin of Clinical Practice and of that of atroliptics. Its succeeding history, a fact that is truly marvelous, remains enveloped in the densest night, down to the time of the Peloponnesian War, at which period it was restored to light by the agency of Hippocrates, a native of Kos, an island flourishing and powerful in the highest degree, and consecrated to Asclepius. Its being the practice for persons who had recovered from a disease to describe in the temple of that god the remedies to which they had owed their restoration to health, that others might derive benefit therefrom in a similar emergency, Hippocrates, it is said, copied out these prescriptions, and, as our fellow countryman Varro will have it, after burning the temple to the ground, instituted that branch of medical practice which is known as clinics. There was no limit after this to the profits derived from the practice of medicine, for Prodicus, a native of Celembria, one of his disciples, founded the branch of it known as atroliptics, and so discovered a means of enriching the very anointers even, and the commonest drudges employed by the physicians. Chapter 3. Particulars Relative to Chrysippus and Aristostratus In rules laid down by these professors, changes were effected by Chrysippus, with a vast parade of words, and after Chrysippus, by Erasistratus, son of the daughter of Aristotle. For the cure of King Antiochus, to give our first illustration of the profits realized by the medical art, Erasistratus received from his son, King Ptolemaeus, the sum of one hundred talents. Chapter 4. The Empiric Branch of Medicine Another sect again, known as that of the Empirics, because it based its rules upon the results of experiment, took its rise in Sicily, having for its founder Acron of Agrigentum, a man recommended by the high authority of Empedocles, the physician. Chapter 5. Particulars relative to Herophilus and other celebrated physicians, the various changes that have been made in the system of medicine. These several schools of medicine, long at variance among themselves, were all of them condemned by Herophilus, who regulated the arterial pulsation according to the musical scale, correspondingly with the age of the patient. In succeeding years again, the theories of this sect were abandoned, it being found that to belong to it necessitated an acquaintance with literature. Changes, too, were effected in the school, of which, as already stated, Asclepiades had become the founder. His disciple Timison, who at first in his writings implicitly followed him, soon afterwards, in compliance with the growing degeneracy of the age, went so far as to modify his own methods of treatment, which, in their turn, were entirely displaced with the authorization of the late Emperor Augustus by Antonius Musa, a physician who had rescued that prince from a most dangerous malady by following a mode of treatment diametrically opposite. I pass over in silence many physicians of the very highest celebrity, the Cassi, for instance, the Caliptani, the Aronti, and the Rubri, 
men who received fees yearly from the great, amounting to no less than 250,000 sesterces. As for Quinius Certinius, he thought that he conferred an obligation upon the emperors in being content with 500,000 sesterces per annum, and indeed he proved, by an enumeration of the several houses, that a city practice would bring him a yearly income of not less than 600,000 sesterces. Fully equal to this was the sum lavished upon his brother by Claudius Caesar, and the two brothers, although they had drawn largely upon their fortunes in beautifying the public buildings in Neapolis, left to their heirs no less than thirty millions of sesterces. Such an estate as no physician but Arontius had till then possessed. Next in succession arose Vettius Valens, rendered so notorious by his adulterous connection with Messalina, the wife of Claudius Caesar, and equally celebrated as a professor of eloquence. When established in public favor, he became the founder of a new sect. It was in the same age, too, during the reign of the emperor Nero, that the destinies of the medical art passed into the hands of Thessalus, a man who swept away all the precepts of his predecessors and declaimed with a sort of frenzy against the physicians of every age. But with what discretion and in what spirit we may abundantly conclude from a single trait presented by his character, upon his tomb, which is still to be seen on the Appian Way, he had his name inscribed as the Iatronicus, the conqueror of the physicians. No stage player, no driver of a three-horse chariot had a greater throng attending him when he appeared in public. But he was at last eclipsed in credit by Crinus, a native of Massilia, who, to wear an appearance of greater discreetness and more devoutness, united in himself the pursuit of two sciences, and prescribed diets to his patients in accordance with the movement of the heavenly bodies, as indicated by the almanacs of the mathematicians, taking observations himself of the various times and seasons. It was but recently that he died, leaving ten millions of sesterces, after having expended hardly a less sum upon building the walls of his native place and of other towns. It was while these men were ruling our destinies that all at once Charmus, a native also of Massilia, took the city by surprise. Not content with condemning the practice of preceding physicians, he prescribed the use of warm baths as well, and persuaded people, in the very depth of winter even, to immerse themselves in cold water. His patients he used to plunge into large vessels filled with cold water, and it was a common thing to see aged men of consular rank make it a matter of parade to freeze themselves, a method of treatment in favor of which Aeneas Seneca gives his personal testimony, in writings still extant. There can be no doubt whatever that all these men, in the pursuit of celebrity by the introduction of some novelty or other, made purchase of it at the downright expense of human life. Hence those woeful discussions, those consultations at the bedside of the patient, where no one thinks fit to be of the same opinion as another, lest he have the appearance of being subordinate to another. Hence, too, that ominous inscription to be read upon a tomb, it was the multitude of physicians that killed me. The medical art, so often modified and renewed as it has been, is still on the change from day to day, and still we are impelled onwards by the puffs which emanate from the ingenuity of the Greeks. It is quite evident, too, that every one among them that finds himself skilled in the art of speech may forthwith create himself the arbiter of our life and death, as though, forsooth, there were not thousands of nations who live without any physicians at all, though not, for all that, without the aid of medicine. Such, for instance, was the Roman people, for a period of more than six hundred years, a people, too, which has never shown itself slow to adopt all useful arts, and which even welcomed the medical art with avidity, until, after a fair experience of it, there was found good reason to condemn it. Chapter 6. Who first practiced as a physician at Rome, and at what period? And indeed, it appears to me not amiss to take the present opportunity of reviewing some remarkable facts in the days of our forefathers connected with this subject. Cassius Hermina, one of our most ancient writers, says that the first physician that visited Rome was Archagathus, the son of Lasanius, who came over from Peloponnesus in the year of the city, 535, Lucius Aemilius and Marcus Livius being consuls. He states also that the right of free citizenship was granted him, 
and that he had a shop provided for his practice at the public expense in the Asilian Crossway, that from his practice he received the name of Vulnerarius, that on his arrival he was greatly welcomed at first, but that soon afterwards, from the cruelty displayed by him in cutting and searing his patients, he acquired the new name of Carnifex, and brought his art and physicians in general into considerable disrepute. That such was the fact we may readily understand from the words of Marcus Cato, a man whose authority stands so high of itself, but that little weight is added to it by the triumph which he gained, and the censorship which he held. I shall, therefore, give his own words in reference to this subject. Chapter 7. The Opinions Entertained by the Romans on the Ancient Physicians Concerning those Greeks, son Marcus, I will speak to you more at length on the befitting occasion. I will show you the results of my own experience at Athens, and that, while it is a good plan to dip into their literature, it is not worthwhile to make a thorough acquaintance with it. They are a most iniquitous and intractable race, and you may take my word as the word of a prophet when I tell you that whenever that nation shall bestow its literature upon Rome, it will mar everything, and that all the sooner if it sends its physicians among us. They have conspired among themselves to murder all barbarians with their medicine, a profession which they exercise for lucre, in order that they may win our confidence and dispatch us all the more easily. They are in the common habit, too, of calling us barbarians and to stigmatize us beyond all other nations by giving us the abominable appellation of opisi. I forbid you to have anything to do with physicians. End quote. Chapter 8 evils attendant upon the practice of medicine. Cato, who wrote to this effect, died in his 85th year, in the year of the city 605, so that no one is to suppose that he had not sufficient time to form his experience, either with reference to the duration of the Republic or the length of his own life. Well, then, are we to conclude that he has stamped with condemnation a thing that in itself is most useful? Far from it by Hercules! for he subjoins an account of the medical prescriptions by aid of which he had ensured to himself and to his wife a ripe old age, prescriptions upon which we are now about to enlarge. He asserts also that he has a book of recipes in his possession by the aid of which he treats the maladies of his son, his servants, and his friends, a book from which we have extracted the various prescriptions according to the several maladies for which they are employed." It was not the thing itself that the ancients condemned, but it was the art as then practiced, and they were shocked, more particularly, that man should pay so dear for the enjoyment of life. For this reason it was, they say, that the temple of Asculapius, even after he was received as a divinity, was built without the city, and afterwards on an island. For this reason, too, it was that when, long after the time of Cato, the Greeks were expelled from Italy— the physicians were not exempted from the decree. And here I will improve upon the foresight displayed by them. Medicine is the only one of the arts of Greece that, lucrative as it is, the Roman gravity has hitherto refused to cultivate. It is but very few of our fellow citizens that have even attempted it, and so soon as ever they have done so, they have become deserters to the Greeks forthwith. Nay, even more than this, if they attempt to treat of it in any other language than Greek— they are sure to lose all credit, with the most ignorant even, and those who do not understand a word of Greek, there being all the less confidence felt by our people in that which so nearly concerns their welfare, if it happens to be intelligible to them. In fact, this is the only one of all the arts by Hercules, in which the moment a man declares himself to be an adept, he is at once believed, there being at the same time no imposture the results of which are more fraught with peril. To all this, however, we give no attention, so seductive is the sweet influence of the hope entertained by his ultimate recovery by each. And then besides, there is no law in existence whereby to punish the ignorance of physicians, no instance before us of capital punishment inflicted. It is at the expense of our perils that they learn, and they experimentalize by putting us to death, a physician being the only person that can kill another with sovereign impunity." Nay, even more than this, all the blame is thrown upon the sick man only. He is accused of disobedience forthwith, and it is the person who is dead and gone that is put upon his trial. 
It is the usage at Rome for the decuries to pass examination under the censorship of the emperor, and for inquisitions to be made at our party walls even. Persons who were to sit in judgment on our monetary matters are sent for to Gades and the very pillars of Hercules, while a question of exile is never entertained without a panel of forty-five men selected for the purpose. But when it is the judge's own life that is at stake, who are the persons that are to hold counsel upon it? but those who the very next moment are about to take it. And yet so it is, that we only meet with our deserts, no one of us feeling the least anxiety to know what is necessary for his own welfare. We walk with the feet of other people, we see with the eyes of other people, trusting to the memory of others we salute one another, and it is by the aid of others that we live. The most precious objects of existence and the chief supports of life are entirely lost to us, and we have nothing left but our pleasures to call our own. I will not leave Cato exposed to the hatred of a profession so ambitious as this, nor yet that senate which judged as he did, but all the same time I will pursue my object without resting to my purpose the crimes practiced by its adepts, as some might naturally expect. For what profession has there been more fruitful in poisonings, or from which there have emanated more frauds upon wills? And then, too, what adulteries have been committed in the very houses of our princes, even? The intrigue of Eudemus, for example, with Livia, the wife of Drusus Caesar, and that of Valens with the royal lady previously mentioned. Let us not impute these evils, I say, to the art, but to the men who practice it. For Cato, I verily believe, as little apprehended such practices as these in the city, as he did the presence of royal ladies there. I will not accuse the medical art of the avarice, even of its professors, the rapacious bargains made with their patients while their fate is trembling in the balance, the tariffs framed upon their agonies, the monies taken as earnest for the dispatching of patients, or the mysterious secrets of the craft. I will not mention how that cataract must be couched, only in the eye, in preference to extracting it at once, practices all of them which have resulted in one very great advantage, by alluring hither a multitude of adventurers, it being no moderation on their part, but the rivalry existing between such numbers of practitioners that keeps their charges within moderation. It is a well-known fact that Charmus, the physician already mentioned, made a bargain with a patient of his in the provinces that he should have two hundred thousand sesterces for the cure, that the emperor Claudius extorted from Alcon, the surgeon, ten millions of sesterces by way of a fine, and that same man, after being recalled from his exile in Gaul, acquired a sum equally large in the course of a few years. These are faults, however, which must be imputed to individuals only, and it is not my intention to waste reproof upon the dregs of the medical profession, or to call attention to the ignorance displayed by that crew, the violation of all regimen in their treatment of disease, the evasions practiced in the use of warm baths, the strict diet they imperiously prescribe, the food that is crammed into these same patients, exhausted as they are, several times a day, together with a thousand other methods of showing how quick they are to change their mind, their precepts for the regulation of the kitchen, and their recipes for the composition of unguents, it being one grand object with them to lose sight of none of the usual incitements to sensuality, the importation of foreign merchandise, and the introduction of tariffs settled by foreigners would have been highly displeasing to our ancestors, I can readily imagine. But it was not these inconveniences that Cato had in view when he spoke thus strongly in condemnation of the medical art. Theriace is the name given to a preparation devised by luxury, a composition formed of six hundred different ingredients. And this while nature has bestowed upon us such numbers of remedies each of which would have fully answered the purpose employed by itself. The Mithridatic antidote is composed of four and fifty ingredients, none of which are used in exactly the same proportion, and the quantity prescribed is in some cases so small as the sixtieth part of one denarius. Which of the gods, pray, can have instructed man in such trickery as this, a height to which the mere subtlety of human invention could surely never have reached? It clearly must emanate from a vain ostentation of scientific skill, and must be set down as a monstrous system of puffing off the medical art. And yet, after all, the physicians themselves do not understand this branch of their profession. 
and I have ascertained that it is a common thing for them to put mineral vermilion in their medicines, a rank poison, as I shall have occasion to show when I come to speak of the pigments, in place of Indian cinnabar, and all because they mistake the name of the one drug for the other. These, however, are errors which only concern the health of individuals, while it is the practices which Cato foresaw and dreaded, less dangerous in themselves and little regarded practices, in fact, which the leading men in the art do not hesitate to avow, that have wrought the corruption of the manners of our empire. The practices I allude to are those to which, while enjoying robust health, we submit, such, for instance, as rubbing the body with wax and oil, a preparation for a wrestling match by rights, but which, these men pretend, was invented as a preservative of health, the use of hot baths, which are necessary, they have persuaded us, for the proper digestion of the food, baths which no one ever leaves without being all the weaker for it, and from which the more submissive of their patients are only carried to the tomb, potions taken fasting, vomits to clear the stomach, and then a series of fresh drenchings with drink, emasculation, self-inflicted by the use of pitch plasters as depilatories, the public exposure, too, of even the most delicate parts of the female body for the prosecution of these practices. Most assuredly, so it is, the contagion which has seized upon the public morals has had no more fertile source than the medical art, and it continues, day by day even, to justify the claims of Cato to be considered a prophet and an oracle of wisdom, in that assertion of his that it is quite sufficient to dip into the records of Greek genius without becoming thoroughly acquainted with them. Such, then, is what may be said in justification of the Senate and of the Roman people during that period of six hundred years in which they manifested such repugnance to an art, by the most insidious terms of which good men are made to lend their credit and authority to the very worst, and so strongly entered their protest against the silly persuasions entertained by those who fancy that nothing can benefit them but what is coupled with high price. I entertain no doubt, too, that there will be found some to express their disgust at the particulars which I am about to give in relation to animals, and yet Virgil himself has not disdained, when, too, there was no necessity for his doing so, to speak of ants and weevils, and nests by beetles made that shun the light. Homer, too, amid his descriptions of the battles of the gods, has not disdained to remark upon the veracity of the common fly, nor has nature, she who engendered man, thought it beneath her to engender these insects as well. Let each, then, make it his care, not so much to regard the thing itself as to rightly appreciate in each case the cause and its effects. Chapter 9. Thirty-five Remedies Derived from Wool I shall begin, then, with some remedies that are well known, those, namely, which are derived from wool and from the eggs of birds, thus giving due honor to those substances which hold the principal place in the estimation of mankind, though at the same time I shall be necessitated to speak of some others out of their proper place, according as occasion may offer. I should not have been at a loss for high-flown language with which to grace my narrative had I made it my design to regard anything else than what, as being strictly trustworthy, becomes my work. For among the very first remedies mentioned, we find those said to be derived from the ashes and nest of the phoenix, as though, forsooth, its existence were a well-ascertained fact, and not altogether a fable. And then besides, it would be a mere mockery to describe remedies that can only return to us once in a thousand years. The ancient Romans attributed to wool a degree of religious importance even, and it was in this spirit that they enjoined that the bride should touch the doorposts of her husband's house with wool. In addition to dress and protection from the cold, wool, in an unwashed state, used in combination with oil and wine or vinegar, supplies us with numerous remedies, according as we stand in need of an emollient, or an excitant, an astringent, or a laxative. Wetted from time to time with these liquids, greasy wool is applied to sprained limbs and to sinews that are suffering from pain. In the case of sprains, some persons are in the habit of adding salt, while others, again, apply pounded rue and grease in wool. The same, too, in the case of contusions or tumors. Wool will improve the breath, it is said, if the teeth and gums are rubbed with it, mixed with honey. It is very good, too, for phrenitis, used as a fumigation. To arrest the bleeding of the nose, 
wool is introduced into the nostrils with oil of roses, or it is used in another manner, the ears being well plugged with it. In the case of inveterate ulcers, it is applied topically with honey. Soaked in wine or vinegar, or in cold water and oil, and then squeezed out, it is used for the cure of wounds. Ram's wool, washed in cold water and steeped in oil, is used for female complaints and to allay inflammations of the uterus. Proceedance of the uterus is reduced by using this wool in the form of a fumigation. Greasy wool, used as a plaster and as a pessary, brings away the dead fetus and arrests uterine discharges. Bites inflicted by a mad dog are plugged with unwashed wool, the application being removed at the end of seven days. Applied with cold water, it is a cure for agnails. Steeped in a mixture of boiling nitre, sulfur, oil, vinegar, and tar, and applied twice a day, as warm as possible, it allays pains in the loins. By making ligatures with unwashed ram's wool about the extremities of the limbs, bleeding is effectually stopped. In all cases, the wool most esteemed is that from the neck of the animal, the best kinds of wool being those of Galatia, Tarentum, Attica, and Miletus. For excoriations, blows, bruises, contusions, crushes, galls, falls, pains in the head and other parts, and for inflammation of the stomach, unwashed wool is applied with a mixture of vinegar and oil of roses. Reduced to ashes, it is applied to contusions, wounds, and burns, and forms an ingredient in ophthalmic compositions. It is employed also for fistulas and separations of the ears. For this last purpose, some persons take the wool as it is shorn, while others pluck it from the fleece. They then cut off the ends of it, and after drying and carding it, lay it in pots of unbaked earth, steep it well in honey, and burn it. Others, again, arrange it in layers alternately with chips of torch pine, and after sprinkling it with oil, set fire to it. They then rub the ashes into small vessels with the hands and let them settle in water there. This operation is repeated and the water changed several times until at last the ashes are found to be slightly astringent without the slightest pungency, upon which they are put by for use, being possessed of certain caustic properties and extremely useful as a detergent for the eyelids. Chapter 10 32 Remedies Derived from Wool Grease And not only this, but the filthy excretions even of sheep, the sweat adhering to the wool of the flanks and of the auxiliary concavities, a substance known as esopum, are applied to purposes almost innumerable, the grease produced by the sheep of Attica being the most highly esteemed. There are numerous ways of obtaining it, but the most approved method is to take the wool, fresh clipped from those parts of the body, or else the sweat and grease collected from any part of the fleece, and boil it gently in a copper vessel upon a slow fire. This done, it is left to cool, and the fat which floats upon the surface collected into an earthen vessel. The material originally used is then subjected to another boiling, and the two results are washed in cold water, after which they are strained through a linen cloth and exposed to the sun till they become bleached and quite transparent, and are then put by in a pewter box for keeping. The best proof of its genuineness is its retention of the strong smell of the original grease, and its not melting when rubbed with water upon the hand, but turning white like white lead in appearance. This substance is extremely useful for inflammations of the eyes and indurations of the eyelids. Some persons bake the wool in an earthen pot until it has lost all its grease, and are of the opinion that, prepared this way, it is a more useful remedy for excoriations and indurations of the eyelids, for eruptions in the corners of the eyes, and for watery eyes. And not only does this grease heal ulcerations of the eyes, but, mixed with goose grease, of the ears and generative organs as well, in combination also with melilot and butter, it is a cure for inflammations of the uterus, and for excoriations of the rectum and condylomata. The other uses to which it is applied we shall detail on a more appropriate occasion. The grease, too, of the wool about the tail is made up into pills unmixed with any substance. These pills are dried and pulverized, being an excellent application for the teeth when loose even, and for the gums when attacked by spreading ulcers of cancerous nature. Sheep's wool, too, cleaned, is applied by itself or with the addition of sulfur for dull, heavy pains and the ashes of it, burnt, are used for diseases of the generative organs. Indeed, this wool is possessed of such sovereign virtues that it is used as a covering for medicinal applications even. It is also an especial remedy for the sheep itself, 
when it has lost its stomach and refuses to feed. For, upon plucking some wool from the tail, and then tying the tail therewith as tight as possible, the sheep will fall to feeding immediately. It is said, however, that the part of the tail which lies beyond the knot so made will quickly mortify and die. End of section 15. Read by Olivia. Section 16 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 16, Book 29, Chapters 11 through 25. Chapter 11. 22 Remedies Derived from Eggs There is a considerable affinity also between wool and eggs, which are applied together as a frontal to the forehead, by way of cure, for deflections of the eyes. Wool, however, is not required for this purpose to have been dressed with radicula, the only thing requisite to be combined with it being the white of an egg and powdered frankincense. The white of an egg, also applied by itself, arrests deflections of the eyes, and has a cooling effect upon inflammations of those organs. Some, however, prefer mixing saffron with it and employ it as an ingredient in eye salves in place of water. For ophthalmalia in infants, there is hardly any remedy to be found except white of egg mixed with fresh butter. Eggs beaten up with oil are very soothing for erysipelas, beet leaves being laid on the liniment. White of egg, mixed with pounded gum ammoniae, is used as a bandolin for arranging the hairs of the eyelids, and in combination with pine nuts and a little honey, it forms a lineament for the removal of pimples on the face. If the face is well rubbed with it, it will never be sunburned. If the moment the flesh has been scalded and egg is applied, no blisters will form. Some persons, however, mix it with barley meal and a little salt. In cases of ulceration formed by burns, there is nothing better than parched barley and hog's lard mixed with the white of an egg. The same mixture is also used as an application for diseases of the rectum, in infants even, and in cases too, when there is procedence of those parts. For the cure of chaps upon the feet, white of eggs is boiled, with two denarii of white lead, an equal quantity of litharge, a little myrrh, and some wine. For the cure of erysipelas, they use the whites of three eggs with a mylum. It is said, too, that the white of egg has the effect of knitting wounds and of expelling urinary calculi. The yolk of eggs boiled hard, applied in women's milk with a little saffron and honey, has a soothing effect upon pains in the eyes. The yolk is applied also to the eyes in wool, mixed with honeyed wine and oil of roses, or else mixed with ground parsley seed and polenta and applied with honeyed wine. The yolk of a single egg, swallowed raw by itself, without being allowed to touch the teeth, is remarkably good for cough, deflections of the chest, and irritations of the fauces. It is used, too, both internally and externally, in a raw state, as a sovereign cure for the sting of hemorrhoids, and it is highly beneficial for the kidneys, for irritations and ulcerations of the bladder, and for bloody expectorations. For dysentery, the yolks of five eggs are taken raw in one semi-sectarius of wine, mixed with the ashes of the shells, poppy juice, and wine. For the coliac fluxes, it is recommended to take the yolks of eggs with like proportions of pulpy raisins and pomegranate rind in equal quantities for three consecutive days or else to follow another method and take the yolks of three eggs with three ounces of old bacon and honey and three sciathi of old wine, the whole being beaten up to the consistency of honey and taken in water, when needed, in pieces the size of a hazelnut. In some cases, too, the yolks of three eggs are fried in oil, the whole of the egg having been steeped a day previously in vinegar. It is in this way that eggs are used for the treatment of spleen diseases, but for spitting of blood, they should be taken with three sciathi of must. 
Yoga bag is used too for the cure of bruises of long standing in combination with bulbs and honey. Boiled and taken in wine, yolks of eggs arrest menstruation. Applied raw with oil or wine, they dispel inflammations of the uterus. Mixed with goose grease and oil of roses, they are useful for crick in the neck, and they are hardened over the fire and applied warm for the cure of maladies of the rectum. For condylomata, eggs are used in combination with oil of roses, and for the treatment of burns, they are hardened in water and set upon hot coals till the shells are burnt, the yellow being used as a lineament with oil of roses. Eggs become entirely transformed into yolk on being removed after the hen has sat upon them for three days, in which state they are known by the name of Cetista. The chicks that are found within the shell are used for strengthening a disordered stomach, being eaten with half a nut gall, and no other food taken for the next two hours. They are given also for dysentery, boiled in the egg with one semi sextarius of astringent wine, and an equal quantity of olive oil and polenta. The pellicule that lines the shell is used, either raw or boiled, for the cure of cracked lips. And the shell itself, reduced to ashes, is taken in wine for discharges of blood. Care must be taken, however, to burn it without the pellicule. In the same way, too, a dentifrice is prepared. The ashes of the shell, applied topically with myrrh, arrest menstruation when in excess. So remarkably strong is the shell of an egg that if it is set upright, no force or weight can break it unless a slight inclination be made to one side or the other of the circumference. Eggs taken whole in wine with rue, dill, and cumin facilitate parturition. Used with wine and cedar resin, they remove itch and prurigo and applied in combination with cyclaminos. They are remedial for running ulcers of the head. For purulent expectorations and spitting of blood, a raw egg is taken, warmed with juice of cut leek and an equal quantity of Greek honey. For coughs, eggs are administered, boiled and beaten up with honey or else raw, with raisin wine and an equal quantity of olive oil. For diseases of the male organs, an injection is made of an egg, three cyathi of raisin wine and half an ounce of amylum the mixture being used immediately after the bath. Where injuries have been inflicted by serpents, boiled eggs are used as a lineament, beaten up with nasturtium. In what various ways eggs are used as food is well known to all, passing downwards, however swollen the throat may be, and warming the parts as they pass. Eggs, too, are the only diet which, while it affords nutriment and sickness, does not load the stomach possessing at the same moment all the advantages both of food and drink. We have already stated that the shell of an egg becomes soft when steeped in vinegar. It is by the aid of eggs thus prepared and kneaded up with meal into bread that patients suffering from coliac flux are often restored to strength. Some, however, think it a better plan to roast the eggs when thus softened in a shallow pan, a method by the aid of which they arrest not only looseness of bowels, but excessive menstruation as well. In cases, again, where the discharges are greatly in excess, eggs are taken raw with meal and water. The yolks, too, are employed alone, boiled hard in vinegar and roasted with ground pepper when wanted to arrest diarrhea. For dysentery, there is a sovereign remedy prepared in the following manner. An egg is emptied into a new earthen vessel, which done, in order that all the proportions may be equal, fill the shell first with honey, then with oil, and then with vinegar. Beat them up together and thoroughly incorporate them. The better the quality of the several ingredients, the more efficacious the mixture will be. Others, again, instead of oil and vinegar, use the same proportions of red resin and wine. There is also another way of making up this preparation. The proportion of oil, and of that only, remains the same, and to it they add two sixtieth parts of a denarius of the vegetable, which we have spoken of under the name of ruse, and five oboli of honey. All these ingredients are boiled down together, and no food is taken by the patient till the end of four hours after taking the mixture. Many persons, too, have a cure for gripping pains of the bowels by beating up two eggs with four cloves of garlic and administering them warmed in one semi-sextarius of wine. 
not to omit anything in commendation of eggs. I would here add that glare of egg mixed with quicklime unites broken glass. Indeed, so great is the efficacy of the substance of egg that wood dipped in it will not take fire, and cloth with which it has come in contact will not ignite. On this occasion, however, it is only of the eggs of poultry that I have been speaking, though those of the various other birds, as well, are possessed of many useful properties, as I shall have to mention on the appropriate occasions. Chapter 12. Serpent's Eggs In addition to the above, there is another kind of egg, held in high renown by the people of the Gaelic provinces, but totally omitted by the Greek writers. In summertime, numberless snakes become artificially entwined together and form rings around their bodies with the viscous slime which exudes from their mouths and with the foam excreted by them. The name given to this substance is anguinum. The druids tell us that the serpents eject these eggs into the air by their hissing and that a person must be ready to catch them in a cloak so as not to let them touch the ground. They say also that he must instantly take to flight on horseback, as the serpents will be sure to pursue him, until some intervening river has placed a barrier between them. The test of its genuineness, they say, is its floating against the current of a stream, even though it be set in gold. But as it is the way with magicians to be dexterous and cunning in casting a veil about their frauds, they pretend that these eggs can only be taken on a certain day of the moon, as though, forsooth, it depended entirely upon the human will to make the moon and the serpents accord as to the moment of this operation. I myself, however, have seen one of these eggs. It was round and about as large as an apple of moderate size. The shell of it was formed of a cartilaginous substance, and it was surrounded with numerous cupules, as it were, resembling those upon the arms of Polypus. It is held in high estimation among the Druids. The possession of it is marvelously vaunted as ensuring success in lawsuits and a favorable reception with princes, a notion which has been so far belied that a Roman of equestrian rank, a native of the territory of the Vocantii, who, during a trial, had one of these eggs in his bosom, was slain by the late emperor Tiberius, and for no other reason that I know of, but because he was in possession of it. It is this entwining of serpents with one another, and the fruitful result of this unison, that seem to me to have given rise to the usage, among foreign nations, of surrounding the caduceus with representations of serpents as so many symbols of peace. It must be remembered, too, that on the caduceus, serpents are never represented as having crests. Chapter 13. The Method of Preparing Comagenum. Four Remedies Derived From It. Having to make mention, in the present book, of the eggs of the goose and the numerous uses to which they are applied, as also of the bird itself, it is our duty to award the honor to Comagene of a most celebrated preparation there made. This composition is prepared from goose grease, a substance applied to many other well-known uses as well. But in the case of that, which comes from Comagene, a part of Syria, the grease is first incorporated with cinnamon, cassia, white pepper, and the plant called comagene, and then placed in vessels and buried in the snow. The mixture has an agreeable smell, and it is found extremely useful for cold shiverings, convulsions, heavy or sudden pains, and all those affections, in fact, which are treated with a class of remedies known as a copa, being equally an unguent and a medicament. There is another method also of preparing it in Syria. The fat of the bird is preserved in a manner already described, and there is added to it erysoskeptrum, xylobalsamum, palm elate, and calamus, each in the same proportion as the grease, the whole being gently boiled some two or three times in wine. This preparation is made in winter, as in summer it will never thicken, except with the addition of wax. There are numerous other remedies also, derived from the goose, as well as from the raven, a thing I am much surprised at, seeing that both the goose and the raven are generally said to be in a diseased state at the end of summer and the beginning of autumn. Chapter 14. Remedies Derived from the Dog We have already spoken of the honors earned by the geese when the Gauls were detected in their attempt to scale the capital. It is for a corresponding reason, also, that punishment is yearly inflicted upon the dogs 
by crucifying them alive upon a gibbet of elder, between the temple of Juventus and that of Sumanus. In reference to this last-mentioned animal, the usages of our forefathers compel us to enter into some further details. They consider the flesh of sucking whelps to be so pure a meat that they were in the habit of using them as victims even in their expiatory sacrifices. A young whelp, too, is sacrificed to genita mana, and at the repast celebrated in honor of the gods, it is still the usage to set whelp's flesh on table. At the inaugural feast, too, of the pontiffs, this dish was in common use, as we learn from the comedies of Plautus. It is generally thought that for narcotic poisons, there is nothing better than dog's blood, and it would appear that it was this animal that first taught man the use of emetics. Other medicinal uses of the dog, which are marvelously commended, I shall have occasion to refer to on the appropriate occasions. Chapter 15 Remedies classified according to the different maladies. Remedies for injuries inflicted by serpents. Remedies derived from mice. We now resume the order originally proposed. For stings inflicted by serpents, fresh sheep's dung, boiled in wine, is considered a very useful application, as also mice split asunder and applied to the wound. Indeed, these last animals are possessed of certain properties, by no means to be despised, at the ascension of the planets more particularly, as already stated, the lobes increasing or decreasing in number with the age of the moon, as the case may be. The magicians have a story that swine will follow any person who gives them a mouse's liver to eat, enclosed in a fig. They say, too, that it has a similar effect upon man, but that the spell may be destroyed by swallowing a cyathus of oil. Chapter 16 Remedies derived from the weasel. There are two varieties of the weasel, the one, wild, larger than the other, and known to the Greeks as the ictus. Its gall is said to be very efficacious as an antidote to the sting of the asp, but of a venomous nature in other respects. The other kind, which prowls about our houses and is in the habit, Cicero tells us, of removing its young ones and changing every day from place to place, is an enemy to serpents. The flesh of this last, preserved in salt, is given, in doses of one denarius, in three cyathi of drink, to persons who have been stung by serpents, or else the maw of the animal is stuffed with coriander seed and dried, to be taken for the same purpose in wine. The young one of the weasel is still more efficacious for these purposes. Chapter 17. Remedies Derived from Bugs There are some things of a most revolting nature, but which are recommended by authors with such a degree of assurance that it would be improper to omit them, the more particularly as it is, to the sympathy or antipathy of objects that remedies owe their existence. Thus the bug, for instance, a most filthy insect, and one the very name of which inspires us with loathing, is said to be a neutralizer of the venom of serpents, asps in particular, and to be a preservative against all kinds of poisons. As a proof of this, they tell us that the sting of an asp is never fatal to poultry if they have eaten bugs that day, and that, if such is the case, their flesh is remarkably beneficial to persons who have been stung by serpents. Of the various recipes given in reference to these insects, the least revolting are the application of them externally to the wound with the blood of a tortoise, the employment of them as a fumigation to make leeches loose their hold, and the administering of them to animals in drink when a leech has been accidentally swallowed. Some persons, however, go so far as to crush bugs with salt and woman's milk and anoint the eyes with the mixture. In combination, too, with honey and oil of roses, they use them as an injection for the ears. Field bugs, again, and those found upon the mallow are burnt, and the ashes mixed with oil of roses as an injection for the ears. As to the other remedial virtues attributed to bugs, for the cure of vomiting, quartan fevers, and other diseases, although we find recommendations given to swallow them in an egg, some wax, or in a bean, I look upon them as utterly unfounded, and not worthy of further notice. They are employed, however, for the treatment of lethargy, and with some fair reason, as they successfully neutralize the narcotic effects of the poison of the asp. 
For this purpose, seven of them are administered in a cyathus of water, but in the case of children, only four. In cases, too, of strangury, they have been injected into the urinary channel. So true it is that nature, that universal parent, has engendered nothing without some powerful reason or other. In addition to these particulars, a couple of bugs, it is said, attached to the left arm in some wool that has been stolen from the shepherds, will effectually cure nocturnal fevers, while those recurrent in the daytime may be treated with equal success by enclosing the bugs in a piece of russet-colored cloth. The scolopendra, on the other hand, is a great enemy to these insects. Used in the form of a fumigation, it kills them. Chapter 18. Particulars Relative to the Asp The sting of the asp takes deadly effect by causing torpor and dizziness. Of all serpents, injuries inflicted by the asp are the most incurable, and their venom, if it comes in contact with the blood or a recent wound, produces instantaneous death. If, on the other hand, it touches an old sore, its fatal effects are not so immediate. Taken internally, in however large a quantity, the venom is not injurious, as it has no corrosive properties, for which reason it is that the flesh of animals killed by it may be eaten with impunity. I should hesitate in giving circulation to a prescription for injuries inflicted by the asp, were it not that Marcus Varro, then in the 83rd year of his age, has left a statement to the effect that it is a most efficient remedy for wounds inflicted by this reptile for the person stung to drink his own urine. Chapter 19. Remedies Derived from the Basilisk As to the basilisk, a creature which the very serpents fly from, which kills by its odor even, and which proves fatal to man by only looking upon him, its blood has been marvelously extolled by magicians. This blood is thick and adhesive, like pitch, which it resembles also in color. Dissolved in water, they say, it becomes a brighter red than that of cinnabar. They attribute to it also the property of ensuring success to petitions, preferred to potentates, and to prayers even offered to the gods. And they regard it as a remedy for various diseases, and as an amulet preservative against all noxious spells. Some give it the name of Saturn's blood. Chapter 20. Remedies Derived from the Dragon The dragon is a serpent, destitute of venom, its head placed beneath the threshold of a door. The gods being duly propitiated by prayers will ensure good fortune to the house, it is said. Its eyes, dried and beaten up with honey, form a lineament which is an effectual preservative against the terrors of specters by night, in the case of the most timorous even, the fat adhering to the heart, attached to the arm with a deer's sinews in the skin of a gazelle, will ensure success in lawsuits, it is said, and the first joint of the vertebrae will secure an easy access to persons in high office. The teeth, attached to the body with a deer's sinews in the skin of a roebuck, have the effect of rendering masters indulgent and potentates gracious, it is said. But the most remarkable thing of all is its composition, by the aid of which the lying magicians profess to render persons invincible. They take the tail and head of a dragon, the hairs of a lion's forehead, with the marrow of that animal, the foam of a horse that has won a race, and the claws of a dog's feet. These they tie up together in a deer's skin, and fasten them alternately with the sinews of a deer and a gazelle. It is, however, no better worth our while to refute such pretensions as these than it would be to describe the alleged remedies for injuries inflicted by serpents, seeing that all these contrivances are so many evil devices to poison men's morals. Dragon's fat will repel venomous creatures, an effect which is equally produced by burning the fat of the ichneumon. They will take to flight also at the approach of a person who has been rubbed with nettles bruised in vinegar. Chapter 21. Remedies Derived from the Viper The application of viper's head, even if it be not the one that has inflicted the wound, is of infinite utility as a remedy. It is highly advantageous, too, to hold the viper that inflicted the injury on the end of a stick over the steam of boiling water, for it will quite undo the mischief, they say. The ashes also of the viper are considered very useful, employed as a lineament for the wound, According to what Nagidius tells us, serpents are compelled, by a certain natural instinct, 
to return to the person who has been stung by them. The people of Scythia split the viper's head between the ears in order to extract a small stone, which it swallows in its alarm, they say. Others, again, use the head entire. From the viper are prepared those tablets, which are known as theriaci to the Greeks. For this purpose, the animal is cut away three fingers lengths from both the head and the tail, after which the intestines are removed and the livid vein adhering to the backbone. The rest of the body is then boiled in a shallow pan in water seasoned with dill, and the bones are taken out and fine wheaten flour added, after which the preparation is made up into tablets, which are dried in the shade and are employed as an ingredient in numerous medicaments. I should remark, however, that this preparation, it would appear, can only be made from the viper. Some persons, after cleansing the viper in manner above described, boil down the fat with one sectarius of olive oil to one half. Of this preparation, when needed, three drops are added to some oil, with which mixture the body is rubbed to repel the approach of all kinds of noxious animals. Chapter 22 Remedies derived from the other serpents. In addition to these particulars, it is a well-known fact that for all injuries inflicted by serpents, and those even of an otherwise incurable nature, it is an excellent remedy to apply the entrails of the serpent itself to the wound, as also that persons who have once swallowed a viper's liver, boiled, will never afterwards be attacked by serpents. The snake, too, is not venomous, except, indeed, upon certain days of the month when it is irritated by the action of the moon. It is a very useful plan to take it alive and pound it in water, the wound inflicted by it being fomented with the preparation. Indeed, it is generally supposed that this reptile is possessed of numerous other remedial properties, as we shall have occasion more fully to mention from time to time. Hence it is that the snake is consecrated to Aesculapius. As for Democritus, he has given some monstrous preparations from snakes, by the aid of which the language of birds, he says, may be understood. The Aesculapian snake was first brought to Rome from Epidaurus, but at the present day it is very commonly reared in our houses even, so much so, indeed, that if the breed were not taken down by the frequent conflagrations, it would be impossible to make head against the rapid increase of them. But the most beautiful of all the snakes are those which are of an amphibious nature. These snakes are known as hydri or water snakes. In virulence, their venom is inferior to that of no other class of serpents, and their liver is preserved as a remedy for the ill effects of their sting. A pounded scorpion neutralizes the venom of the spotted lizard. From this last animal, too, there is a noxious preparation made, for it has been found that wine in which it has been drowned covers the face of those who drinks it with morphew. Hence it is that females, when jealous of a rival's beauty, are in the habit of stifling a spotted lizard in the unguents which they made. In such a case, the proper remedy is a yolk of egg, honey, and nitre. The gall of a spotted lizard, beaten up in water, attracts weasels, they say. Chapter 23. Remedies Derived from the Salamander But of all venomous animals, it is the salamander that is by far the most dangerous. For while other reptiles attack individuals only, and never kill many persons at a time, not to mention the fact that after stinging a human being, they are said to die of remorse, and the earth refuses to harbor them. The salamander is able to destroy whole nations at once, unless they take the proper precautions against it. For if this reptile happens to crawl up a tree, it infects all the fruit with its poison, and kills those who eat thereof, by the chilling properties of its venom, which in its effects is in no way different from aconite. Nay, even more than this, if it only touches with its foot the wood upon which bread is baked, or if it happens to fall into a well, the same fatal effects will be sure to ensue. The saliva, too, of this reptile, if it comes in contact with any part of the body, the sole of the foot even, will cause the hair to fall off from the whole of the body. And yet the salamander, highly venomous as it is, is eaten by certain animals, swine, for example, owing, no doubt, to that antipathy which prevails in the natural world. From what we have stated, it is most probable that next to the animals which eat it, 
The best neutralizers of the poison of this reptile are cantharides taken in drink, or a lizard eaten with the food. Other antidotes we have already mentioned, or shall notice in the proper place. As to what the magicians say, that it is proof against fire, being, as they tell us, the only animal that has the property of extinguishing fire, if it had been true, it would have been made trial of at Rome long before this. Sextius says that the salamander, preserved in honey and taken with the food, after removing the intestines, head and feet, acts as an aphrodisiac. He denies also that it has the property of extinguishing fire. Chapter 24. Remedies derived from birds for injuries inflicted by serpents. Remedies derived from the vulture. Among the birds that afford us remedies against serpents, it is the vulture that occupies the highest rank. The black vulture, it has been remarked, being less efficacious than the others. The smell of their feathers, burnt, will repel serpents, they say, and it has been asserted that persons that carry the heart of this bird about with them will be safe not only from serpents but from wild beasts as well, and will have nothing to fear from the attacks of robbers or from the wrath of kings. Chapter 25. Remedies Derived from Poultry The flesh of cocks and capons, applied warm the moment it has been plucked from the bones, neutralizes the venom of serpents, and the brains taken in wine are productive of a similar effect. The people of Parthia, however, prefer applying a hen's brains to the wound. Poultry broth, too, is highly celebrated as a cure and is found marvelously useful in many other cases. Panthers and lions will never touch persons who have been rubbed with it, more particularly if it has been flavored with garlic. The broth that has been made of an old cock is more relaxing to the bowels. It is very good also for chronic fevers, numbness of the limbs, cold shiverings and maladies of the joints, pains also in the head, defluxions of the eyes, flatulency, sickness at stomach, incipient tenesmus, liver complaints, diseases of the kidneys, affections of the bladder, indigestion, and asthma. Hence there are several remedies for preparing this broth, it being most efficacious when boiled up with sea cabbage, salt honey, capers, parsley, the plant mercurialis, polypodium or dill. The best plan, however, is to boil the cock or capon with the plants above mentioned in three congii of water, down to three semi-sectarii, after which it should be left to cool in the open air and given at the proper moment just after an emetic has been administered. And here I must not omit to mention one marvelous fact, even though it bears no reference to medicine. If the flesh of poultry is mingled with gold in a state of fusion, it will absorb the metal and consume it, thus showing that it acts as a poison upon gold. If young twigs are made up into a collar and put around a cock's neck, it will never crow. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 17. Book 29, Chapters 26 to 39. Chapter 26 Remedies Derived from Other Birds. The flesh of pigeons also, or of swallows, used fresh and minced, is a remedy for injuries inflicted by serpents. The same too with the feet of a horned owl, burnt with the plant plumbago. While mentioning this bird, too, I must not forget to cite another instance of the impositions practised by the magicians. Among other prodigious lies of theirs, they pretend that the heart of a horned owl applied to the left breast of a woman while asleep will make her disclose all her secret thoughts. They say also, in addition to this, that persons who have it about them in battle will be sure to display valour. 
They describe too certain remedies made from the egg of this bird for the hair. But who, pray, has ever had the opportunity of seeing the egg of a horned owl, considering that it is so highly ominous to see the bird itself? And then, besides, who has ever thought proper to make the experiment, and upon his hair more particularly? In addition to all this, the magicians go so far as to engage to make the hair curl by using the blood of the young of the horned owl. What they tell us, too, about the bat appears to belong to pretty much the same class of stories. If one of these animals is carried alive three times round a house, they say, and then nailed outside of the window with the head downwards, it will have all the effects of a counter charm. They assert also that the bat is a most excellent preservative for sheep folds, being first carried three times round them, and then hung up by the foot over the lintel of the door. The blood of the bat is also recommended by them as a sovereign remedy, in combination with a thistle, for injuries inflicted by serpents. Chapter 27. Remedies for the Bite of the Phalangium The Several Varieties of that Insect and of the Spider Of the Phalangium, an insect unknown to Italy, there are numerous kinds one of which resembles the ant, but is much larger, with a red head, black as to the other parts of the body, and covered with white spots. Its sting is much more acute than that of the wasp, and it lives mostly in the vicinity of ovens and mills. The proper remedy is to present before the eyes of the person stung another insect of the same description, a purpose for which they are preserved when found dead. Their husks, also, found in a dry state, are beaten up and taken in drink for a similar purpose. The young of the weasel, too, as already stated, are possessed of a similar property. The Greeks give the name of phalangion also to a kind of spider, but they generally distinguish it by the surname of the wolf. A third kind, also known as the phalangium, is a spider with a hairy body and a head of enormous size. When opened, there are found in it two small worms, they say, these attached in a piece of deer's skin before sunrise to a woman's body, will prevent conception, according to what Cecilius in his commentaries says. This property lasts, however, for a year only, and indeed it is the only one of all the anticonceptives that I feel myself at liberty to mention in favour of some women whose fecundity, quite teeming with children, stands in need of some such respite. There is another kind, again, called ragion, similar to a black grape in appearance, with a very diminutive mouth, situate beneath the abdomen, and extremely short legs, which have all the appearance of not being fully developed. The bite of this last insect causes fully as much pain as the sting of the scorpion, and the urine of persons who are injured by it presents filmy appearances, like cobwebs. The asterion would be identical with it, were it not distinguished by white streaks upon the body. Its bite causes failing in the knees. But worse than either of these last is a blue spider covered with black hair, and causing dimness of the sight and vomiting of a matter like cobwebs in appearance. A still more dangerous kind is one which differs only from the hornet in form, in being destitute of wings, and the bite of which causes a wasting away of the system. The myrmecion in the head resembles the ant, has a black body spotted with white, and causes by its bite a pain like that attendant upon the sting of the wasp. Of the tetra gnathius, there are two varieties, the more noxious of which has two white streaks crossing each other on the middle of the head. Its bite causes the mouth to swell. The other one is of an ashy colour, whitish on the posterior part of the body, and not so ready to bite. The least noxious of all is the spider that is seen extending its web along the walls and lying in wait for flies. It is of the same ashy colour as the last. 
For the bite of all spiders, the best remedies are a cock's brains taken in oxycrate with a little pepper, five ants swallowed in drink, sheep's dung applied in vinegar, and spiders of any kind left to putrefy in oil. The bite of the shrew mouse is cured by taking lamb's rennet in wine, the ashes of a ram's foot with honey, or a young weasel prepared in manner already mentioned by us when speaking of serpents. In cases where a shrew mouse has bitten beasts of burden, a mouse fresh caught is applied to the wound with oil, or a bat's gall with vinegar. The shrew mouse itself, too, split asunder and applied to the wound, is a cure for its bite. Indeed, if the animal is with young when the injury is inflicted, it will instantly burst asunder. The best plan is to apply the mouse itself which has inflicted the bite, but others are commonly kept for this purpose, either steeped in oil or coated with clay. Another remedy again for its bite is the earth taken from the rut made by a cartwheel. For this animal, it is said, owing to a certain torpor which is natural to it, will never cross a rut made by a wheel. Chapter 28. Remedies derived from the stelio or spotted lizard. The stelio, in its turn, is said to have the greatest antipathy to the scorpion. So much so, indeed, that the very sight of it strikes terror in that reptile, and a torpor attended with cold sweats. Hence it is that this lizard is left to putrefy in oil, as a liniment for injuries inflicted by the scorpion. Some persons boil down the oil with litharge, and make a sort of plaster of it to apply to the wound. The Greeks give the name of colotes to this lizard, as also Ascalabotis and Galeotis. It is never found in Italy and is covered with small spots, utters a shrill piercing noise and lives on food. Characteristics, all of them, foreign to the Stelio of Italy. Chapter 29. Remedies derived from various insects. Poultry dung, too, is good as an application for the sting of the scorpion. A dragon's liver also. A lizard or mouse split asunder, or else the scorpion itself, either applied to the wound, grilled and eaten, or taken in two sciathi of undiluted wine. One peculiarity of the scorpion is that it never stings the palm of the hand, and never touches any parts of the body but those covered with hair. Any kind of pebble applied to the wound on the side which has lain next to the ground will alleviate the pain. A potsherd, too, covered with earth on any part of it and applied just as it is found, will effect a cure, it is said. The person, however, who applies it must not look behind him and must be equally careful that the sun does not shine upon him. Earthworms also are pounded and applied to the wound in addition to which they form ingredients in numerous other medicaments, being kept in honey for the purpose. For injuries inflicted by bees, wasps, hornets and leeches, the owlet is considered a very useful remedy. Persons too who carry about them the beak of the woodpecker of Mars are never injured by any of these creatures. The smaller kinds of locusts also, destitute of wings, and known as a telebi, are a good remedy for the sting of the scorpion. There is a kind of venomous ant, by no means common in Italy. Cicero calls it solipuga, and in Betica it is known as salpuga. The proper remedy for its venom, and that of all kinds of ants, is a bat's heart. We have already stated that cantharides are an antidote to the salamander. Chapter 30. Remedies derived from cantharides. But with reference to cantharides, there has been considerable controversy on the subject, seeing that, taken internally, they are a poison, attended with excruciating pains in the bladder. Cosinus, a Roman of the equestrian order, 
well known for his intimate friendship with the Emperor Nero, being attacked with lichen, that prince sent to Egypt for a physician to cure him, who, recommending a potion prepared from Cantharides, the patient was killed in consequence. There is no doubt, however, that, applied externally, they are useful, in combination with juice of Taminian grapes and the suet of a sheep or she-goat. As to the part of the body in which the poison of the insect is situate, authors are by no means agreed. Some fancy that it exists in the feet and head, while others again deny it. Indeed, the only point that has been well ascertained is that the wings are the only antidote to their venom wherever it may be situate. Cantharides are produced from a small grub, found more particularly in the spongy excrescences which grow on the stem of the dog rose, and still more abundantly upon the ash. Other kinds again are found upon the white rose, but they are by no means so efficacious. The most active of all in their properties are those which are spotted with yellow streaks running transversely across the wings, and are plump and well filled. Those which are small, broad and hairy are not so powerful in their operation, and the least useful of all are those which are thin and shriveled and present one uniform colour. They are put in a small earthen pot, not coated with pitch, and stopped at the mouth with a linen cloth a layer of full-blown roses being placed upon them. They are then suspended over vinegar boiled with salt until the steam has penetrated the cloth and stifled them, after which they are put by for use. They have a caustic effect upon the skin and cover the ulcerations with a crust, a property which belongs also to the pine caterpillar found upon the pitch tree and to the bupestris, both of which are prepared in a similar manner. All these insects are extremely efficacious for the cure of leprosy and lichens. It is said too that they act as an ememagogue and diuretic, for which last reason Hippocrates used to prescribe them for dropsy. Cato of Utica was reproached with selling poison because when disposing of a royal property by auction, he sold a quantity of cantharides at the price of 60,000 sesterces. We may here remark, too, that it was on the same occasion that some ostrich fat was sold at the price of 30,000 sesterces, a substance which is preferable to goose grease in every respect. Chapter 31. Various Counterpoisons we have already spoken of various kinds of poisonous honey. The antidote employed for it is honey in which the bees have been stifled. This honey too, taken in wine, is a remedy for indispositions caused by eating fish. Chapter 32. Remedies for the Bite of the Mad Dog When a person has been bitten by a mad dog, he may be preserved from hydrophobia by applying the ashes of a dog's head to the wound. All ashes of this description, we may here remark once for all, are prepared in the same method, the substance being placed in a new earthen vessel, well covered with potter's clay, and put into a furnace. These ashes, too, are very good taken in drink, and hence some recommend the head itself to be eaten in such cases. Others again attach to the body of the patient a maggot taken from the carcass of a dead dog, or else place the menstruous blood of a bitch in a linen cloth beneath his cup, or insert in the wound ashes of hairs from the tail of the dog that inflicted the bite. Dogs will fly from anyone who has a dog's heart about him, and they will never bark at a person who carries a dog's tongue in his shoe beneath the great toe, or the tail of a weasel which has been set at liberty after being deprived of it. There is beneath the tongue of a mad dog a certain slimy spittle, which, taken in drink, is a preventative of hydrophobia. But much the most useful plan is 
to take the liver of the dog that has inflicted the injury and eat it raw if possible. Should that not be the case, it must be cooked in some way or other, or else a broth must be taken, prepared from the flesh. There is a small worm in a dog's tongue, known as lita to the Greeks. If this is removed from the animal while a pup, it will never become mad or lose its appetite. This worm, after being carried thrice round a fire, is given to persons who have been bitten by a mad dog to prevent them from becoming mad. This madness, too, is prevented by eating a cock's brains. But the virtue of these brains lasts for one year only and no more. They say, too, that a cock's comb, pounded, is highly efficacious as an application to the wound, as also goose grease mixed with honey. The flesh also of a mad dog is sometimes salted and taken with the food as a remedy for this disease. In addition to this, young puppies of the same sex as the dog that has inflicted the injury are drowned in water and the person who has been bitten eats their liver raw. The dung of poultry, provided it is of a red colour, is very useful applied with vinegar. The ashes too of the tail of a shrew mouse, if the animal has survived and been set at liberty. A clod from a swallow's nest applied with vinegar. The young of a swallow reduced to ashes. Or the skin or old slough of a serpent that has been cast in spring, beaten up with a male crab in wine. This slough, I would remark, put away by itself in chests and drawers, destroys moths. So virulent is the poison of the mad dog that its very urine, even if trodden upon, is injurious, more particularly if the person has any ulcerous sores about him. The proper remedy in such case is to apply horse dung, sprinkled with vinegar, and warmed in a fig. These marvellous properties of the poison will occasion the less surprise when we remember that a stone bitten by a dog has become a proverbial expression for discord and variance. Whoever makes water where a dog has previously watered will be sensible of numbness in the loins, they say. The lizard, known by some persons as the seps and by others as the calcidice, taken in wine, is a cure for its own bite. Chapter 33. Remedies for the Other Poisons Where persons have been poisoned by noxious preparations from the wild weasel, the proper remedy is the broth of an old cock, taken in considerable quantities. This broth, too, is particularly good, taken as a counter-poison for aconite, in combination with a little salt. Poultry dung, but the white part only, boiled with hyssop or with honeyed wine, is an excellent antidote to the poison of fungi and of mushrooms. It is a cure also for flatulency and suffocations, a thing the more to be wondered at, seeing that if any other living creature only tastes this dung, it is immediately attacked with gripping pains and flatulency. Goose blood, taken with an equal quantity of olive oil, is an excellent neutraliser of the venom of the sea hare. It is kept also as an antidote for all kinds of noxious drugs, made up into lozenges with red earth and lemnos, and juice of white thorn, five drachmae of the lozenges being taken in three syathi of water. The same property belongs also to the young of the weasel, prepared in manner already mentioned. Lamb's rennet is an excellent antidote to all noxious preparations, the blood also of ducks from Pontus, for which reason it is preserved in a dry state and dissolved in wine when wanted, some persons being of opinion that the blood of the female bird is the most efficacious. In a similar manner, the crop of a stork acts as a universal counterpoison, and so does sheep's rennet. A broth made from ram's flesh is particularly good as a remedy for cantharides. Sheep's milk also taken warm. 
This last being very useful in cases where persons have drunk an infusion of aconite or have swallowed the buprestis in drink. The dung of wood pigeons is particularly good taken internally as an antidote to quicksilver. And for narcotic poisons, the common weasel is kept dried and taken internally in doses of two drachmae. Chapter 34 Remedies for Alopecia Where the hair has been lost through alopecia, it is made to grow again by using ashes of burnt sheep's dung with oil of cypress and honey, or else the hoof of a mule of either sex burnt to ashes and mixed with oil of myrtle. In addition to these substances, we find our own writer, Varro, mentioning mouse dung, which he calls muscerda, and the heads of flies applied fresh, the part being first rubbed with a fig leaf. Some recommend the blood of flies, while others again apply ashes of burnt flies for 10 days in the proportion of one part of the ashes to two of ashes of papyrus or of nuts. In other cases again, we find ashes of burnt flies kneaded up with women's milk and cabbage, or in some instances with honey only. It is generally believed that there is no creature less docile or less intelligent than the fly, a circumstance which makes it all the more marvellous that at the sacred games at Olympia, immediately after the immolation of the bull in honour of the god called Myiades, whole clouds of them take their departure from that territory. A mouse's head or tail, or indeed the whole of the body, reduced to ashes, is a cure for alopecia, more particularly when the loss of the hair has been the result of some noxious preparation. The ashes of a hedgehog mixed with honey, or of its skin applied with tar, are productive of a similar effect. The head too of this last animal, reduced to ashes, restores the hair to scars upon the body, the place being first prepared, when this cure is made use of, with a razor and an application of mustard. Some persons, however, prefer vinegar for the purpose. All the properties attributed to the hedgehog are found in the porcupine in a still higher degree. A lizard, burnt, as already mentioned, with the fresh root of a reed cut as fine as possible, to facilitate its being reduced to ashes, and then mixed with oil of myrtle, will prevent the hair from coming off. For all these purposes, green lizards are still more efficacious, and the remedy is rendered most effectual when salt is added, bear's grease, and pounded onions. Some persons boil ten green lizards in ten sextari of oil, and content themselves with rubbing the place with the mixture once a month. Alopecia is also cured very speedily with the ashes of a viper's skin or by an application of fresh poultry dung. A raven's egg, beaten up in a copper vessel and applied to the head, previously shaved, imparts a black colour to the hair. Care must be taken, however, to keep some oil in the mouth till the application is quite dry, or else the teeth will turn black as well. The operation must be performed also in the shade, and the liniment must not be washed off before the end of three days. Some persons employ the blood and brains of a raven in combination with red wine, while others again boil down the bird and put it at bedtime in a vessel made of lead. With some it is the practice for the cure of alopecia to apply bruised cantharides with tar, the skin being first prepared with an application of nitre. It should be remembered, however, that cantharides are possessed of caustic properties and due care must be taken not to let them eat too deep into the skin. For the ulcerations thus produced, it is recommended to use applications made of the heads, gall and dung of mice, mixed with hellebore and pepper. 
Chapter 35. Remedies for lice and for porigo. Nits are destroyed by using dog's fat, eating serpents cooked like eels, or else taking their sloughs in drink. Porigo is cured by applying sheep's gall with simoleon chalk and rubbing the head with the mixture till dry. Chapter 36. Remedies for headache and for wounds on the head. A good remedy for headache are the heads taken from the snails which are found without shells and in an imperfect state. In these heads there is found a hard stony substance about as large as a common pebble. On being extracted from the snail, it is attached to the patient, the smaller snails being pounded and applied to the forehead. Wool grease, too, is used for a similar purpose. The bones of a vulture's head, worn as an amulet, or the brains of that bird, mixed with oil and cedar resin, and applied to the head and introduced into the nostrils. The brains of a crow or owlet are boiled and taken with the food, or a cock is put into a coop and kept without food a day and a night, the patient submitting to a similar abstinence and attaching to his head some feathers plucked from the neck or the comb of the fowl. The ashes, too, of a weasel are applied in the form of a liniment. A twig is taken from a kite's nest and laid beneath the patient's pillow, or a mouse's skin is burnt and the ashes applied with vinegar. Sometimes also, the small bone is extracted from the head of a snail that has been found between two cart ruts, and after being passed through a gold ring with a piece of ivory, is attached to the patient in a piece of dog's skin, a remedy well known to most persons, and always used with success. For fractures of the cranium, cobwebs are applied with oil and vinegar the application never coming away till a cure has been effected. Cobwebs are good too for stopping the bleeding of wounds made in shaving. Discharges of blood from the brain are arrested by applying the blood of a goose or duck or the grease of those birds with oil of roses. The head of a snail cut off with a reed while feeding in the morning, at full moon more particularly, is attached to the head in a linen cloth with an old thrum for the cure of headache, or else a liniment is made of it and applied with white wax to the forehead. Dog's hairs are worn also attached to the forehead in a cloth. Chapter 37. Remedies for Affections of the Eyelids A crow's brains, taken with the food, they say, will make the eyelashes grow or else wool grease applied with warmed mirror by the aid of a fine probe. A similar result is promised by using the following preparation. Burnt flies and ashes of mouse dung are mixed in equal quantities to the amount of half a denarius in the whole. Two-sixths of a denarius of antimony are then added, and the mixture is applied with wool grease. For the same purpose also, the young ones of a mouse are beaten up in old wine to the consistency of the strengthening preparations known as aopa. When eyelashes are plucked out that are productive of inconvenience, they are prevented from growing again by using a hedgehog's gall, the liquid portion also of a spotted lizard's eggs, the ashes of a burnt salamander, the gall of a green lizard mixed with white wine and left to thicken to the consistency of honey in a copper vessel in the sun. The ashes of a swallow's young mixed with the milky juice of tithimulus, or else the slime of snails. Chapter 38. Remedies for Diseases of the Eyes According to what the magicians say, Glaucoma may be cured by using the brains of a puppy seven days old, the probe being inserted in the right side of the eye, if it is the right eye that is being operated on, and in the left side, if it is the left. The fresh gall, too, of the asio is used, a bird belonging to the owlet tribe, 
with feathers standing erect like ears. Apollonius of Pitani used to prefer dog's gall in combination with honey to that of the hyena for the cure of cataract and also of albugo. The heads and tails of mice reduced to ashes and applied to the eyes improve the sight, it is said, a result which is ensured with even greater certainty by using the ashes of a dormouse or wild mouse or else the brains and gall of an eagle. The ashes and fat of a field mouse beaten up with attic honey and antimony are remarkably useful for watery eyes. What this antimony is, we shall have occasion to say when speaking of metals. For the cure of cataract, the ashes of a weasel are used, as also the brains of a lizard or swallow. Weasels, boiled and pounded, and so applied to the forehead, allay defluxions of the eyes, either used alone or else with fine flour or with frankincense. Employed in a similar manner, they are very good for sunstroke, or in other words, for injuries inflicted by the sun. It is a remarkably good plan too to burn these animals alive and to use their ashes with Cretan honey as a liniment for films upon the eyes. The cast-off slough of the asp with the fat of that reptile forms an excellent ointment for improving the sight in beasts of burden. To burn a viper alive in a new earthen vessel with one cyathus of fennel juice and a single grain of frankincense and then to anoint the eyes with the mixture is remarkably good for cataract and films upon the eyes, the preparation being generally known as echion. An eye salve, too, is prepared by leaving a viper to putrefy in an earthen pot and bruising the maggots that breed in it with saffron. A viper, too, is burnt in a vessel with salt, and the preparation is applied to the tip of the tongue to improve the eyesight and to act generally as a corrective of the stomach and other parts of the body. This salt is given also to sheep to preserve them in health and is used as an ingredient in antidotes to the venom of serpents. Some persons again use vipers as an article of food. When this is done, it is recommended the moment they are killed to put some salt in the mouth and let it melt there, after which the body must be cut away to the length of four fingers at each extremity and the intestines being first removed the remainder boiled in a mixture of water, oil, salt and dill. When thus prepared, they are either eaten at once or else kneaded in a loaf and taken from time to time as wanted. In addition to the above-mentioned properties, viper broth cleanses all parts of the body of lice and removes itching sensations as well upon the surface of the skin. The ashes also of a viper's head used by themselves, are evidently productive of considerable effects. They are employed very advantageously in the form of a liniment for the eyes, and so too is viper's fat. I would not make so bold as to advise what is strongly recommended by some, the use namely of viper's gall, for that, as already stated on a more appropriate occasion, is nothing else but the venom of the serpent. The fat of snakes, mixed with verdigris, heals ruptures of the cuticle of the eyes, and the skin or slough that is cast off in spring, employed as a friction for the eyes, improves the sight. The gall of the boa is highly vaunted for the cure of albugo, cataract, and films upon the eyes, and the fat is thought to improve the sight. The gall of the eagle, which tests its young, as already stated, by making them look upon the sun, forms with attic honey an eye salve which is very good for the cure of webs, films and cataracts of the eye. A vulture's gall too, mixed with leek juice and a little honey, is possessed of similar properties, and the gall of a cock dissolved in water is employed for the cure of argama and albugo. The gall too of a white cock in particular 
is recommended for cataract. For short-sighted persons, the dung of poultry is recommended as a liniment, care being taken to use that of a reddish colour only. A hen's gall too is highly spoken of, and the fat in particular, for the cure of pustules upon the pupils, a purpose for which hens are expressly fattened. This last substance is marvellously useful for ruptures of the coats of the eyes, incorporated with the stones known as schistus and hematites. Hens dung too, but only the white part of it, is kept with old oil in boxes made of horn for the cure of white specks upon the pupil of the eye. When mentioning this subject, it is worthy of remark that peacocks swallow their dung, it is said, as though they envied man the various uses of it. A hawk, boiled in oil of roses, is considered extremely efficacious as a liniment for all affections of the eyes, and so are the ashes of its dung, mixed with attic honey. A kite's liver, too, is highly esteemed, and pigeon's dung, diluted with vinegar, is used as an application for fistulas of the eye, as also for albugo, and marks upon that organ. Goose gall and duck's blood are very useful for contusions of the eyes, care being taken immediately after the application to anoint them with a mixture of wool grease and honey. In similar cases, too, gall of partridges is used with an equal quantity of honey. But where it is only wanted to improve the sight, the gall is used alone. It is generally thought, too, upon the authority of Hippocrates, that the gall to be used for these purposes should be kept in a silver box. Partridges' eggs, boiled in a copper vessel with honey, are curative of ulcers of the eyes and of glaucoma. For the treatment of bloodshot eyes, the blood of pigeons, ring doves, turtle doves and partridges is remarkably useful, but that of the male pigeon is generally looked upon as the most efficacious. For this purpose, a vein is opened beneath the wing, it being warmer than the rest of the blood and consequently more beneficial. After it is applied, a compress boiled in honey should be laid upon it and some greasy wool boiled in oil and wine. Nyctalopy, too, is cured by using the blood of these birds, or the liver of a sheep, the most efficacious being that of a tawny sheep, as already stated by us when speaking of goats. A decoction, too, of the liver is recommended as a wash for the eyes, and for pains and swellings in those organs, the marrow used as a liniment. The eyes of a horned owl, it is strongly asserted, reduced to ashes and mixed in an eye salve, will improve the sight. Albugo is made to disappear by using the dung of turtle doves, snails burnt to ashes, and the dung of the senchus, a kind of hawk, according to the Greeks. All the substances above mentioned, used in combination with honey, are curative of argama. Honey, too, in which the bees have died, is remarkably good for the eyes. A person who has eaten the young of the stork will never suffer from ophthalmia for many years to come, it is said, and the same when a person carries about him the head of a dragon. It is stated, too, that the fat of this last-named animal, applied with honey and old oil, will disperse incipient films of the eyes. The young of the swallow are blinded at full moon, and the moment their sight is restored, their heads are burnt and the ashes are employed with honey to improve the sight and for the cure of pains, ophthalmia and contusions of the eyes. Lizards also are employed in numerous ways as a remedy for diseases of the eyes. Some persons enclose a green lizard in a new earthen vessel together with nine of the small stones known as cynidia which are usually attached to the body for tumours in the groin. Upon each of these stones, they make nine marks and remove one from the vessel daily, taking care when the ninth day has come to let the lizard go, the stones being kept as a remedy for affections of the eyes. Others again blind a green lizard 
and after putting some earth beneath it, enclose it in a glass vessel with some small rings of solid iron or gold. When they find, by looking through the glass, that the lizard has recovered its sight, they set it at liberty and keep the rings as a preservative against ophthalmia. Others employ the ashes of a lizard's head as a substitute for antimony for the treatment of eruptions of the eyes. Some recommend the ashes of the green lizard with a long neck that is usually found in sandy soils as an application for incipient defluxions of the eyes and for glaucoma. They say too that if the eyes of a weasel are extracted with a pointed instrument, its sight will return, the same use being made of it as of the lizards and rings above mentioned. The right eye of a serpent, worn as an amulet, is very good, it is said, for defluxions of the eyes, due care being taken to set the serpent at liberty after extracting the eye. For continuous watering of the eyes, the ashes of a spotted lizard's head, applied with antimony, are remarkably efficacious. The cobweb of the common fly spider, that which lines its hole more particularly, applied to the forehead, across the temples, in a compress of some kind or other, is said to be marvellously useful for the cure of defluxions of the eyes. The web must be taken, however, and applied by the hands of a boy who has not arrived at the years of puberty. The boy, too, must not show himself to the patient for three days, and during those three days neither of them must touch the ground with his feet uncovered. The white spider, with very elongated, thin legs, beaten up in old oil, forms an ointment which is used for the cure of albugo. The spider, too, whose web of remarkable thickness is generally found adhering to the rafters of houses, applied in a piece of cloth, is said to be curative of defluxions of the eyes. The green scarabaeus, has the property of rendering the sight more piercing of those who gaze upon it. Hence it is that the engravers of precious stones use these insects to steady their sight. Chapter 39. Remedies for Pains and Diseases of the Ears A sheep's gall mixed with honey is a good detergent of the ears. Pains in those organs are allayed by injecting a bitch's milk and hardness of hearing is removed by using dog's fat with wormwood and old oil, or else goose grease. Some persons add juice of onions and of garlic in equal proportions. The eggs, too, of ants are used by themselves for this purpose, these insects being possessed, in fact, of certain medicinal properties, and bears, it is well known, curing themselves when sick by eating them as food. Goose grease, and indeed that of all birds, is prepared by removing all the veins and leaving the fat in a new shallow earthen vessel, well covered, to melt in the sun, some boiling water being placed beneath it, which done, it is passed through linen strainers, and it is then put by in a cool spot in a new earthen vessel for keeping. With the addition of honey, it is less liable to turn rancid. Ashes of burnt mice injected with honey or boiled with oil of roses allay pains in the ears. In cases where an insect has got into the ears, a most excellent remedy is found in an injection of mouse gall diluted with vinegar. Where too water has made its way into the passages of the ear, goose grease is used in combination with juice of onions. Some persons skin a dormouse, and after removing the intestines, boil the body in a new vessel with honey. Medical men, however, prefer boiling it down to one-third with nard, and recommend it to be kept in that state, and to be warmed when wanted, and injected with a syringe. It is a well-known fact that this preparation is an effectual remedy for the most desperate maladies of the ears. The same, too, with an injection of earthworms boiled with goose grease. The redworms also that are found upon trees, beaten up with oil, are a most excellent remedy for ulcerations and ruptures of the ears. 
Lizards, which have been suspended for some time and dried, with salt in the mouth, are curative of contusions of the ears, and of injuries inflicted by blows. The most efficacious for this purpose are those which have iron-coloured spots upon the skin, and are streaked with lines along the tail. Millipedes, known also as centipedes or multipedes, are insects belonging to the earthworm genus, hairy with numerous feet, forming curves as they crawl, and contracting themselves when touched. The Greeks give to this insect the name of oniscus, others again that of tilos. Boiled with leek juice in a pomegranate rind, it is highly efficacious, they say, for pains in the ears. Oil of roses being added to the preparation, and the mixture injected into the ear opposite to the one affected. As for that kind which does not describe a curve when moving, the Greeks give it the name of seps, while others again call it scolopendra. It is smaller than the former one and is injurious. The snails which are commonly used as food are applied to the ears with myrrh or powdered frankincense, and those with a small broad shell are employed with honey as a liniment for fractured ears. Old sloughs of serpents, burnt in a heated potsherd and mixed with oil of roses, are used as an injection for the ears, which is considered highly efficacious for all affections of those organs and for offensive odours arising therefrom in particular. In cases where there is suppuration of the ears, vinegar is used, and it is still better if goat's gall, ox gall, or that of the sea tortoise is added. This slough, however, is good for nothing when more than a year old. The same too when it has been drenched with rain, as some think. The thick pulp of a spider's body, mixed with oil of roses, is also used for the ears, or else the pulp applied by itself with saffron or in wool. A cricket, too, is dug up with some of its earth and applied. Nigidius attributes great virtues to this insect, and the magician still greater, and all because it walks backwards, pierces the earth, and chirrups by night. The mode of catching it is by throwing an ant, made fast with a hair, into its hole, the dust being first blown away to prevent it from concealing itself. The moment it seizes the ant, it is drawn out. The dried craw of poultry, a part that is generally thrown away, is beaten up in wine and injected warm for suppurations of the ears. The same too with the grease of poultry. On pulling off the head of a black beetle, it yields a sort of greasy substance, which, beaten up with rose oil, is marvellously good, they say, for affections of the ears. Care must be taken, however, to remove the wool very soon, or else this substance will be speedily transformed into an animal in the shape of a small grub. Some writers assert that two or three of these insects, boiled in oil, are extremely efficacious for the ears, and that they are good, beaten up and applied in linen for contusions of those organs. This insect also is one of those that are of a disgusting character, but I am obliged by the admiration which I feel for the operations of nature and for the careful researches of the ancients to enter somewhat more at large upon it on the present occasion. Their writers have described several varieties of it. The soft beetle, for instance, which boiled in oil, has been found by experience to be a very useful liniment for warts. Another kind, to which they have given the name of mylicon, is generally found in the vicinity of mills. Deprived of the head, it has been found to be curative of leprosy. At least Musa and Picton have cited instances to that effect. There is a third kind again, odious for its abominable smell, and tapering at the posterior extremities. Used in combination with Pisellion, it is curative, they say, of ulcers of a desperate nature, and if kept applied for one and twenty days, for scrofulous sores and inflamed tumours. 
the legs and wings being first removed, it is employed for the cure of bruises, contusions, cancerous sores, itch scabs, and boils. Remedies, all of them, quite disgusting even to hear of. And yet, by Hercules, Diodorus tells us that he has administered this remedy internally with resin and honey for jaundice and hardness of breathing. Such unlimited power has the medical art to prescribe as a remedy whatever it thinks fit. Physicians who keep more within bounds recommend the ashes of these insects to be kept for these various purposes in a box made of horn, or else that they should be bruised and injected in a lavement for hardness of breathing and catars. At all events, that applied externally the extract foreign substances adhering to the flesh is a fact well known. Honey too, in which the bees have died, is remarkably useful for affections of the ears. Pigeon's dung, applied by itself or with barley meal or oatmeal, reduces impostumes of the parotid glands, a result which is equally obtained by injecting into the ear an owlet's brains or liver mixed with oil or by applying the mixture to the parotid glands, also by applying millipedes with one-third part of resin, by using crickets in the form of a liniment or by wearing crickets attached to the body as an amulet. The other kinds of maladies, and the several remedies for them, derived from the same animals or from others of the same class, we shall describe in the succeeding book. Summary Remedies, Narratives and Observations, 621 Roman authors quoted M. Varro, L. Piso, Flaccus Verius, Antius, Nigidius, Cassius Hemina, Cicero, Plautus, Celsus, Sextius Niger, who wrote in Greek, Cecilius, the physician, Metellus Scipio, the poet Ovid, Licinius Masser. Foreign authors quoted Homer, Aristotle, Orpheus, Palaephatus, Democritus, Anaxilaus. Medical authors quoted Botrus, Apollodorus, Archidemus, Aristogenes, Xenocrates, Democrates, Diodorus, Chrysippus the philosopher, Horus, Nicander, Apollonius of Pitani. End of section 17. Section 18 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 18, Book 30, Chapters 1 to 12. Book 30, Remedies Derived from Living Creatures. Chapter 1, The Origin of the Magic Art. In former parts of this work, I have had occasion more than once, when the subject demanded it, to refute the impostures of the magic art and it is now my intention to continue still further my exposure thereof. Indeed, there are few subjects on which more might be profitably said, which only that, being as it is, the most deceptive of all known arts, it has exercised the greatest influence in every country and in nearly every age. And no one can be surprised at the extent of its influence and authority when he reflects that by its own energies it has embraced and thoroughly amalgamated with itself the three other sciences which hold the greatest sway upon the mind of man. That it first originated in medicine, no one entertains a doubt, 
or that, under the plausible guise of promoting health, it insinuated itself among mankind as a higher and more holy branch of the medical art. Then, in the next place, to promises the most seductive and the most flattering, it has added all the resources of religion, a subject upon which, at the present day, man is still entirely in the dark. Last of all, to complete its universal sway, it has incorporated with itself the astrological art, there being no man who is not desirous to know his future destiny, or who is not ready to believe that this knowledge may with the greatest certainty be obtained by observing the face of the heavens. The senses of men being thus enthralled by a threefold bond, the art of magic, has attained an influence so mighty that at the present day even it holds sway throughout a great part of the world and rules the kings of kings in the east. Chapter 2. When and where the art of magic originated, by what persons it was first practised. There is no doubt that this art originated in Persia, under Zoroaster, this being a point upon which authors are generally agreed, but whether there was only one Zoroaster, or whether in later times there was a second person of that name, is a matter which still remains undecided. Eudoxus, who has endeavoured to show that of all branches of philosophy, the magic art is the most illustrious and the most beneficial, informs us that this Zoroaster existed 6,000 years before the death of Plato an assertion in which he is supported by Aristotle. Hermippus, again, an author who has written with the greatest exactness on all particulars connected with this art, and has commented upon the two millions of verses left by Zoroaster, besides completing indexes to his several works, has left a statement that Agonases was the name of the master from whom Zoroaster derived his doctrines and that he lived 5,000 years before the time of the Trojan War. The first thing, however, that must strike us with surprise is the fact that this art and the traditions connected with it should have survived for so many ages, all written commentaries thereon having perished in the meanwhile, and this too when there was no continuous succession of adepts, no professors of note, to ensure their transmission. For how few there are, in fact, who know anything, even by hearsay, about the only professors of this art, whose names have come down to us, Apusaurus and Zeratus of Medea, Marmarus and Arabantificus of Babylonia, and Tarmoendus of Assyria, men who have left not the slightest memorials of their existence. But the most surprising thing of all is that Homer should be totally silent upon this art in his account of the Trojan War while in his story of the wanderings of Ulysses, so much of the work should be taken up with it that we may justly conclude that the poem is based upon nothing else. If, indeed, we are willing to grant that his accounts of Proteus and of the songs of the Sirens are to be understood in this sense, and that the stories of Circe and of the summoning up of the shades below bear reference solely to the practices of sorcerers. And then, too, to come to more recent times, no one has told us how the art of sorcery reached Telmessus, a city devoted to all the services of religion, or at what period it came over and reached the matrons of Thessaly, whose name has long passed, in our part of the world, as the appellation of those who practice an art originally introduced among themselves even from foreign lands. For in the days of the Trojan War, Thessaly was still contented with such remedies as she owed to the skill of Chiron, and her only lightnings were the lightnings hurled by Mars. Indeed, for my own part, I am surprised that the imputation of magical practices should have so strongly attached to the people once under the sway of Achilles, that Menander even, a man unrivaled for perception and literary knowledge, has entitled one of his comedies, The Thessalian Matron and has therein described the devices practised by the females of that country in bringing down the moon from the heavens. I should have been inclined to think that Orpheus had been the first to introduce into a country so near his own certain medical superstitions based upon the practice of medicine, were it not the fact that Thrace, his native land, was at that time totally a stranger to the magic art. The first person, so far as I can ascertain, who wrote upon magic, and whose works are still in existence, was Osthanes, who accompanied Xerxes, the Persian king, in his expedition against Greece. 
It was he who first disseminated, as it were, the germs of this monstrous art, and tainted therewith all parts of the world through which the Persians passed. Authors who have made diligent inquiries into this subject make mention of a second Zoroaster, a native of Proconesus, as living a little before the time of Osthanes, that it was this same Osthanes, more particularly, that inspired the Greeks, not with a fondness only, but a rage for the art of magic, is a fact beyond all doubt. Though at the same time, I would remark that in the most ancient times, and indeed almost invariably, it was in this branch of science that was sought the highest point of celebrity and of literary renown. At all events, Pythagoras, we find, Empedocles, Democritus and Plato crossed the seas in order to attain a knowledge thereof, submitting, to speak the truth, more to the evils of exile than to the mere inconveniences of travel. Returning home, it was upon the praises of this art that they expatiated, it was this that they held as one of their grandest mysteries. It was Democritus, too, who first drew attention to Apollobates of Coptos, to Dardanus and to Phoenix. The works of Dardanus he sought in the tomb of that personage, and his own were composed in accordance with the doctrines there found. That these doctrines should have been received by any portion of mankind and transmitted to us by the aid of memory is to me surprising beyond anything I can conceive. All the particulars there found are so utterly incredible so utterly revolting, that those even who admire Democritus in other respects are strong in their denial that these works were really written by him. Their denial, however, is in vain, for it was he, beyond all doubt, who had the greatest share in fascinating men's minds with these attractive chimeras. There is also a marvellous coincidence in the fact that the two arts, medicine, I mean, and magic, were developed simultaneously. Medicine by the writings of Hippocrates, and magic by the works of Democritus, about the period of the Peloponnesian War, which was waged in Greece in the year of the city of Rome, 300. There is another sect also of adepts in the magic art who derive their origin from Moses, Yanes, and Lotopeia, Jews by birth, but many thousand years posterior to Zoroaster, and as much more recent again is the branch of magic cultivated in Cyprus. In the time, too, of Alexander the Great, this profession received no small accession to its credit from the influence of a second Osthanes, who had the honour of accompanying that prince in his expeditions, and who evidently, beyond all doubt, travelled over every part of the world. Chapter 3. Whether magic was ever practised in Italy, at what period the Senate first forbade human sacrifices. It is clear that there are early traces still existing of the introduction of magic into Italy. In our laws of the Twelve Tables, for instance, besides other convincing proofs, which I have already noticed in a preceding book. At last, in the year of the city 657, Cnaeus Cornelius Lentulus and Publius Licinius Crassus being consuls, a decree forbidding human sacrifices was passed by the Senate, from which period the celebration of these horrid rites ceased in public, and for some time altogether. Chapter 4. The Druids of the Gallic Provinces The Gallic provinces, too, were pervaded by the magic art, and that even down to a period within memory. For it was the Emperor Tiberius that put down their Druids, and all that tribe of wizards and physicians. But why make further mention of these prohibitions, with reference to an art which has now crossed the very ocean even, and has penetrated to the void recesses of nature? At the present day, struck with fascination, Britannia still cultivates this art, and that, with ceremonials so august that she might almost seem to have been the first to communicate them to the people of Persia. To such a degree are nations throughout the whole world, totally different as they are, and quite unknown to one another, in accord upon this one point. Such being the fact, then, 
we cannot too highly appreciate the obligation that is due to the Roman people for having put an end to those monstrous rites in accordance with which to murder a man was to do an act of the greatest devoutness and to eat his flesh was to secure the highest blessings of health. Chapter 5. The Various Branches of Magic According to what Ostanes tells us, there are numerous sorts of magic. It is practiced with water, for instance, with balls, by the aid of the air, of the stars, of lamps, basins, hatchets, and numerous other appliances. Means by which it engages to grant a foreknowledge of things to come, as well as converse with ghosts and spirits of the dead. All these practices, however, have been proved by the Emperor Nero in our own day to be so many false and chimerical illusions. Entertaining as he did a passion for the magic art, unsurpassed even by his enthusiastic love for the music of the lyre and for the songs of tragedy, so strangely did his elevation to the highest point of human fortune act upon the deep-seated vices of his mind. It was his leading desire to command the gods of heaven, and no aspiration could he conceive more noble than this. Never did person lavish more favours upon any one of the arts, and for the attainment of this, his favourite object, nothing was wanting to him, neither riches, nor power, nor aptitude at learning, and what not besides, at the expense of a suffering world. It is a boundless and indubitable proof, I say, of the utter falsity of this art, that such a man as Nero abandoned it, and would to heaven that he had consulted the shades below, and any other spirits as well, in order to be certified in his suspicions, rather than commission the denizens of stews and brothels to make those inquisitions of his, with reference to the objects of his jealousy. For assuredly, there can be no superstition, however barbarous and ferocious the rites which it sanctions, that is not more tolerant than the imaginations which he conceived, and owing to which, by a series of blood-stained crimes, our abodes were peopled with ghosts. Chapter 6. The Subterfuges Practiced by the Magicians The magicians, too, have certain modes of evasion. As, for instance, that the gods will not obey or even appear to persons who have freckles upon the skin. Was this, perchance, the obstacle in Nero's way? As for his limbs, there was nothing deficient in them. And then, besides, he was at liberty to make choice of the days prescribed by the magic ritual. It was an easy thing for him to make choice of sheep, whose colour was no other than perfectly black. And as to sacrificing human beings, there was nothing in the world that gave him greater pleasure. The Magian Tiridates was at his court, having repaired thither in token of our triumph over Armenia. Accompanied by a train which cost dear to the provinces through which it passed. For the fact was that he was unwilling to travel by water. It being a maxim with the adepts in this art that it is improper to spit into the sea or to profane that element by any other of the evacuations that are inseparable from the infirmities of human nature. He brought with him, too, several other magi and went so far as to initiate the emperor in the repasts of the craft. And yet the prince, for all he had bestowed a kingdom upon the stranger, found himself unable to receive at his hands in return this art. We may rest, fully persuaded then, that magic is a thing detestable in itself. Frivolous and lying as it is, it still bears, however, some shadow of truth upon it. The reflected, in reality, by the practices of those who study the arts of secret poisoning, and not the pursuits of magic. Let any one picture to himself the lies of the magicians of former days, when he learns what has been stated by the grammarian Apion, a person whom I remember seeing myself when young. He tells us that the plant Sinocephalia, known in Egypt as Osiritis, is useful for divination and is a preservative against all the malpractices of magic, but that if a person takes it out of the ground entire, he will die upon the spot. He asserts also that he himself had raised the spirits of the dead in order to make enquiry of Homer, 
in reference to his native country and his parents. But he does not dare, he tells us, disclose the answer he received. Chapter 7 Opinions of the Magicians Relative to the Mole Five Remedies Derived from It Let the following stand as a remarkable proof of the frivolous nature of the magic art. Of all animals, it is the mole that the magicians admire most. A creature that has been stamped with condemnation by nature in so many ways. Doomed as it is to perpetual blindness. And adding to this darkness a life of gloom in the depths of the earth and a state more nearly resembling that of the dead and buried. There is no animal in the entrails of which they put such implicit faith. No animal, they think, better suited for the rites of religion. So much so, indeed, that if a person swallows the heart of a mole, fresh from the body and still palpitating, he will receive the gift of divination, they assure us, and a foreknowledge of future events. Toothache, they assert, may be cured by taking the tooth of a live mole and attaching it to the body. As to other statements of theirs relative to this animal, we shall draw attention to them on the fitting occasions, and shall only add here that one of the most probable of all their assertions is that the mole neutralises the bite of the shrew mouse, seeing that, as already stated, the very earth even that is found in the rut of a cartwheel act as a remedy in such a case. Chapter 8. The Other Remedies Derived from Living Creatures, Classified According to the Respective Diseases. Remedies for Toothache. But to proceed with the remedies for toothache, the magicians tell us that it may be cured by using the ashes of the head of a dog that has died in a state of madness. The head, however, must be burnt without the flesh and the ashes injected with oil of cypress into the ear on the side affected. For the same purpose also, the left eye tooth of a dog is used, the gum of the affected tooth being lanced with it. One of the vertebrae, also of a dragon, or of an anhydrous, which is a male white serpent. The eye tooth too, of this last, is used for scarifying the gums. And when the pain affects the teeth of the upper jaw, they attach to the patient two of the upper teeth of the serpent, and similarly, two of the lower ones for toothache in the lower jaw. Persons who go in pursuit of the crocodile anoint themselves with the fat of this animal. The gums are also scarified with the frontal bones of a lizard, taken from it at full moon and not allowed to touch the ground, or else the mouth is rinsed with a decoction of dog's teeth in wine, boiled down to one half. Ashes of dog's teeth, mixed with honey, are useful for difficult dentition in children, and a dentifrice is similarly prepared from them. Hollow teeth are plugged with ashes of burnt mouse dung, or with a lizard's liver, dried. To eat a snake's heart, or to wear it, attached to the body, is considered highly efficacious. There are some among the magicians who recommend a mouse to be eaten twice a month as a preventative of toothache. Earthworms, boiled in oil and injected into the ear on the side affected, afford considerable relief. Ashes, too, of burnt earthworms introduced into carious teeth make them come out easily, and used as a friction, they allay pains in such of the teeth as are sound. The proper way of burning them is in an earthen pochard. They are useful too, boiled with root of the mulberry tree in squill vinegar, and employed as a colutory for the teeth. The small worm that is found in the plant known as Venus bath is remarkably useful, introduced into a hollow tooth, and as to the cabbage caterpillar, it will make hollow teeth come out by the mere contact only. The bugs that are found upon mallows are injected into the ears, beaten up with oil of roses. The small grits of sand that are found in the horns of snails, introduced into hollow teeth, remove the pain instantaneously. 
ashes of empty snail shells mixed with myrrh are good for the gums. The ashes also of a serpent burnt with salt in an earthen pot and injected with oil of roses into the ear opposite to the side affected, or else the slough of a snake warmed with oil and torch pine resin and injected into either ear. Some persons add frankincense and oil of roses, a preparation which, of itself, introduced into hollow teeth, makes them come out without pain. It is all a fiction, in my opinion, to say that white snakes cast this slough about the rising of the dog star, for such a thing has never been seen in Italy, and it is still more improbable that sloughing should take place at so late a period in the warmer climates. We find it stated also that this slough, even when it has been kept for some time, mixed with wax, will extract a tooth very expeditiously, if applied there too. A snake's tooth also, attached to the body as an amulet, allays toothache. Some persons think that it is a good remedy to catch a spider with the left hand, to beat it up with oil of roses, and then to inject it into the ear on the side affected. The small bones of poultry, preserved in a hole in a wall, the medullary channel being left intact, will immediately cure toothache, they say, if the tooth is touched or the gum scarified therewith, care being taken to throw away the bone the moment the operation is performed. A similar result is obtained by using raven's dung, wrapped in wool and attached to the body, or else sparrow's dung, warmed with oil and injected into the ear on the side affected. This last remedy, however, is productive of an intolerable itching, for which reason it is considered a better plan to rub the part with the ashes of young sparrows burnt upon twigs, mixed with vinegar for the purpose. Chapter 9 Remedies for Offensive Odours and Sores of the Mouth To impart sweetness to the breath, it is recommended to rub the teeth with ashes of burnt mouse dung and honey. Some persons are in the habit of mixing fennel root. To pick the teeth with a vulture's feather is productive of a sour breath, but to use a porcupine's quill for that purpose greatly strengthens the teeth. Ulcers of the tongue and lips are cured by taking a decoction of swallows boiled in honeyed wine, and chapped lips are healed by using goose grease or poultry grease, wool grease mixed with nut galls, white spider's webs, or the fine cobwebs that are found adhering to the beams of roofs. If the inside of the mouth has been scalded with any hot substance, bitch's milk will afford an immediate cure. Chapter 10. Remedies for Spots Upon the Face Wool grease, mixed with Corsican honey, which by the way is considered the most acrid honey of all, removes spots upon the face. Applied with oil of roses in wool, it causes scurf upon the face to disappear. Some persons add butter to it. In cases of morphew, the spots are first pricked with a needle and then rubbed with dog's gall. The livid spots and bruises on the face, the lights of a ram or sheep, are cut fine and applied warm, or else pigeon's dung is used. Goose grease or poultry grease is a good preservative of the skin of the face. For lichens, a liniment is used, made of mouse dung in vinegar, or of the ashes of a hedgehog mixed with oil. But when these remedies are employed, it is recommended first to ferment the face with nitre dissolved in vinegar. Maladies of the face are also removed by employing the ashes of the small broad snail that is so commonly found mixed with honey. Indeed, the ashes of all snails are of an inspissative nature and are possessed of certain calorific and detersive properties. Hence it is that they form an ingredient in caustic applications and are used in the form of a liniment for itch scabs, leprous sores and freckles on the face. I find it stated that a certain kind of ant, known by the name of Herculania, is beaten up with the addition of a little salt and used for the cure of these diseases. The Buprestis is an insect but rarely found in Italy, and very similar to a scarabaeus, with long legs. Concealed among the grass, it is very liable to be swallowed unobserved, by oxen in particular, and the moment it comes in contact with the gall 
it causes such a degree of inflammation that the animal bursts asunder, a circumstance to which the insect owes its name. Applied topically with he goat suet, it removes lichens on the face owing to its corrosive properties, as previously stated. A vulture's blood, beaten up with cedar resin and root of white chameleon, a plant which we have already mentioned, and covered with a cabbage leaf, when applied, is good for the cure of leprosy. The same too with the legs of locusts, beaten up with he goat suet. Pimples are treated with poultry grease, beaten up and kneaded with onions. One very useful substance for the face is honey, in which the bees have died. But a sovereign detergent for that part is swan's grease, which has also the property of effacing wrinkles. Brand marks are removed by using pigeon's dung, diluted in vinegar. Chapter 11 Remedies for Affections of the Throat I find it stated that catars oppressive to the head may be cured by the patient kissing a mule's nostrils. Affections of the ovula and pains in the fauces are alleviated by using the dung of lambs before they have begun to graze, dried in the shade. Diseases of the ovula are cured with the juices of a snail, pierced with a needle. The snail, however, must be then hung up in the smoke. The same maladies are treated also with ashes of burnt swallows, mixed with honey, a preparation which is equally good for affections of the tonsillary glands. Sheep's milk, used as a gargle, alleviates diseases of the fauces and tonsillary glands. Millipedes, bruised with pigeon's dung, are taken as a gargle, with raisin wine, and they are applied externally with dried figs and nitre for the purpose of soothing roughness of the fauces and catars. For such cases, too, snails should be boiled unwashed, the earth only being removed, and then pounded and administered to the patient in raisin wine. Some persons are of opinion that for these purposes, the snails of Astapalaya are the most efficacious, and they give the preference to the detersive preparation made from them. The parts affected are sometimes rubbed with a cricket, and affections of the tonsillary glands are alleviated by being rubbed with the hands of a person who has bruised a cricket. Chapter 12. Remedies for Quincy and Scrofula For Quincy, we have very expeditious remedies in goose gall, mixed with elaterium and honey, an owlet's brains, or the ashes of a burnt swallow taken in warm water, which last remedy we owe to the poet Ovid. But of all the remedies spoken of as furnished by the swallow, one of the most efficacious is that derived from the young of the wild swallow, a bird which may be easily recognised by the peculiar conformation of its nest. By far the most effectual, however, of them all, are the young of the bank swallow, that being the name given to the kind which builds its nest in holes on the banks of rivers. Many persons recommend the young of any kind of swallow as a food, assuring us that the person who takes it need be in no apprehension of quincy for the whole of the ensuing year. The young of this bird are sometimes stifled and then burnt in a vessel with the blood, the ashes being administered to the patient with bread or in the drink. Some, however, mix with them the ashes of a burnt weasel in equal proportion. The same remedies are recommended also for scrofula, and they are administered for epilepsy once a day in drink. Swallows preserved in salt are taken for quincy in doses of one drachma in drink. The nest, too, of the bird, taken internally, is said to be a cure for the same disease. Millipedes, it is thought, used in the form of a liniment, are peculiarly efficacious for quincy. Some persons also administer eleven of them bruised in one semi-sexterius of hydromel through a reed they being of no use whatever if once touched by the teeth. Other remedies mentioned are the broth of a mouse boiled with vervain, a thong of dogskin passed three times round the back, and pigeon's dung mixed with wine and oil, for the cure of rigidity of the muscles of the neck, and of epistotony, a twig of vitex taken from a kite's nest is attached to the body as an amulet. For ulcerated scrofula, a weasel's blood is employed, or the animal itself boiled in wine, but not in cases where the tumours have been opened with the knife, 
It is said too that a weasel eaten with the food is productive of a similar effect. Sometimes also it is burnt upon twigs and the ashes are applied with axle grease. In some instances, a green lizard is attached to the body of the patient, a fresh one being substituted at the end of 30 days. Some persons preserve the heart of this animal in a small silver vessel as a cure for scrofula in females. Old snails, those found adhering to shrubs more particularly, are pounded with the shells on and applied as a liniment. Asps, too, are similarly employed, reduced to ashes and mixed with bull suet. Snakes' fat also diluted with oil, and the ashes of a burnt snake applied with oil or wax. It is a good plan also, in cases of scrofula, to eat the middle of a snake, the extremities being first removed, or to drink the ashes of the reptile, similarly prepared, and burnt in a new earthen vessel. They will be found much more efficacious, however, when the snake has been killed between the ruts made by wheels. It is recommended also to dig up a cricket with the earth about its hole and to apply it in the form of a liniment, to use pigeon's dung either by itself or with barley meal or oatmeal and vinegar, or else to apply the ashes of a burnt mole mixed with honey. Some persons apply the liver of this last animal, crumbled in the hands, due care being taken not to wash it off for three days. It is said too that a mole's right foot is a remedy for scrofula. Others again cut off the head of a mole, and after kneading it with earth, thrown up by those animals, divide it into tablets, and keep it in a pewter box for the treatment of all kinds of tumours, diseases of the neck, and the affections known as apostemes. In all such cases, the use of swine's flesh is forbidden to the patient. Taurus is the name usually given to an earth beetle, very similar to a tick in appearance, and which it derives from the diminutive horns with which it is furnished. Some persons call it the earth louse. From the earth thrown up by these insects, a liniment is prepared for scrofula and similar diseases, and for gout, the application not being washed off till the end of three days. This last remedy is effectual for a whole year and all those other properties are attributed to it which we have mentioned when speaking of crickets. There are some, again, who make a similar use of the earth thrown up by ants, while others attach to the patient as many earthworms as there are scrofulous tumours, the sores drying as the worms dry up. Some persons cut off the head and tail of a viper, as already mentioned, about the rising of the dog star, which done, they burn the middle and give a pinch of the ashes in three fingers for thrice seven days in drink. Such is the plan they use for the cure of scrofula. Others again pass round the scrofulous tumours, a linen thread, with which a viper has been suspended by the neck till dead. Millipedes are also used with one-fourth part of turpentine, a remedy which is equally recommended for the cure of all kinds of apostemes. End of section 18. Recording by Emma Jane Howe, Croxley Green, Hertfordshire, April 2021. Section 19 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 19. Book 30. Chapters 13 to 25. Chapter 13. Remedies for diseases of the shoulders. The ashes of a burnt weasel mixed with wax are a cure for pains in the shoulders. To prevent the armpits of young persons from becoming hairy, they should be well rubbed with ants' eggs. Slave dealers also, to impede the growth of the hair in young persons near puberty, employ the blood that flows from the testes of lambs when castrated. This blood, too, applied to the armpits, the hairs being first pulled out, is a preventive of the rank smell of those parts. 
Chapter 14. Remedies for Pains in the Viscera We give the one general name of precordia to the human viscera, for pains in any part of which a sucking whelp is applied, being pressed close to the part affected. The malady, it is said, will in such case pass into the animal, a fact which may be satisfactorily ascertained, for on disemboweling it, and sprinkling the entrails with wine, that part of the viscera will be found affected in which the patient himself was sensible of pain. To bury the animal in such a case is a point most religiously observed. The dogs, too, which we call melitii, applied to the stomach every now and then, allay pains in that region. The malady, it is supposed, passes into the animal's body, as it gradually loses its health, and it mostly dies. Affection of the lungs are cured by using mice, those of Africa more particularly, the animal being skinned and boiled in salt and oil, and then taken with the food. The same preparation is used also for the cure of purulent, or bloody expectorations. Chapter 15. Remedies for Pains in the Stomach one of the very best remedies for affections of the stomach is to use a snail diet. They must first be left to simmer in water for some time, without touching the contents of the shell, after which, without any other addition, they must be grilled upon hot coals and eaten with wine and garum, the snails of Africa being the best of all for the purpose. The efficacy of this remedy has been proved in numerous instances of late. Another point, too, to be observed, is to take an uneven number of them. Snails, however, have a juice, it should be remembered, which imparts to the breath an offensive smell. For patients troubled with spitting of blood, they are remarkably good, the shell being first removed and the contents bruised and administered in water. The most distinct kinds of all are those of Africa, those which come from Iol in particular, of Estipalia, and after them those of Etna, in Sicily, those, I mean, of moderate size, for the large ones are hard and destitute of juice. The Balearic snails, called Cevatice, from being found in caverns, are much esteemed, and so too are those from the islands of Caprea. Those of Greece, on the other hand, are never used for food, either old or fresh. River snails, and those with a white shell, have a strong, rank juice, and forest snails are by no means good for the stomach, having a laxative effect upon the bowels. The same, too, with all kinds of small snails. Sea snails, on the other hand, are more beneficial to the stomach but it is for pains in that region that they are found the most efficacious. The best plan, it is said, is to eat them alive, of whatever kind they may happen to be, with vinegar. In addition to these, there are the snails called acerate, with a broad shell and found in numerous localities. Of the uses to which they are put, we shall speak further on the appropriate occasions. The craw of poultry, dried and sprinkled in the drink, or else used fresh and grilled, has a soothing effect upon pectoral catars and coughs attended with phlegm. Snails bitten up raw and taken in three sayathai of warm water allay cough. A piece of dog's skin, wrapped around any one of the fingers, affords relief to patients suffering from catar. A broth made of boiled partridges is strengthening for the stomach. Chapter 16. Remedies for pains in the liver and for spitting of blood. For the cure of pains in the liver, a wild weasel is taken with the food, or the liver only of that animal. A ferret also, roasted like a sucking pig. In cases of asthma, millipedes are used, thrice seven of them being soaked in attic honey and taken internally by the aid of a reed. For all vessels, it should be remembered, turn black on coming in contact with them. Some persons grill one sexterius of these insects on a flat pan till they become white, and then mix them with honey. 
There are some authorities who call this insect a centipede and recommend it to be given in warm water. Snails are administered to persons subject to fainting fits, alienation of the senses and vertigo, for which purposes a snail is beaten up, shell and all, with three sayathai of raisin wine, and the mixture is administered warm with a drink for nine days at most. Others again give one snail the first day, two the second, three the third, two the fourth, and one the fifth, a mode of treatment also adopted for the cure of asthma and of abscesses. There is, according to some authorities, an insect resembling the locust in appearance, destitute of wings and known by the Greek name of Troxalis, it being without a name in Latin. A considerable number of writers, however, consider it identical with the insect known to us as gorillas. Twenty of these insects, they say, should be grilled and taken in honeyed wine by patients troubled with hardness of breathing or spitting of blood. Some persons pour pure grape juice or sea water upon unwashed snails and then boil and eat them for food, or else they bruise the snails, shells and all, and take them with this grape juice. A similar method is also adopted for the cure of cough. Honey, in which the bees have died, is particularly good for the cure of abscesses. For spitting of blood, a vulture's lungs are used, burned upon vine logs and mixed with half the quantity of pomegranate blossoms or with the same proportion of quince and lily blossom, the whole being taken morning and evening in wine if there is no fever. But where there are symptoms of fever, instead of wine, water is used in which quinces have been boiled. Chapter 17. Remedies for Affections of the Spleen According to the prescriptions given by the magicians, a fresh ship's milt is the best application for pains in the spleen, the person who applies it uttering these words, This I do for the cure of the spleen. This done, it is enjoined that the milt should be covered up with mortar in the wall of the patient's sleeping room and sealed with a ring, a charm being repeated thrice nine times. A dog's milt removed from the animal while still alive, taken with the food, is a cure for diseases of the spleen. Some again attach it fresh to that part of the patient's body. Others give the patient, without his knowing it, the milt to the puppy two days old, to eat in squill vinegar. The milt, too, of a hedgehog is similarly used. Ashes of burnt snails are employed in combination with linseed, nettle seed and honey, the treatment being persisted in till the patient is thoroughly cured. A green lizard has a remedial effect suspended alive in an earthen vessel at the entrance of the sleeping room of the patient, who, every time he enters or leaves it, must take care to touch it with his hand. The head, too, of a horned owl, reduced to ashes and incorporated with an unguent. Honey also, in which the bees have died. And spiders, the one known as the lycus in particular. Chapter 18. Remedies for pains in the side and in the loins. For pains in the side, the heart of a hoopoe is highly esteemed. Ashes, too, of burnt snails that have been boiled in a teason, snails being sometimes applied in the form of a liniment alone. Potions employed for this purpose have a sprinkling in them of the ashes of a mad dog's skull. For the cure of lumbago, the spotted lizard from beyond seas is used, the head and intestines being first removed, the body is boiled in wine with half a denarius of black poppy, and the decoction is taken in drink. Green lizards also are taken with the food, the feet and head being first removed, or else three snails are crushed, shells and all, and boiled with fifteen peppercorns in wine. The feet of an eagle are wrenched off in a contrary direction to the joint, and the right foot is attached to the right side, the left foot to the left, according as the pains are situate. The millipede, which we have spoken of as being called the oniscos, is a cure for these pains, taken in doses of one denarius 
in two sayathai of wine. The magicians recommend an earthworm to be put in a wooden dish, which has been split and mended with iron wire. Which done, some water must be taken up with a dish, the worm drenched with it and buried in the spot from which it was taken, and the water drank from the dish. They assert also that this is a marvellously excellent cure for sciatica. Chapter 19. Remedies for Dysentery Dysentery is cured by taking the broth of a leg of mutton, boiled with linseed in water, by eating old ewe milk cheese, or by taking mutton suet boiled in astringent wine. This last is good, too, for the iliac passion and for inveterate coughs. Dysentery is removed also by taking a spotted lizard from beyond seas, boiled down till the skin only is left, the head, feet, and intestines being first removed. A couple of snails also, and an egg, are beaten up, shells and all, in both cases, and made lukewarm in a new vessel, with some salt, three sayathai of water, and two sayathai of raisin wine, or date juice, the decoction being taken in drink. Ashes, too, of burnt snails are very serviceable, taken in wine with a modicum of resin. The snails without shells, which we have mentioned as being mostly found in Africa, are remarkably useful for dysentery, five of them being burnt with half a denarius of gum acacia and taken in doses of two spoonfuls in myrtle wine or any other kind of astringent wine with an equal quantity of warm water. Some persons employ all kinds of African snails indiscriminately in this manner, while others, again, make use of a similar number of African snails or broad-shelled snails as an injection in preference. In cases, too, where the flux is considerable, they add a piece of gum acacia about the size of a bean. For dysentery and tenesmus, the cast of slough of a snake is boiled in a pewter vessel with oil of roses. If prepared in any other kind of vessel, it is applied with an instrument made of pewter. Chicken broth is also used as a remedy for these affections, but the broth of an old cock, strongly salted, acts more powerfully as a purgative upon the bowels. A pullet's craw, grilled and administered with salt and oil, has a soothing effect upon celiac affections, but it is absolutely necessary that neither fowl nor patient should have eaten corn for some time before. Pigeon's dung also is grilled and taken in drink. The flesh of a ring dove, boiled in vinegar, is curative of dysentery and celiac affections and for the cure of the former, a thrush is recommended roasted with myrtle berries, a blackbird also, or honey boiled, in which the bees have died. Chapter 20. Remedies for the Iliac Passion and for Other Maladies of the Bowels One of the most dangerous of maladies is that known by the name of Ileos. It may be combated, they say, by tearing a bat asunder and taking the blood or by rubbing the abdomen with it. Diarrhea is arrested more particularly by taking snails prepared in manner already mentioned for cases of asthma. The ashes also of snails burned alive, administered in astringent wine. The liver of poultry grilled. The dried craw of poultry, a part that is usually thrown away, mixed with poppy juice. In some cases it is used fresh, grilled and taken in wine, partridge broth, the craw of partridges beaten up by itself in red wine, a wild ring dove boiled in oxycrate, a sheep's milt grilled and beaten up in wine, or else pigeon's dung applied with honey. The crop of an ossifrage, dried and taken in drink, is remarkably useful for patients whose digestion is impaired, Indeed, its good effects may be felt if they only hold it in the hand while eating. Hence it is that some persons wear it attached to the body as an amulet, a practice which must not be too long continued, it being apt to cause a wasting of the flesh. The blood, too, of a drake has an astringent effect. Flatulency is dispelled by eating snails and gripping pains in the bowels by taking a sheep's milk grilled with wine. A wild ring dove boiled in oxycrit. 
the fat of an otis in wine, or the ashes of an ibis burned without the feathers, administered in drink. Another prescription mentioned for gripping pains in the bowels is of a very marvellous nature. If a duck, they say, is applied to the abdomen, the malady will pass into the bird, and it will die. Grippings of the bowels are treated also with boiled honey in which the bees have died. Colic is most effectually cured by taking a roasted lark with the food. Some recommend, however, that it should be burnt to ashes in a new vessel, feathers and all, and then pounded and taken for four consecutive days in doses of three spoonfuls in water. Some say that the heart of this bird should be attached to the thigh, and, according to others, the heart should be swallowed fresh, quite warm, in fact. There is a family of consular dignity, known as the Aspronites, two brothers, members of which, were cured of colic, the one by eating a lark and wearing its heart in a golden bracelet, the other by performing a certain sacrifice in a chapel, built of raw bricks, in form of a furnace, and then blocking up the edifice the moment the sacrifice was concluded. The ossifrage has a single intestine only, which has the marvellous property of digesting all that the bird has swallowed. The extremity of this intestine, it is well known, worn as an amulet, is an excellent remedy for colic. There are certain concealed maladies, incident to the intestines, in relation to which there are some marvellous statements made. If to the stomach and chest, more particularly, blind puppies are applied, and suckled with milk from the patient's mouth, the virulence of the malady, it is said, will be transferred to them, and in the end they will die. On opening them too, the causes of the malady will be sure to be discovered. In all such cases, however, the puppies must be allowed to die, and must be buried in the earth. According to what the magicians say, if the abdomen is touched with the bat's blood, the person will be proof against colic for a whole year. When a patient, too, is attacked with the pains of colic, if he can bring himself to drink the water in which he has washed his feet, he will experience a cure. Chapter 21. Remedies for Urinary Calculi and Affections of the Bladder For the cure of urinary calculi, it is a good plan to rub the abdomen with mouse dung. The flesh of a hedgehog is agreeable eating, they say, if killed with a single blow upon the head, before it has had time to discharge its urine upon its body. Persons who eat this flesh, it is said, will never by any possibility suffer from strangury. The flesh of a hedgehog thus killed is a cure for urinary obstructions of the bladder, and the same, too, with fumigations made therewith. If, on the other hand, the animal has discharged its urine upon its body, those who eat the flesh will be sure to be attacked by strangury, it is said. As a lithontriptic, earthworms are recommended, taken in ordinary wine or raisin wine, or else boiled snails prepared the same way as for the cure of asthma. For the cure of urinary obstructions, snails are taken from the shells, pounded, and administered in one sayathus of wine, three the first day, two the second, and one the third. For the expulsion of calculi, the empty shells are reduced to ashes and taken in drink. The liver also of a water snake and the ashes of burnt scorpions are similarly employed, or are taken with bread or eaten with a locust. For the same purpose, the small grits that are found in the gizzard of poultry or in the crow of the ring dove are bitten up and sprinkled in the patient's drink. The crow, too, of poultry is taken, dried, or, if fresh, grilled. For urinary calculi and other obstructions of the bladder, dung of ring doves is taken with beans. Ashes also of wild ring doves' feathers mixed with vinegar and honey. The intestines of those birds reduced to ashes and administered in doses of three spoonfuls. A small clod from a swallow's nest dissolved in warm water. The dried crop of an ossifrage. The dung of a turtle dove boiled in honeyed wine. Or the broth of a boiled turtle dove. It is very beneficial also for urinary affections 
to eat thrushes with myrtle berries or grasshoppers grilled on a shallow pan or else to take the millipedes known as onisai in drink for pains in the bladder a decoction of lamb's feet is used chicken broth relaxes the bowels and mollifies acridities swallows dank too with honey employed as a suppository act as a purgative chapter twenty two remedies for diseases of the fundament and of the generative organs the most efficacious remedies for diseases of the rectum are wool grease to which some add pomphalix and oil of roses a dog's head reduced to ashes or a serpent's slough with vinegar in cases where there are chaps and fissures of those parts the ashes of the white portion of dog's dung are used mixed with oil of roses a prescription due they say to esculapius and remarkably efficacious also for the removal of warts ashes of burnt mouse dung swan's fat and cow suet are also used Procedence of the rectum is reduced by an application of the juices discharged by snails when punctured. For the cure of excoriation of those parts, ashes of burned wood mice are used with honey. The gall of a hedgehog with the bat's brains and bitch's milk, goose grease with the brains of the bird, alum and wool grease, or else pigeon's dung mixed with honey. A spider, the head and legs being first removed, is remarkably good as a friction for condylomata. To prevent the acridity of the humors from fretting the flesh, goose grease is applied with punic wax, white lead, and oil of roses. Swan's grease also, which is said to be a cure for piles. A very good thing, they say, for sciatica is to pound raw snails in a minion wine and to take them with pepper. To eat a green lizard, the feet, head and intestines being first removed, or to eat a spotted lizard with the addition of three oboli of black poppy. Ruptures and convulsions are treated with sheep's gall, diluted with woman's milk. The gravy, which escapes from a ram's lights roasted, is used for the cure of itching pimples and warts upon the generative organs. For other affections of those parts, the ashes of a ram's wool, unwashed even, are used, applied with water. The suet of a sheep's skull and the kidneys more particularly, mixed with ashes of pumice stone and salt. Greasy wool applied with cold water. Sheep's flesh burnt to ashes and applied with water. A mule's hoofs burnt to ashes. Or the powder of pounded horse teeth sprinkled upon the parts. In cases of decedence of either of the testes, an application of the slime discharged by snails is remedial, they say. For the treatment of sordid or running ulcers of those parts, the fresh ashes of a burnt dog's head are found highly useful. The small, broad kind of snail bitten up in vinegar, a snake's slough or the ashes of it applied in vinegar, honey in which the bees have died mixed with resin or the kind of snail without a shell that is found in Africa, as already mentioned, beaten up with powdered frankincense and white of eggs, the application being renewed at the end of thirty days. Some persons, however, substitute a bulb for the frankincense. For the cure of hydrocele, a spotted lizard, they say, is marvellously good, the head, feet and intestines being first removed, and the rest of the body roasted and taken frequently with the food. For incontinence of urine, dog's fat is used, mixed with a piece of split alum the size of a bean. Ashes also of African snails, burnt with the shells taken in drink. Or else the tongues of three geese roasted and eaten with the food, a remedy which we owe to Anaxileus. Mutton suet, mixed with parched salt, has an apparent effect upon inflammatory tumours, and mouse dung, mixed with powdered frankincenses and sandarac, acts upon them as a dispellent. The ashes also of a burnt lizard, or the lizard itself, split asunder and applied, or else bruised millipedes mixed with one-third part of turpentine. Some make use of earth of sinope for this purpose, mixed with a bruised snail. Ashes of empty snail shells burnt alone, mixed with wax, 
possess certain repercursive properties. The same too with pigeon's dung, employed by itself or applied with oatmeal or barley meal. Cantharides, mixed with lime, remove inflammatory tumors quite as effectually as the lancet. And small snails, applied topically with honey, have a soothing effect upon tumors in the groin. Chapter 23. Remedies for Gout and for Diseases of the Feet To prevent varicose veins, the legs of children are rubbed with the lizard's blood, but both the party who operates and the patient must be fasting at the time. Wool grease mixed with woman's milk and white lead has a soothing effect upon gout. The liquid dung also avoided by sheep, a sheep's lights, a ram's gall mixed with suet, mice split asunder and applied, a weasel's blood used as a liniment with plantago, the ashes of a weasel burnt alive mixed with vinegar and oil of roses, and applied with a feather, or used in combination with wax and oil of roses. A dog's gall, due care being taken not to touch it with the hand, and to apply it with a feather. Poultry dung, or else ashes of burnt earthworms applied with honey and removed at the end of a couple of days. Some, however, prefer using this last with water, while others, again, apply the worms themselves in the proportion of one acetabulum to three sayathi of honey, the feet of the patient being first anointed with oil of roses. The broad, flat kind of snail taken in drink is used for the removal of pains in the feet and joints two of them being pounded for the purpose and taken in wine. They are employed also in the form of a liniment mixed with the juice of the plant Helxini. Some, however, are content to beat up the snails with vinegar. Some say that salt, burnt in a new earthen vessel with a viper, and taken repeatedly, is curative of gout, and that it is an excellent plan to rub the feet with viper's fat. It is asserted, too, that similar results are produced by keeping a kite till it is dry and then powdering it and taking it in water, a pinch in three fingers at a time, by rubbing the feet with the blood of that bird mixed with nettles, or by bruising the first feathers of a ring dove with nettles. The dung of ring doves is used as a liniment for pains in the joints. The ashes also of a burnt weasel or of burnt snails mixed with amylum or gum tragacanth. A very excellent cure for contusions of the joints is a spider's web. But there are persons who give the preference to ashes of burnt cobwebs or of burnt pigeon's dung mixed with polenta and white wine. For sprains of the joints, a sovereign remedy is mutton suet mixed with the ashes of a woman's hair. A good application, too, for chillblains is mutton suet mixed with alum, or else ashes of a burnt dog's head or of burnt mouse dung. Ulcers, free from discharge, are brought to cicatrize by using the above-named substances in combination with wax. Ashes also of burnt dormice mixed with oil. Ashes of burnt wood mice mixed with honey. Ashes of burnt earthworms applied with old oil or else ashes of the snails without a shell that are so commonly found. All ulcers on the feet are cured by the application of ashes of snails burned alive, and for excoriations of the feet, ashes of burnt poultry dung are used, or ashes of burnt pigeon's dung mixed with oil. When the feet have been galled by the shoes, the ashes of an old shoe sole are used, or the lights of a lamb or ram, for gatherings beneath the nails, a horse's tooth powdered is a sovereign remedy. A light application of a green lizard's blood will cure the feet of man or beast when galled beneath. For the removal of corns upon the feet, the urine of a mule of either sex is applied, mixed with the mud which it has formed upon the ground. Sheep's tongue also, the liver of a green lizard or the blood of that animal applied in wool, earthworms mixed with oil, the head of a spotted lizard pounded with an equal quantity of vitex and mixed with oil, or pigeon's dung boiled with vinegar. For the cure of all kinds of warts, dog's urine is applied fresh with the mud which it has formed upon the ground, dog's dung also reduced to ashes and mixed with wax. Sheep's dung, 
the blood of mice applied fresh or the body of a mouse split asunder, the gall of a hedgehog, a lizard's head or blood or the ashes of that animal burnt entire, the cast of slough of a snake, or else poultry dung applied with oil and nitre. Cantharides also, bruised with Tominian grapes, act corrosively upon words, and when words have been thus removed, the remedies should be employed which we have pointed out for ulcerations on the skin. Chapter 24. Remedies for evils which are liable to affect the whole body. We will now turn our attention to those evils which are a cause of apprehension as affecting the whole body. According to what the magicians say, the gall of a male black dog is a counter-charm for the whole of a house, and it will be quite sufficient to make fumigations with it, or to use it as a purification, to ensure its preservation against all noxious drugs and preparations. They say the same, too, with reference to a dog's blood, if the walls are sprinkled with it, and the genitals of that animal if buried beneath the threshold. This will surprise persons the less who are aware how highly these same magicians extol that most abominable insect, the tick, and all because it is the only one that has no passage for the evacuations, its eating ending only in its death, and its living all the longer for fasting. In this latter state it has been known to live so long as seven days, they say, but when it gorges to satiety it will burst in a much shorter period. According to these authorities, a tick from a dog's left ear, worn as an amulet, will allay all kinds of pains. They presage too from it on matters of life and death, for if the patient, they say, gives an answer to a person who has a tick about him, and standing at the foot of the bed, asks how he is, it is an infallible sign that he will survive, while on the other hand, if he makes no answer, he will be sure to die. They add also that the dog from whose left ear the tick is taken must be entirely black. Nigidius has stated in his writings that dogs will avoid the presence all day of a person who has taken a tick from off a hog. The magicians likewise assure us that patients suffering from delirium will recover their reason on being sprinkled with a mole's blood, and that persons who are apt to be troubled by the gods of the night and by faunae will experience relief by rubbing themselves morning and evening with a tongue, eyes, gall, and intestines of a dragon, boiled in oil and cooled in the open air at night. Chapter 25. Remedies for Cold Shiverings A remedy for cold shiverings, according to Nicander, is a dead amphisbena, or its skin only attached to the body, in addition to which he informs us that if one of these reptiles is attached to a tree that is being felt, the persons hewing it will never feel cold and will fell it all the more easily. For so it is that this is the only one among all the serpents that faces the cold, making its appearance the first of all, and even before the cuckoo's note is heard. There is another marvellous fact also mentioned with reference to the cuckoo. If upon the spot where a person hears this bird for the first time, he traces round the space occupied by his right foot, and then digs up the earth, it will effectually prevent fleas from breeding wherever it is thrown. End of section 19section 20 of the natural history volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by samhita vasu the natural history volume 6 by pliny the elder translated by john bostick and henry thomas riley Section 20, Book 30, Chapters 26 to 41. Chapter 26, Remedies for Paralysis. For persons apprehensive of paralysis, the fat of dormice and of field mice, they say, is very useful boiled. 
And for patients threatened with physis, millipedes are good, taken in drink, in manner already mentioned for the cure of quinsy. The same, too, with a green lizard boiled down to one scythus in three sextri of wine and taken in doses of one spoonful daily until the patient is perfectly cured, the ashes also of burnt snails taken in wine. Chapter 27. Remedies for Epilepsy For the cure of epilepsy, wool grease is used with a modicum of mirror, a piece about the size of a hazelnut being dissolved and taken after the bath in two scythi of wine. A ram's testes also dried and pounded and taken in doses of half a denarius in water or in a semi sextarius of ass's milk, the patient being forbidden wine five days before and after using the remedy. Sheep's blood, too, is mightily praised, taken in drink. Sheep's gall also, and lamb's gall in particular, mixed with honey. The flesh of a sucking puppy taken with wine and mirror, the head and feet being first removed, and callosities from a mule's leg, taken in three scythi of oxymel, the ashes of a spotted lizard from beyond seas taken in vinegar, the thin coat of a spotted lizard, which it casts like a snake taken in drink, indeed some persons recommend the lizard itself, gutted with a reed and dried and taken in drink, while others, again, are for roasting it on a wooden spit and taking it with the food. It is worthwhile knowing how the winter slough of this lizard is obtained when it casts it off, before it has had the opportunity of devouring it. There being no creature, it is said, that resorts in its spite to more cunning devices for the deception of man, a circumstance owing to which the name of Stelio has been borrowed as a name of reproach. The place to which it retires in summer is carefully observed, being generally some spot beneath the projecting parts of doors or windows, or else in vaults or tombs. In the early days of spring, cages made of split reeds are placed before these spots. And the narrower the interstices, the more delighted is the animal with them, it being all the better enabled thereby to disengage itself of the coat which adheres to its body and impedes its freedom of action. When, however, it is once quitted it, the construction of the cage prevents its return. There is nothing whatever preferred to this lizard as a remedy for epilepsy. The brains of a weasel are also considered very good, dried and taken in drink. The liver, too, of the animal, or the testes, uterus, or paunch, dried and taken with coriander, in a manner already mentioned. The ashes, also, of a burnt weasel, or a wild weasel, eaten whole with the food, all these properties are equally attributed to the ferret. A green lizard is sometimes eaten, dressed with seasonings to stimulate the appetite, the feet and head being first removed. The ashes, too, of burnt snails are used as an ointment with linseed, nettle seed, and honey. The magicians think highly of a dragon's tail attached to the body, with a deer's sinews in the skin of a gazelle, as also the small grits found in the crops of young swallows tied to the left arm of the patient. For swallows, it is said, give small stones to their young the moment they are hatched. If at the commencement of the first paroxysm, an epileptic patient eats the first of a swallow's brood that has been hatched he will experience a perfect cure. But at a later period, the disease is treated by using swallow's blood with frankincense or by eating the heart of the bird quite fresh. Nay, even more than this, a small stone taken from a swallow's nest will relieve the patient the moment it is applied, they say, 
Worn too as an amulet, it will always act as a preservative against the malady. A kite's liver too, eaten by the patient, is highly vaunted. The slough also of a serpent, a vulture's liver beaten up with the blood of the bird, and taken thrice seven days in drink, or the heart of a young vulture worn attached to the body. And not only this, but the vulture itself is recommended as a food for the patient, and that too when it has been gutted with human flesh. Some recommend the breast of this bird to be taken in drink from a cup made of ceris wood, or testes of a dunghill cock to be taken in milk and water. The patient abstaining from wine the five preceding days and the testes being dried for the purpose. There have been authorities found to recommend one and twenty red flies, and those found dead too, taken in drink, the number being reduced where the patient is of a feeble habit. Chapter 28 Remedies for Jaundice Jaundice is combated by administering earwax to the patient, or else the filth that adheres to the udders of sheep, in doses of one denarius with a modicum of mirror, in two scythi of wine, the ashes also of a dog's head mixed with honeyed wine, a millipede in one semi-sextarius of wine, earthworms in hydromel with mirror, wine in which a hen's feet have been washed after being first cleaned with water. The hen must be one with yellow feet. The brains of a partridge or of an eagle in three scythi of wine. The ashes of a ring dove's feather or intestines in honeyed wine in doses of three spoonfuls or ashes of sparrows burnt upon twigs in doses of two spoonfuls in hydromel. There is a bird known as the icterus from its particular color. If the patient looks at it, he will be cured of jaundice, they say, and the bird will die. In my opinion, this is the same bird that is known in Latin by the name of galgulus. Chapter 29. Remedies for Phrenitis in cases of phrenitis, a sheep's lights attached warm round the patient's head would appear to be advantageous. But as to giving a man suffering from delirium a mouse's brains in water to drink, the ashes of a burnt weasel, or the dried flesh of even a hedgehog, who could possibly do it, supposing even the effects of the remedy were certain? I should be inclined, too, to rank the ashes of the eyes of a horned owl in the number of those monstrous prescriptions with which the adepts in the magic art abuse the credulity of mankind. It is in cases, too, of fever more particularly, that the acknowledged rules of medicine run counter to the prescriptions of these men, for they have classified the various modes of treating the disease in accordance with the twelve signs of the zodiac, and relatively to the revolutions of the sun and moon, a system which deserves to be utterly repudiated, as I shall prove by a few instances selected from many. They recommend, for example, that the sun is passing through Gemini, that the patient should be rubbed with ashes of the burnt combs, ears, and claws of cocks beaten up and mixed with oil. If, again, it is the moon that is passing through the sign, it is the spurs and wattles of cocks that must be similarly employed. When either of these luminaries are passing through Virgo, grains of barley must be used, and when through Sagittarius, a bat swing. When the moon is passing through Leo, it is leaves of tamarisk that must be employed, and of the cultivated tamarisk they add, if, again, the sign is Aquarius, the patient must use an application of boxwood charcoal pounded. Of the remedies, however, that we find recommended by them, I shall be careful to insert those only the efficacy of which has been admitted, or at least is probable in any degree. 
such, for instance, as the use of powerful odors as an excitant for the patient suffering from lethargy, among which perhaps may be reckoned the dried testes of a weasel or the liver of that animal burnt. They consider it a good plan, too, to attach a sheep's lights made warm round the head of the patient. Chapter 30. Remedies for Fevers in the treatment of quartan fevers, clinical medicine is, so to say, pretty nearly powerless, for which reason we shall insert a considerable number of remedies recommended by professors of the magic art, and, first of all, those prescribed to be worn as amulets. The dust, for instance, in which the hawk has bathed itself, tied up in a linen cloth with a red string and attached to the body, the longest tooth of a black dog, or the wasp known by the name of Pseudosphex, which is always to be seen flying alone, caught with the left hand and attached beneath the patient's chin. Some use for this purpose the first wasp that a person sees in the current year. Other amulets are a viper's head severed from the body and wrapped in a linen cloth a viper's heart, removed from the reptile while still alive, the muzzle of a mouse, and tips of its ears wrapped in red cloth, the animal being set at liberty after they are removed, the right eye plucked from a living lizard, and enclosed with the head separated from the body, in goat's skin, the scarabus also that forms pellets and rolls them along. It is on account of this kind of scarabus that people of a great part of Egypt worship those insects as divinities, an usage for which Appian gives a curious reason asserting, as he does, by way of justifying the rights of his nation, that the insect in its operations pictured the revolution of the sun. There is also another kind of scarabus, which the magicians recommend to be worn as an amulet, the one that has small horns thrown backwards. It must be taken up when used for this purpose with the left hand. A third kind also, known by the name of fulo, and covered with white spots, they recommend to be cut asunder and attached to either arm, the other kinds being worn upon the left arm. Other amulets recommended by them are the heart of a snake taken from the living animal with the left hand, or four joints of a scorpion's tail, together with the sting attached to the body in a piece of black cloth, due care being taken that the patient does not see the scorpion, which is set at liberty after the operation, or the person who has attached the amulet for the space of three days after the recurrence, too, of the third paroxysm, he must bury the hole in the ground. Some enclose a caterpillar in a piece of linen with a thread passed three times round it, and tie as many knots, repeating each knot why it is that the patient performs that operation. A slug is sometimes wrapped in a piece of skin or the head of four slugs cut from the body with a reed. A millipede is rolled up in wool. The small grubs that produce the gadfly are used before the wings of the insect are developed, or any other kind of hairy grub is employed that is found adhering to prickly shrubs. Some persons attach to the body four of these grubs enclosed in an empty walnut shell or else some of the snails that are found without a shell. In other cases, again, it is the practice to enclose a spotted lizard in a box and to place it beneath the pillow of the patient, taking care to set it at liberty when the fever abates. It is recommended also that the patient should swallow the heart of a sea diver removed from the bird without the aid of iron, it being first dried and then bruised and taken in warm water. The heart of a swallow is also recommended with honey, and there are persons who say that just before the paroxysms come on, 
the patient should take one drachma of swallow's dung in three scythi of goat's milk or ewe's milk or of raisin wine. Others, again, are of opinion that the birds themselves should be taken whole. The nations of Parthia, as a remedy for quarton fevers, take the skin of the asp in doses of one-sixth of a denarius with an equal quantity of pepper. The philosopher Chrysippus has left a statement to the effect that the Friganian, worn as an amulet, is a remedy for quarton fevers. But what kind of animal this is he has nowhere informed us, nor have I been able to meet with any one who knows. Still, however, I felt myself bound to notice a remedy that was mentioned by an author of such high repute in case any other person should happen to be more successful in his researches. To eat the flesh of a crow and to use nitre in the form of a liniment is considered highly efficacious for the treatment of chronic diseases. In cases of tertian fever, so true it is that suffering takes delight in prolonging hope by trying every remedy. It may be worthwhile to make trial whether the web of the spider called lysos is of any use applied with the insect itself to the temples and forehead in a compress covered with resin and wax, or the insect itself attached to the body in a reed, a form in which it is said to be highly beneficial for other fevers. Trial may be made also of a green lizard enclosed alive in a vessel just large enough to receive it, and worn as an amulet, a method, it is said, by which recurrent fevers are often dispelled. Chapter 31. Remedies for Dropsy For the cure of dropsy, wool grease, a piece about the size of a hazelnut, is given in wine, with the addition of a little mirror. Some add goose grease steeped with myrtle wine. The filth that adheres to the udders of sheep is productive of a similar effect, as also the dried flesh of a hedgehog taken with the food. Matter vomited by a dog, we are assured, applied to the abdomen, will draw off the water that is accumulated there. Chapter 32. Remedies for Erysipelas For the cure of erysipelas, wool grease is used with pomphylix and oil of roses. The blood, also extracted from a tick, earthworms applied in vinegar. Or else, a cricket crushed between the hands, the good effect of this last being that the person who uses this precaution before the malady has made its appearance will be preserved therefrom for a whole year. Care must be taken also that iron is used for the removal of the cricket with some of the earth about its hole. Goose grease is also employed for this purpose. A viper's head, dried and burnt, and applied with vinegar, or a serpent's slough applied to the body immediately after the bath with bitumen and lampsway. Chapter 33. Remedies for Carbuncles Carbuncles are removed by an application of pigeon's dung, either alone or in combination with linseed and oxymal, or of bees that have died in the honey. A sprinkling of polenta upon the sores is also used. For carbuncles and other sores of the generative organs, wool grease is used as a remedy with refuse of lead. And for incipient carbuncles, sheep's dung is employed. Tumors and all other affections that stand in need of emollients are treated most effectually with goose grease. That of cranes, too, is equally efficacious. Chapter 34. Remedies for Boils For boils, the following remedies are prescribed. A spider applied before mentioning the insect by name, care being taken to remove it at the end of two days, a shrew mouse suspended by the neck till it is dead, care being taken not to let it touch the earth when dead, and to pass it three times around the boil, both operator and patient spitting on the floor each time. 
poultry dung, that of a red color in particular, applied fresh with vinegar, the crop of a stork boiled in wine, flies, an uneven number of them, rubbed upon the patient with the ring finger, the fifth from sheep's ears, stale mutton sway with ashes of women's hair, ram sway also with ashes of burnt pumice, and an equal quantity of salt. Chapter 35. Remedies for Burns. For burns, the ashes of a dog's head are used, ashes of burnt dormice with oil, sheep stung with wax, ashes also of burnt snails, an application so effectual as not to leave a scar even. Viper's fat, too, is used and ashes of burnt pigeons dung applied with oil. Chapter 36. Remedies for Affections of the Sinews for nodosities in the sinews, the ashes of a viper's head are applied with oil of cypress, or else earthworms with honey. Pains in the sinews should be treated with an application of grease. The body of a dead amphisbena worn as an amulet. Vulture's grease dried with the crop of the bird, beaten up with stale hog's lard. Or else ashes of the head of a horned owl taken in honeyed wine with a lily root. That is, if we believe what the magicians tell us. For contractions of the sinews, the flesh of ringed doves is very good, dried and taken with the food. And for spasmodic affections, the ashes of a hedgehog or weasel are used. A serpent's slough Attached to the patient's body in a piece of bull's hide is a preventative of spasms, and the dried liver of a kite taken in doses of three oboli in three scythi of hydromel is a preservative against opisthotony. Chapter 37. Remedies for Maladies of the Nails and Fingers Agnails and hangnails upon the fingers are removed by using the ashes of a burnt dog's head, or the uterus of a bitch boiled in oil, the fingers being first rubbed with a liniment of ewe milk butter mixed with honey. The gallbladder, too, of any animal is very useful for this purpose. Malformed nails are healed with an application of cantharides and pitch, which is removed at the end of two days, or else with locusts fried with he-goat sway, or with an application of mutton sway. Some mix mistletoe and porcelain with these ingredients, while others, again, use verdigris and mistletoe, removing the application at the end of two days. Chapter 38. Methods for Arresting Hemorrhage Bleeding at the nostrils is arrested by mutton sway taken from the call introduced to the nostrils by drawing up rennet, lamb's rennet in particular, mixed with water into the nostrils, or by using it as an injection, a remedy which succeeds even where other remedies have failed. By making up goose grease into a bolus with an equal quantity of butter and plugging the nostrils with it, or by using the earth that adheres to the snails, or else the snails themselves extracting from the shell. Excessive discharges from the nostrils are arrested also by applying crushed snails or cobwebs to the forehead. For issues of blood from the brain, the blood or brains of poultry are used, as also pigeon dung, thickened and kept for the purpose. In cases where there is an immediate flow of blood from a wound, an application of horse dung burnt with eggshells is marvelously good for stopping it. Chapter 39. Remedies for Ulcerous Sores and Wounds For the cure of ulcers, wool grease is used, with ashes of burnt barley and verdigris in equal quantities. A preparation which is good, too, for carcinoma and spreading sores. It cauterizes the flesh also around the margins of ulcers and reduces and makes level fungus excrescences formed by the sores. 
Ashes, too, of burnt sheep dung mixed with nitre are of great efficacy for the cure of carcinomata, as also those of lamb's thigh bones in cases more particularly where ulcers refuse to cicatrize. Very considerable, too, is the efficacy of lights, rams, lights in particular, which are of the greatest utility for reducing and making level the fleshy excrescences formed by ulcerous sores. With sheep dung warmed beneath an earthen pan and kneaded, the swelling attendant upon wounds are reduced, and fistula sores and epinictus are cleansed and made to heal. But it is in the ashes of a burnt dog's head that the greatest efficacy is found, as it quite equals spodium in its property of cauterizing all kinds of fleshy excrescences and causing sores to heal. Mouse dung, too, is used as a cautery, and weasel's dung burnt to ashes. Pounded millipedes mixed with turpentine and earth of sinope are used for penetrating carcinomata and fleshy indurations in deep-seated sores. And the same substances are remarkably useful for the treatment of ulcers threatened with maggots. Indeed, the several varieties of worms themselves are possessed of marvelously useful properties. The worms, for instance, that breed in wood are curative of all kinds of ulcers, reduced to ashes with an equal quantity of anise, and applied with oil, they heal cancerous sores. Earthworms are also remarkably healing for wounds recently inflicted. That it is a very general belief that by the end of seven days, they will unite sinews even that have been cut asunder. Hence, it is that it is recommended to keep them preserved in honey. Ashes of burnt earthworms in combination with tar or cymblian honey cauterize the indurated margins of ulcerous sores. Some persons dry earthworms in the sun and apply them to wounds with vinegar, the application not being removed till the end of a couple days. The earth also that adheres to snails is useful, as it is employed. Snails, too, taken whole from the shell, are pounded and applied to fresh wounds to heal them, and they arrest the progress of cancerous sores. There is an insect called herpes by the Greeks, which is particularly useful for the cures of all kinds of serpiginous sores. Snails, beaten up, shells and all, are very good for this purpose, and it is said that with myrrh and frankincense, they will unite the sinews even when cut asunder. The fat, too, of a dragon dried in the sun is remarkably useful, and so are the brains of a cock or capon for recent wounds. By taking with the food salt in which vipers have been preserved, ulcers are rendered more easily for treatment. It is said, and are made to heal all the sooner. Antonius, the physician, after operating in vain upon ulcers that were incurable with the knife used to prescribe viper's flesh to be eaten by the patient whereby a marvelously speedy cure was effected. The locust called Troxilus, reduced to ashes and applied with honey, removes the indurated margins of ulcerous sores. Ashes also of burnt pigeon dung with arsenic and honey are very effectual in all cases where a cautery is required. The brains of a horned owl applied with the goose grease are marvelously efficacious for uniting wounds, it is said. For the malignant ulcer known as cossethes, the ashes of a ram's thigh bones are used, mixed with women's milk, the sores being washed with linen cloths well rinsed. For the same purpose, the bird known as the screech owl is boiled in oil, ew milk, butter, and honey being added to the preparation when properly dissolved. An application of bees that have died in the honey acts emolliently upon the indurated margins of ulcerous sores. 
and for the cure of elephantiasis, the blood and ashes of a weasel are employed. Wounds and wheels produced by blows are effaced by an application of sheepskins fresh from the body. Chapter 40. Remedies for Broken Bones For fractures of the joints, ashes of sheep's thigh bones are particularly useful, applied in combination with wax, and the remedy is all the more efficacious if the sheep's jawbones are burnt with the other ingredients, together with a deer's antler and some wax dissolved in oil of roses. For broken bones, a dog's brains are used, spread upon a linen cloth with wool laid upon the surface and moistened every now and then. The fractured bone will mostly unite in the course of 14 days, and a cure equally expeditious may be effected by using the ashes of burnt field mice with honey or of burnt earthworms a substance which is extremely useful for the extraction of splintered bones. Chapter 41. Applications for Psychatherizations and for the Cure of Morphew. Psychatherizations are restored to their original color by applying sheep's lights, those of a ram in particular, mutton sway mixed with nitre, the ashes of a green lizard, the snake's slough boiled in wine, or else pigeon's dung mixed with honey, a preparation which, in combination with wine, is good for the removal of white morphew. For the cure also of morphew, cantharides are used, with two-thirds of rue leaves, a preparation which the patient must keep applied in the sun till the skin itches and rises in blisters, after which it must be fomented and well rubbed with oil, and the application repeated. This must be done for several days in succession, due precautions being taken that the ulcerations do not penetrate too deep. For the cure, too, of morphew, a liniment is recommended, made of flies and root of agrimony. The white part, also, of poultry dung, kept in a horn box with stale oil, a bat's blood, or else the gall of a hedgehog applied with water. Each scab is cured by using the brains of a horned owl, incorporated with saltpeter. But dog's blood is the best thing to keep it in check. The small broad snail that is found crushed and applied topically is an effectual cure for itching sensations. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 21. Book 30, Chapters 42 to 53. Chapter 42. Methods of extracting foreign substances from the body. Arrows, pointed weapons, and other foreign substances that require to be extracted from the body are removed by the application of a mouse split asunder, or of a lizard more particularly, similarly divided, or else the head only of the animal pounded with salt. The snails, too, that are found in clusters upon leaves, are pounded and applied with their shells on, as also those that are used as food, the shells being first removed, applied with hair's rennet in particular. The bones of a snake, applied with the rennet of any four-footed animal, will produce a similar effect before the end of two days. Cantharides also, bruised and applied with barley meal, are highly extolled. 
Chapter 43 Remedies for Female Complaints For diseases incident to females, a used placenta is very useful, as already mentioned by us when speaking of goats. Sheep's dung, too, is equally good. A fumigation of burnt locusts applied to the lower parts affords relief to strangury in females more particularly. If immediately after conception a woman eats a cock's testes every now and then, the child of which she is pregnant will become a male, it is said. The ashes of a burnt porcupine taken in drink are a preventive of abortion. Bitch's milk facilitates delivery, and the afterbirth of a bitch, provided it has not touched the ground, will act as an expellent of the fetus. Milk, taken as a drink, strengthens the loins of women when in travail. Mouse dung, diluted with rainwater, reduces the breasts of females when swollen after delivery. The ashes of a burned hedgehog, applied with oil, act as a preventive of abortion. Delivery is facilitated in cases where the patient has taken either goose dung into two sayathi of water or the liquid that escapes from the uterus of a weasel by its genitals. Earthworms, applied topically, effectually prevent pains in the sinews of the neck and shoulders. Taken in raisin wine, they expel the afterbirth when retarded. Applied by themselves, earthworms ripen abscesses of the breasts, open them, draw the humors, and make them cicatrize. Taken in honeyed wine, they promote the secretion of the milk. In hay grass, there are small worms found, which, attached to the neck, act as a preventive of premature delivery. They are removed, however, at the moment of childbirth, as otherwise they would have the effect of impeding delivery. Care must be taken also not to put them on the ground. To promote conception, five or seven of them are administered in drink. Snails, taken with the food, accelerate delivery, and applied with saffron, they promote conception. Used in the form of liniment with amylum and gum tragacanth, they arrest uterine discharges. Taken with the food, they promote menstruation and mixed with deer's marrow in the proportion of one denarius and the same quantity of cypress to each snail, they reduce the uterus when displaced. Taken from the shell and beaten up with oil of roses, they dispel inflations of the uterus, the snails of Astipalia being those that are mostly chosen for these purposes. Those of Africa, again, are employed in a different manner, two of them being bitten up with a pinch of fenugreek in three fingers and four spoonfuls of honey, and the preparation applied to the abdomen after it has been rubbed with juice of iris. There is a kind of small, white, elongated snail that is found straying here and there, dried upon tiles in the sun and reduced to powder, these snails are mixed with bean meal in equal proportions, forming a cosmetic which whitens and softens the skin. The small, broad kind of snail, mixed with polenta, is good for the removal of a tendency to scratch and rub the skin. If a pregnant woman steps over a viper, she will be sure to miscarry. The same, too, in the case of the amphisbena, but only when it is dead. If, however, a woman carries about her a live amphisbena in a box, she may step over one with impunity, even though it be dead. An amphisbena preserved for the purpose will ensure an easy delivery, even though it be dead. It is a truly marvelous fact, but if a pregnant woman steps over one of these serpents that has not been preserved, it will be perfectly harmless provided she immediately steps over another that has been preserved. A fumigation made with a dried snake, 
acts powerfully as in a menagogue. Chapter 44. Methods of Facilitating Delivery The cast of slough of a snake, attached to the loins, facilitates delivery. Care must be taken, however, to remove it immediately after. It is administered to in wine mixed with frankincense. Taken in any other form, it is productive of abortion. A stuff, by the aid of which a person has parted a frog from a snake, will accelerate parturition. Ashes of the troxalis, applied with honey, act as an emenagogue. The same, too, with a spider that descends as it spins its thread from aloft. It must be taken, however, in the hollow of the hand, crushed, and applied accordingly. If, on the contrary, the spider is taken while ascending, it will arrest menstruation. The stone atites that is found in the eagle's nest preserves the fetus against all insidious attempts at producing abortion. A vulture's feather placed beneath the feet of the woman accelerates parturition. It is a well-known fact that pregnant women must be on their guard against raven's eggs, for if a female in that state should happen to step over one, she will be sure to miscarry by the mouth. A hawk's dung taken in honeyed wine would appear to render females fruitful. Goose grease, or that of the swan, acts emolliently upon indurations and abscesses of the uterus. Chapter 45. Methods of Preserving the Breasts from Injury Goose grease mixed up with oil of roses and a spider protects the breasts after delivery. The people of Phrygia and Lycaonia have made the discovery that the grease of the Otis is good for affections of the breasts resulting from recent delivery. For females affected with suffocations of the uterus, they employ a liniment made of beetles, the shells of partridges' eggs, burnt to ashes and mixed with cadmia and wax, preserve the firmness of the breasts. It is generally thought that if the egg of a partridge, or blank, is passed three times round a woman's breasts, they will never become flaccid and that, if these eggs are swallowed, they will be productive of fruitfulness and promote the plentiful secretion of the milk. It is believed, too, that by anointing a woman's breasts with goose grease, pains therein may be allayed, that moles formed in the uterus may be dispersed thereby, and that each of the uterus may be dispelled by the application of a liniment made of crushed bags. Chapter 46. Various Kinds of Depilatories Bat's blood has all the virtues of a depilatory, but if applied to the cheeks of youths, it will not be found sufficiently efficacious, unless it is immediately followed up by an application of verdigris or hemlock seed, this method having the effect of entirely removing the hair or at least reducing it to the state of a fine down. It is generally thought, too, that bats' brains are productive of a similar effect, there being two kinds of these brains, the red and the white. Some persons mix with the brains the blood and liver of the same animal, others again boil down a viper in three semisextarii of oil, and, after boning it, Use it as a depilatory, first pulling out the hairs that are wanted not to grow. The gall of a hedgehog is a depilatory, more particularly if mixed with bat's brains and goat's milk. The ashes too of a burnt hedgehog are used for a similar purpose. If after plucking out the hairs that are wanted not to grow, or if before they make their appearance, the parts are well rubbed with the milk of a bitch with her first litter, no hairs will grow there. The same result is ensured, it is said, by using the blood of a tick taken from off a dog or else the blood or gall of a swallow.
Ants' eggs, they say, bitten up with flies, impart a black color to the eyebrows. If it is considered desirable that the color of the infant's eyes should be black, the pregnant woman must eat a rat. Ashes of burnt earthworms applied with oil prevent the hair from turning white. Chapter 47 Remedies for the Diseases of Infants For infants that are troubled with coagulation of the milk, a grand preservative is lamb's rennet taken in water, and in cases where the milk has so coagulated, it may be remedied by administering rennet in vinegar. For the pains incident to dentition, sheep's brains are a very useful remedy. The inflammation called psoriasis, to which infants are liable, is cured by attaching to them the bones that are found in the dung of dogs. Hernia in infants is cured by letting a green lizard bite the child's body while asleep, after which the lizard is attached to a reed and hung up in the smoke. By the time the animal dies, the child will be perfectly cured, it is said. The slime of snails, applied to the eyes of children, strengthens the eyelashes and makes them grow. Ashes of burnt snails, applied with frankincense and juice of white grapes, are a cure for hernia in infants, if applied for 30 days consecutively. Within the horns of snails, there are certain hard substances found, like grits of sand. Attached to infants, they facilitate dentition. Ashes of empty snail shells mixed with wax are a preventive of procedence of the rectum, but they must be used in combination with the matter that exudes from a viper's brains on the head being pricked. Viper's brains attached to the infant's body in a piece of skin facilitate dentition, a similar effect being produced by using the larger teeth of serpents. Raven's dung attached to an infant with wool is curative of cough. It is hardly possible to preserve one's seriousness in describing some of these remedies, but as they have been transmitted to us, I must not pass them in silence. For the treatment of hernia in infants, a lizard is recommended, but it must be a male lizard, a thing that may be ascertained by its having but one orifice beneath the tail. The method of proceeding is for the lizards to bite the part affected through cloth of gold, cloth of silver, and cloth dyed purple, after which it is tied fast in a cup that has never been used and smoked. Incontinence of urine in infants is checked by giving them boiled mice with their food. The large indented horns of the scarabaeus attached to the bodies of infants have all the virtues of an amulet. In the head of the boa there is a small stone, they say, which the serpent spits out when it is in fear of death. If the reptile is taken by surprise and the head cut off, and this stone extracted, it will aid dentition to a marvellous degree, attached to the neck of infants. The brains, too, of the same serpent are recommended to be attached to the body for a similar purpose, as also the small stone or bone that is found in the back of the slug. An admirable promoter of dentition is found in sheep's brains applied to the gums, and equally good for diseases of the ears is an application of goose grease with juice of osimum. Upon prickly plants there is found a kind of rough hairy grub. Attached to the neck of infants, these insects give instant relief, it is said, when any of the food has stuck in the throat. Chapter 48. Provocatives of Sleep As a soporific, wool grease is employed, diluted in two sayathi of wine, with a modicum of myrrh, or else mixed with goose grease in myrtle wine. For a similar purpose also, a cuckoo is attached to the body in a hair skin or a young heron's bill to the forehead in an ass's skin. It is thought, too, that the beak alone, steeped in wine, is equally efficacious. On the other hand, a bat's head, 
dried and worn as an amulet, acts as a preventive of sleep. Chapter 49. Aphrodisiacs and Antaphrodisiacs A lizard drowned in a man's urine has the effect of an antaphrodisiac upon the person whose urine it is. For this animal is to be reckoned among the filters, the magicians say. The same property is attributed to the excrements of snails and to pigeon's dung taken with oil and wine. The right lobe of a vulture's lungs, attached to the body in the skin of a crane, acts powerfully as a stimulant upon males, an effect equally produced by taking the yolks of five pigeons' eggs in honey mixed with one denarius of hog's lard, sparrows or eggs of sparrows with the food, or by wearing the right testicle of a cock attached to the body in a ram's skin. The ashes of a burnt ibis, it is said, employed as a friction with goose grease and oil of iris, will prevent abortion when a female has once conceived, while the testes of a gamecock, on the other hand, rubbed with goose grease and attached to the body in a ram's skin, have all the effect of an antaphrodisiac. The same too with the testes of any kind of dunghill cock, placed together with the blood of a cock beneath the bed. Hairs taken from the tail of a she-mule, while being covered by the stallion, will make a woman conceive, against her will even, if knotted together at the moment of the sexual congress. If a man makes water upon a dog's urine, he will become disinclined to copulation, they say. A singular thing, too, is what is told about the ashes of a spotted lizard, if indeed it is true, to the effect that, wrapped in linen and held in the left hand, they act as an aphrodisiac, while, on the contrary, if they are transferred to the right, they will take effect as an antaphrodisiac. A bat's blood, too, they say, received on a flock of wool and placed beneath a woman's head, will promote sexual desire, the same being the case also with a goose's tongue, taken with a food or drink. Chapter 50. Remedies for Phthiriasis and for Various Other Affections In Phthiriasis, all the vermin upon the body may be killed in the course of three days by taking the cast of slough of a serpent in drink, or else whey of milk after the cheese is removed with a little salt. Cheese, it is said, will never become rotten with age, or be touched by mice, if a weasel's brains have been mixed with a rennet. It is asserted, too, that if the ashes of a burnt weasel are mixed with a crumbing for chickens or young pigeons, they will be safe from the attack of weasels. Beasts of burden, when troubled with pains in staling, find immediate relief if a bat is attached to the body, and they are effectually cured of bots by passing a ring dove three times round their generative parts. A truly marvellous thing to relate, the ring dove, on being set at liberty, dies, and the beast is instantly relieved from pain. Chapter 51. Remedies for Intoxication The eggs of an owlet, administered to drunkards three days in wine, are productive of a distaste for that liquor. A sheep's lights, roasted, eaten before drinking, act as a preventive of inebriety. The ashes of a swallow's beak, bruised with myrrh and sprinkled in the wine, act as a preventative against intoxication. Horus, king of Assyria, was the first to discover this. Chapter 52 Peculiarities Relative to Certain Animals In addition to these, there are some other peculiar properties attributed to certain animals, which require to be mentioned in the present book. Some authors state that there is a bird in Sardinia resembling the crane and called the Cromfena, but it is no longer known even by the people of that country, in my opinion. In the same province, too, there is the Ophion, an animal which resembles the deer in the hair only and to be found nowhere else. 
The same authors have spoken also of the subjugus, but have omitted to state what animal it is, or where it is to be found. That it did formerly exist, however, I have no doubt, as certain remedies are described as being derived from it. Cicero speaks of animals called beauri, which gnaw the vines in Campania. Chapter 53 other marvellous facts connected with animals. There are still some other marvellous facts related with reference to the animals which we have mentioned. A dog will not bark at a person who has any part of the secondines of a bitch about him, or a hare's dung or fur. The kind of nuts called mullions do not live more than a single day. Persons, when taking honey from the hives, will never be touched by the bees if they carry the beak of a woodpecker about them. Swine will be sure to follow the person who has given them a raven's brains made up into a bolus. The dust in which a she-mule has wallowed, sprinkled upon the body, will allay the flames of desire. Rats may be put to flight by castrating a male rat and setting it at liberty. If a snake's slough is beaten up with some spelt, salt, and wild thyme, and introduced into the throat of oxen, with wine at the time that grapes are ripening, they will be in perfect health for a whole year to come. The same, too, if three young swallows are given to them, made up into three boluses. The dust gathered from the track of a snake, sprinkled among bees, will make them return to the hive. If the right testicle of a ram is tied up, he will generate females only. Persons who have about them the sinews taken from the wings or legs of a crane will never be fatigued with any kind of laborious exertion. Mules will never kick when they have drunk wine. Of all known substances, it is a mule's hoofs only that are not corroded by the poisonous waters of the fountain sticks. A memorable discovery made by Aristotle to his great infamy on the occasion when Antipater sent some of this water to Alexander the Great for the purpose of poisoning him. We will now pass on to the aquatic productions. Summary Remedies, Narratives and Observations 854 Roman authors quoted Varro, Nigidius, Cicero, Sextius Niger, who wrote in Greek, Licinius Musser. Foreign authors quoted Eudoxus, Aristotle, Hermippus, Homer, Appian, Orpheus, Democritus, Anaxileus. Medical authors quoted Botrys, Horus, Apollodorus, Menander, Archidemus, Aristogenes, Xenocrates, Diodorus, Chrysippus, Nisander, Apollonius of Pitani. End of book 30. End of section 21. End of the Natural History, volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Postock and Henry Thomas Riley.